That was a powerful video. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jack McCain, and it is an honor to be here in Halifax for the 2022 Forum. This gathering and this organization have meant so much to my mother and father. My mother really wanted to be here, but unfortunately she couldn't make it. So instead of a distinguished ambassador, you have to settle for a lowly helicopter pilot. <laughs> Ukraine had a very special place in my father's heart. He liked Ukraine so much that he spent a New Year's Eve there, not celebrating in Kyiv, but in a combat outpost on the front lines of Donetsk with Ukrainian troops fighting against Russian aggression. As you saw in the video, he spoke on the Maidan in 2013 to the thousands of Ukrainians fighting for their freedom, saying, we are here to support your just cause and sovereign right of Ukraine to determine its own destiny freely and independently. Those words ring more true nine years later, and that is why we are here today. My father warned of the danger of Vladimir Putin for many years. When others were resetting relations or seeing into his soul, John McCain saw a KGB thug and called him that. The world now knows the evil that Putin is capable of. Bombing hospitals, targeting civilians, starving and freezing women and children, and willing to conduct cold-blooded mass executions. The horrible costs of Putin's war against Ukraine have so far united democracies. And the brave struggle of U Ukrainians has inspired us all. But today, we want to recognize the courage and contribution of the women of Ukraine. This year's Halifax McCain Prize goes to them. The brave women trying to keep their families safe, sending their husbands and sons to war, and going to fight themselves to protect their country from Putin's aggression. Who can forget the video from the first days of the invasion when an elderly Ukrainian woman crossed the street to give sunflowers to a Russian soldier so that, in her words, when you die here, flowers will grow on your grave. The world has seen images from across Ukraine of women fighting aggression, digging out from bombings, fleeing with their families, working to support the war effort, fighting on the front lines, and far too often, burying the dead killed by Russians. The women of Ukraine have voluntarily become heroes with bravery, honor, and dignity that has inspired the world. That is why it is my great privilege to present the 2022 John McCain Prize for Public Service to the women of Ukraine. To accept the prize, please allow me to turn to the First Lady of Ukraine, Olenya Zelenska. Dear friends, I'm here to speak on behalf of all Ukrainian women to thank you for this award. Just a few days ago, a Russian missile, one of the barrage fired against our cities and towns, hit a residential house in a Kiev uh, street named after the true friend of Ukraine, Senator John McCain. Yes, there has been such a street in Kiev for several years. Naming a street after this great man was the least we could do to show how grateful we are for his unfailing friendship. He always stalwartly supported Ukraine and warned against Russian perfidy many years ago. I want you to try and see in your mind's eye what Ukrainian women are experiencing now. As we speak, 40,000 of them are at the battlefield serving in the armed forces of Ukraine. They are all volunteers. 
in peacetime, they are teachers, so, social workers, business women. As we speak, other Ukrainian women are racing in ambulances to respond to calls for service because yet another Russian rocket has hit someone's house or because there is a mine accident victim they have to attend to. And the majority of our health professionals are women. As we speak, Ukrainian women are teaching their classes remotely because most of our schools are within the reach of the Russian shells and have to work online. But our teachers have less, give lessons even from bomb shelters. As we speak, Ukrainian women are rushing to work, to offices, shops, institutions, to the sound of air raid sirens, because it's women that are now driving force of our economy. Of late, they've got to do it without electricity, as Russia deliberately destroys our critical energy infrastructure. As we speak, some of Ukrainian women are being held in Russian captivity or staying in the occupied territory in Comunicado. Their children can only look at their photos and pray for them to be alive. Right now, there are Ukrainian women there close to you. I do not mean the delegation members. I've just found out that some of the employees at the Western Hotel are Ukrainian women. They've come to Canada seeking temporary protection from the war. They are there because they are rescuing their children. But if you talk to them, you will understand that their hearts are back at home, where they've left behind their bombed houses, their jobs and plans, their husbands, sons, brothers, their lives. And yet, they've got this strength, this resilience to continue working, saving, serving, living against all odds. As we speak, every Ukrainian woman is living millions of lives, each overshadowed by tragedy war that she definitely did not want, did not provoke. The event that has brought us together is a security forum. I want you to imagine how painful and ungraspable the word security should sound to us in Ukraine. This is what we cannot feel, what we've been denied for almost nine months. No woman in Ukraine can be sure of her security. But I want Ukrainian women whom you are celebrating today could receive this award during their lifetimes, not posthumously. I wish they could live to see our victory, each and every of them. We demonstrate our own strengths by helping Ukraine, Senator McCain is known to have said. Now, one should add, by helping Ukraine, the world demonstrates more, more than just strength. It demonstrates its own integrity, compassion, and commitment to the key human values, the right to life, to safety, to a home, to one's mother tongue, to the homeland. By helping us, you uphold the principles you yourselves live and want to continue to live by. I keep asking the world time and again to demonstrate this power of your principles now. Thank you again for this award and for all your help. Madam First Lady, it has been an honor to present this award, and I cannot thank you enough for the efforts of yourself and all of the women of Ukraine in fighting against Russian aggression. Thank you. going to say very much other than to introduce the next section um, where we will now hear and talk about the women of Iran. And so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Tom Clark, who will be leading this session.
morning. Uh, it's going to be a, a different way to start a Saturday morning. Uh, we have been talking a lot, uh, as we should, about Ukraine and the sacrifices that are being made there. There is, however, as we all know, <clears throat> another issue that is bedeviling world peace and justice right now, and that's happening in Iran. And in a way, you could say we are at an inflection point in history. But let me give you the context for this discussion, first of all. <clears throat> and it's a history that you all know, but on January 8, 2020, the Iranian guards shot down in cold blood flight PS752. There were 176 people killed instantly when that missile hit that plane. More than half of them were Canadians or Canadian residents. A few hours earlier, the Iranian forces fired a missile against U.S. forces in Iran, in, Ira in Iraq, rather, in retaliation for the killing of the bloodthirsty General Qasem Soleimani. To put it bluntly, the Iranian guards that day were in a bloodthirsty mood, and it resulted in the downing of PS752. I want to introduce you to a couple of people <clears throat> who know this file extremely well. And <clears throat> forgive me. Uh, first of all, I want to inter introduce uh, Nassim Afsanjam McKay, a human rights activist from Canada. And also, uh, I want to introduce Mr. Hamed Esmelion. Now, there are two other women who should be here today who are not. One of them is your wife, Parisa, doctor, 42 years old. And then your daughter, Rira, nine years old, both passengers on flight PS752. There's an old expression uh, that says that you don't really die until you're forgotten. So what I'd like to do is remember your wife and your daughter right now. What does everybody here need to know about Parisa and Rira? Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, Parisa was a dentist. I'm a dentist too, so uh, we kind of grew up together. Uh, we were uh, college sweethearts, married 22 years ago and then moved to Canada 13 years ago when Rira was six months old. And now it's uh, three years, almost three years, that uh, I'm just fighting for, for the truth and justice for them. As long as we're talking about sayings, you were telling me that there's a saying that says, don't mourn, organize. And that's what you've been doing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, in the last 43 years, the Islamic Republic of Iran, they have committed several crimes. There was uh, uh, massacres in 1988. They killed thousands of political prisoners. They cracked, down, they cracked down the Green Movement in 2009. And three years ago, uh, uh, it was a, a massacre of thousands of people in the streets of Iran. And right 50 days after, they, they downed the plane. and. Recently, you see the, this revolution in Iran. And every time they committed a crime, they walked away with impunity. But a uh, few weeks or few, like two months after the downing of flight PS752, the families of the victims, they came together. We formed the association of the families. And we started to our campaign. Our campaign was writing letters, have protests, like uh, running a website. and. It's, it's ongoing till now, this day that we are sitting here. Nazanin, I want to get you into the conversation um, later today, and we'll, we'll describe it in a minute, but there's going to be a big demonstration right outside this hotel, as there's going to be in cities right across Canada, and I believe also in the United States, uh, to recognize another horror of what has happened in Iran, and that is the, what's called the, the Bloody Massacre. Um, and I'm just wondering, 
from your perspective of human rights, you hear a story like PS752, you hear the story about the massacre of 1,500 people, three years, actually this is the third, today is the third anniversary of that massacre uh, in Iran. From a human rights perspective, how do you go from, as, as you have and your family, to go from mourning to anger to action? What does that look like? It means remembering, as you, as you recall, he's remembering his family. But all of us Iranians are remembering each and every victim that has been brutalized by this bloodthirsty, theocratic, tyrannical regime. As you're speaking, I, I keep picturing the face of little Kion Pir Falak, who was 10 years old, and he was indiscriminately shot at by repression forces in Iran just during all these peaceful protests as he was returning home. And he's one of 50 children who've been killed during these um, protests. Or what we keep trying to emphasize is this is a revolution. These are not just protests. He's among over 400 people that have been killed during this revolution. And then there's the millions that have been killed by this, this regime for the last 43 years. And so we have to remember them, and we have to keep them in our hearts. But we have to take action. And the international community needs to hear our cries and, and know that they can make a difference. The people in this room need to know, the policymakers, the politicians, the military personnel, the, the media, each and every one of us is responsible to share the stories of these, these victims one by one, but also understand that this is a revolution and that they don't uh, uh, legitimize this, this government. This regime does not represent the people of Iran. The freedom-loving people of Iran want freedom and democracy. They want the rule of law. They want a separation between the religion and state. They want a constitution based on the Declaration of Human Rights, things that we enjoy and take for granted here. And they want the world to hear them, and they want us to support them. Do not appease this illegitimate government. Mm -hmm. Do not <clears throat> end your, your ties with them. You have to start looking at Iran from a new paradigm. Uh, Hamid, you've got a, uh, if, if, if you want, you've got to take a more uh, focused view on the question of rights. Because as the representative of the victims of Flight 752, you need justice. But I'm wondering, what does justice look like? Is it a, is it a question of money? Is it a question of... Uh, a grand apology? What is it? Justice, in our view, is that we hear that Flight PS 752 landed in Kiev on January 8, 2020, but it never happens. So, in the last uh, three years, we witnessed uh, that the four affected countries, they try to kind of bring truth and justice for the families, but because, because the international community handed over the investigation to the murderers, to the Islamic Republic of Iran, we never get a, got a chance to, to know what really happened on January 8, 2020. The families of the victims that were in the association, all of them, they have said no to the compensation. They have said no to a, an apology. We want to know the truth, and we believe that the truth would come out if we go to an international court. In the last three years, uh, you know, there is a process. The first process was negotiation. The second process was arbitration, international civil aviation organization. And the third one would be International Court of Justice. January 5, 2022, we heard from, from four affected countries, Canada, Ukraine, uh, UK, and Sweden, that the negotiation with Iran doesn't work. So we need to go to the next stage. And so far, we are waiting. But what we want 
We want arrest warrants. We want arrest warrant for the Supreme Leader of Islamic Republic of Iran. We want arrest warrant for the officials of the IRGC and the operator who shot down the plane. But we know probably that doesn't happen in the International Court of Justice. That's why we submitted a case in International Criminal Court this September, and we asked for the governments to support us, but so far we didn't get the supporting letter from the, from the governments. In the eye of the governments, in my opinion, they look justice as a contract. They want to win the case. But for families of the victims, justice is a process. Justice is a process to stop more crimes to happen. Just, you know, if you have act acted enough when they killed Zahra Kazemi, we wouldn't see Dr. Sayyid Imami getting killed, another Canadian. And when they killed Zahra, uh, Dr. Imami, if he had acted firm, uh, we wouldn't see PS75 to shut down. And if we had acted enough for PS75 to Mahsa Amini, and these 400 people we are talking about would be alive today. So the governments, they think, OK, take this case and go to the court and win, and that's it. No. What about the truth? We want to know the truth. And uh, I have a bigger hope these days that we can have a trial in free Iran very soon. It's fascinating that the retribution comes down to having the truth, uh, which in a North American context is a little bit unusual. Normally, we want a lot of money uh, as opposed to the truth. Let me, let me go back to you, Nazneem, for a second, because as I said, er, uh, later today, there is going to be a couple of hundred people, I would imagine, outside this hotel. And uh, the event was the silent massacre three years ago today. 1,500 people killed uh, in Iran at a time when they had taken down the internet so nobody could know about it. Thus, I guess, the word silent. That was three years ago. People are demonstrating. And you mentioned before that part of the support is the idea of remembering. The idea is joining together, whether it be sanctions or whatever. But how do you action the type of justice uh, that he is talking about. How do, you, how do you action things like truth? How do you get there? As you just said, it's by forming a coalition about bringing unity to those that believe. I mean, Hamid mentioned that there has been so many protests happening in Iran for the last 43 years, years. but the difference is that people on the inside now believe that they can rise up against this brutal regime. And now we're starting to convince the international community and they are starting to believe. Macron called this a revolution. And by coming together, we can form a strong alliance and bring all the different stakeholders. When I was listening, to the Ukrainian women, if we can join forces with other people who are oppressed under tyrannical regimes, we can be that much stronger. And this rally that's happening outside of this room is, is a combined rally of Ukrainians and Iranians fighting mm -hmm. against tyranny. You know what I'm sorry, what, I sorry, to interrupt. go ahead. When you were just talking about truth as well, there's been some mis construed um, thoughts about uh, what's happening uh, as far as justice is concerned at the parliamentary level. Inside Iran, 227 members of parliament out of 290 called on the judiciary in Iran, in Iran to sentence those that have been arrested since um, September 16th to um, face the death penalty. And um, there, um, that means that. And how many? How many is that? What is the? Well, the there's there's fifteen thousand people that have been arrested. But um, a friend of mine has an organization, CFPPI Iran. She has estimated up to sixty thousand people that have been arrested. This is a real concern. These people can be. There is the risk of them being executed. Hmm. So. We can't let another Zahra Kazemi's name be forgotten. We can't let those other people that you mentioned be forgotten. 
these 15,000 people or 60,000 people are at risk of execution, and we know it can happen. The, this regime is so brutal. They have killed 10, 15,000 people at a time. And if people don't stand up now to speak against this regime and stop their trade ties, stop their diplomatic ties, um, if they don't send their uh, Iranian ambassadors home, these people are at risk. And, and not just them, the continuation. If we wait till the Islamic Republic of Iran obtains nuclear capabilities, it'll be that much stronger. I mean, people have to understand this is in their best interest to support the Iranian people, mm -hmm. the freedom-loving Iranian people, because if they don't, all of our security is at risk. What I find so interesting about what's happening in Iran right now and the resistance in Iran is that it is being led as equally by people like you on the outside and by you, but by the women of Iran. It's fascinating. It is, it is a, uh, in so many ways, it makes it unique, but it makes it that much more powerful. We have some time for questions on the floor, so if anybody would like to join in. The only thing is, and I just want to let you know about this, we're doing Iranian resistance in two parts. And so we have limited amounts of time. So I can ask, if you do have a question or a comment, please, within 20 seconds, have it done. Uh, Yes, sir, right over here. This gentleman here, and then we'll get to you. We got a microphone for you. Good morning, Ayman Mahana from Lebanon. Why is it different this time compared to the previous protests, compared to what happened in Syria? So is the Biden administration and the EU, will they repeat what was done under the Obama administration during the Iran negotiation for the nuclear deal? Is a deal and its implication on the energy sector more important than the values that we were discussing today? Can we have a clear answer? What is the priority today? The nuclear negotiations or responding to the brutality of, that is happening today on the streets of Tehran and the other cities? Thank you. Do you want to go? Uh, for years, they've, they're talking about JCPOA. When, and when they talk about JCPOA, they put all these bloody files away. What we want, the families of the victims, they want these cases to be looked at first, then get to the negotiations. At this time, actually, we ask all the governments to stop negotiation with Iran. And the difference this time is that there is a big hope. The difference is that this time there is no ideology, ideology behind this movement or revolution in Iran. It's woman, life, freedom. It's very progressive in that region. And uh, I think it's going to go. Uh, to the end. I think, you know, I, I hear that from people every day. This time there's a big hope and everybody thinks that this is the end for Islamic regime very soon. We, what we ask for, for, for other governments, the Western governments, is basically to not stand on the way. That's what we ask for. Very quickly, I think there was a, did you want to have a quick comment? We, we are very tight on time, by the way. Thank you. First of all, uh, my name is Sana Mandarlini. I wanted to express my condolences to uh, Mr. Ishmaelian. Um, the issue, this is a really complicated issue because the real question here is we don't want international intervention. No, no war, no sanctions, no bombs, no all that kind of stuff. But closing embassies, if you close the Iranian embassies here, they will reciprocate by closing the embassies of Germany, France, whoever else is left, which means that there will be no international presence, Western presence, on the ground. Now, some people can say that that doesn't matter. I would say that we don't want to have isolation in this way at the moment. There's always the future where people can close their embassies themselves. But if you exclude and if, you, um, if we end up uh, sending Iranian embassies, uh, Iranian diplomats home now, the Iranians will reciprocate. It seems to me that this is the time to have as much international interaction and using our multilateral spaces and using the diplomatic channels. You don't do diplomacy with your friends. Let's, let, let's, so I'm just let's, curious about yeah. what, why, what is the strategy of asking for the closure of Iranian embassies knowing that they will close other embassies and the isolation will, will actually be 
uh, fueled. We'll let both of you do it quickly, yeah. and then we've yeah. got to move on. Iranians inside the country are asking for this. They're asking for the Western nations to expel their Iranian ambassadors and to recall their own. Yes, it could, it, we could leave a few just for intelligence purposes on the ground in Iran. But um, if I'm not mistaken, um, Sanam, is it Sanam? Um, you're from an organization called NIAC. You're not, you were. And um, NIAC has had the ear of Washington for a long time, and they have been, they have been expressing the wrong ideals of the Iranian people. To the Obama administration, Obama came out and said he regretted um, not having intervened. And when I say intervene, I'm not talking about military intervention. We're asking for the international community to support Iranian people. Obama said that he made a mistake of not supporting the Iranian people during that bloody time. And now the Biden administration also has the ear of some NIAC members who are wrongly expressing the opinions of, of the Iranian people. The Iranian people need the support of the international community, need world leaders to stand up for them, need these um, bloody, repressive um, ambassadors and, and regime officials out. We want them all out, and we want um, you to finally hear the voices of the real Iranian people. Hamid, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Okay, so I just want, you know, then I have a question for you. What, did you, what do you see right now when these embassies are open and the ambassadors are in Iran? Do you see in, any change in behavior? Do you see that? Two days ago, they killed a 10-year-old in south of Iran. Three years ago, they killed 29 children in flight PS752. 50 days before that, they killed 30-some uh, children in Iran. Do you see any change in behavior? What, what kind of pressure you are talking about? What kind of negotiation you There's are talking no about? There's no negotiation. They don't them. understand the language of diplomacy. They're not a normal player in the game of diplomacy. There is a mafia running that country, and you have to believe in that. OK, I, I unfortunately have to cut it off there. I... Thank you. Hamid and Nazanin, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to ask if you will exit stage right, as they say, and we're going to go on to the next phase of this. Thank you very much. So. My next guest, and as I said, we're doing this in two parts. So my next guest, I, I'm sure many, many of you have heard of uh, already. Uh, she is a, an enemy of the state of Iran. Uh, three months ago, she was the subject of an assassination attempt uh, at her home in Brooklyn. Uh, a year ago, she was nearly kidnapped by Iranian forces. Uh, she is considered to be, and how's this for an introduction, uh, the mullahs have called you a hostile government. One person, one woman, is a hostile government. <laughs> Masih Ahmadinejad, thank you. Oh, my you. God. Yeah. Come on. Ahmadinejad? No. No, no. What did I say? <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, Alina Jad. I'm used to it. People I... butcher my name. Don't worry about it. <laughs> OK. Alina Jad, thank I, you so I was much. using a southern accent for that. But anyway, OK. <laughs> Ahmadinejad was going to eliminate Israel, Iranian people, homosexual. Oh. But Alinejad okay. is going to take Iran back. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Boy, am I glad I got your name wrong. Uh, that, I, so let me just go on with this introduction, because it's so unusual. Uh, you've survived assassination. You've survived kidnapping. Your brother was put into prison for a couple of years. Your sister was forced to go on national television in Iran to denounce you. Uh, and uh, you are the leader. Every revolution needs a spark. And sometimes, particularly as I see it in Iran right now, there are many sparks. But one of the sparks that got all those other sparks going was you. It was not me. 
Well, it was the women of Iran. Let me make yeah. it very clear. The government, yes, they came after me. Um, but what I do, I just echo the voice of Iranian people, Iranian women. Eight years ago, when I launched a campaign against compulsory hijab, we've been ignored. People were saying that, especially the female politicians from EU, uh, have been ignoring us and saying that compulsory hijab is like the small issue. We're going to go there and negotiate with your murderers to solve bigger problems. For such a small issue, Mahsa Amini, 20-year-old woman, got killed. And Sarina, Nika, teenagers are getting killed in Iran. Four years ago, when I was in Canadian Parliament, I called on Canada to sanction revolutionary guards, to put them in terrorist lists, and we were ignored. So I was just echoing the voice of Iranian people. Now you see that the same revolutionary guards shot down the Ukrainian airplane and killed innocent Iranian Canadian passengers. Now Revolutionary Guards is in the streets and killing innocent people. So my job is just to echo the voice of Iranian people inside Iran, and that scares the regime, especially the women. Women were walking in the street, practicing their civil disobedience, and I was publishing their video. Their video got like 9 million views. Believe me, more than the Ayatollah altogether. Yeah. So this is the power of women inside Iran, and they're scared of Iranian women. Well, they're, they're, they're afraid of you in particular. Uh, but you have, uh, you, may, you may say that you're just reflective of voices in Iran, but in fact, you've got an extraordinary platform that goes with kind of an extraordinary personality. Uh, <laughs> but you've been able to speak to world leaders. You've been able to take the message uh, of revolution because you are not the only one, but you are one of the prime movers of the campaign against the compulsory use of the hijab. Tell me something about, you met with French President Macron recently. Tell me about that. Yes, I made him to call the uprising as it is, a revolution. But let me be very clear with you. It was not that easy. Uh, when I met him, I was very angry because you all saw a picture of him shaking the hand of Ibrahim Raisi, you know? And um, Ibrahim Raisi is the butcher. And I'm here actually to call the media, stop giving democratic titles to the murderers of Iran. So I was angry and I told him that, look at my face, look at the face of Iranian women. We share the values with you more than those backward mullahs. How did you shake the hand of a murderer? He said that France is all about diplomacy. And I said to President Macron, no, France is also about revolution. France has respect for revolutionary ideas. This is a revolution taking place in Iran, led by women, supported by men. And, and uh, I want you to be the first country, the leader of the G7, to recognize the revolution. And he did. I said that there's a famous saying um, that revolution eats, uh, eats um, devour its children. But now in Iran, the grandchildren are devouring the Islamic revolution because we are fed up. And I have actually a simple question here as well. If it was not the women of Iran, if it was the women in Canada being killed just because a little bit of hair is visible, if it was you, if it was you here being kicked out from a stadium just because of being women, then how do you call the regime? Gender apartheid, no? This is what I asked President Macron, and I'm calling the leaders of G7. Isolate the Islamic Republic the way that you were treating South Africa during the apartheid. Isolate the Islamic Republic the way that you isolate Putin. And I actually asked President Macron that um, what, when you see Iranian people are getting killed in the street, how do you feel? Don't think that we are fighting for ourselves. Iranians are putting their lives in danger. They're fighting to save democracy because Khamenei is helping Putin, sending drones to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. You all remember when Putin was in Syria, people in the West were like, we are not Syrian. When Putin was in Georgia, people were like, we are not Georgian. Now the war is here in the heart of Europe. And that's why I believe that all the leaders of democratic country, they must get united 
and isolate Khamenei and his gang of killers. If the d democratic countries right now, and I'm talking Canadian citizen, US citizen, British citizen, German citizen, all the you know, dual national citizens are in Iranian prison, being used to get like bargaining chip to get nuclear deal. Believe me, the dictators from Russia to China to Iran, Venezuela, they're more united than democratic countries. The democratic countries should get united and um, isolate the Islamic Republic, downgrade their relation with the Islamic Republic, and ask for the release of all innocent political prisoners. And if you don't get united, believe me, the dictators will get united and they will end democracy. I let me add one more thing to that list, because I'm interested in the actionable stuff that can be done. You've mentioned a few things. But I'm wondering whether it's time to start recognizing the opposition forces in Iran as the opposition, as the government in waiting. That's a very good question, because, um, look, for years and years, um, the Islamic Republic had its own lobbyists, which actually you heard some of the voice here from Nayak trying to say that, you know, what's going to happen after the Islamic Republic is going to be gone, then what's going to happen? Iran is going to be like Syria. Iran is going to be like Libya. Iran doesn't have any opposition. It's wrong. When you open the door of Evin prison, when you open the doors of prison across Iran, there are more like educated people, opposition, they can lead the country better than these backward mullahs. You know, mm -hmm. and this is the first time in the history we see a sense of unity among oppositions inside and outside Iran. We are united when it comes to bring the Islamic Republic down. And that's why I strongly believe that this unity should address, should give address to uh, the leaders of democratic countries that they should get united as well. And they have to meet with the coalition of the opposition, human rights activists, civil society activists, and understand that this is the time. Whether they want to stand in the right side of the history or in the wrong side of the history. They have to recognize Iran revolution and make themselves ready for a country without backward mullahs. For a country where women and men are equal. For a country that people are not getting killed for just expressing themselves. Believe me, Iran without the Islamic Republic would make the world a much safer place. If the West is really looking for stability in the region, they cannot go after one of the most unstable regime and bury human rights under nuclear deal. That's why I strongly believe, yes, this is the time that the Western countries, instead of just shaking the hands of murderers, they have to shake the hand of those who are fighting for democracy. Just one last thing about the Macron meeting that you had. Did he agree to see you again? Yes, okay, definitely. Yeah, not, not, not just himself. <laughs> he agreed. He promised. President Macron, if you hear me, he <laughs> promised that he is ready to make the leaders of G7 to meet with the leading opposition, human rights activists, and push them to recognize the revolution right now is taking place in Iran and negotiate with those who want dignity, democracy, and freedom. Uh, we've got some, not a whole lot of time, but we do have some time, and I'd like to open up the floor to anybody who would like to join the discussion. Um, anybody who dares. Uh, <laughs> trust me, you've got to bring your A-game to this one. Uh, here we go. Yes? No, I, I survived assassination plot. I'm not scared of difficult question. Go well, on. you're not afraid, but I, how about me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Hello, yes. Hi, um, very nice meeting you again, and uh, it's good to see you in person. Um, I just wanted to ask you, let's say that the Iranian government, uh, the current government, they're done. What's the, do you guys have a plan? Who's going to come and who's going to govern and who's going to take care of the affairs? I'm from Afghanistan. We've been through a horrible, horrible experience. I just want to make sure to, you know, to know whether you have a plan. I mean, it's easy to say, okay, this government, go away. What's next? Anything for Iran? That's a very good question. Let me first start from uh, women of Afghanistan. I strongly believe that if we get successful to kick out Taliban and Islamic Republic, women from Afghanistan, women from Iran, they have better plan 
than these backward, you know, barbaric Islamic states. Of course, of course we have plan. Of course we have so many strong leaders inside Iran. Let me just name some of them. Majid Tabakkoli, Hossein Ronaghi, for years and years, they have been actually uh, uh, echoing the voice of ordinary people, the voice of freedom fighters inside Iran, trying to tell the rest of the world that, you know, um, do not legitimize the Islamic Republic and stand with the people of Iran. They were actually trying to expose the, the lobbyists of the Islamic Republic as well. Now they are under torture in Iran. They are in, the, they are in prison. And they might be well, some of those who are actually the Iranian regime threatened them to receive death sentence, to kill them. So we have many educated people. We have many intellectual people inside and outside Iran. They are ready. They have planned to run the country. But the, the, the thing is that the Islamic Republic is successful to sell their narrative to the Western countries and saying that if you recognize the opposition or if you, um, you know, put the nuclear talk behind, Iran is going to be Libya. Iran is to, going to be Syria. But I'm here to tell you that Islamic Republic imposed war on its own people right now. Three years ago, 1,500 people got killed. When the West didn't punish the Islamic Republic, there's no reason for them to stop more people, to stop killing uh, more people. So for that, I strongly believe that if we get united and kick out and isolate these warmongers, uh, uh, you know, regime and isolate them, of course it's going to empower Iranian people to bring ch regime change within the society. We have better plan than Taliban and Islamic Republic. Let me ask if anybody else would like to get into this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Rachel Kleinfeld, and my question is a very practical one. I know a few years ago, um, people inside Iran were a little worried that U.S. help or foreign help might taint the movement. I'm wondering if now is a time when uh, opposition parties, and I use that plural, um, could be helped by foreign efforts to help them organize, get the comms, get the background, and also whether there are parts of the military that might be able to take part in those conversations for future defections? That's a very good question. Look, that, it breaks my heart when I see that still this is a question, people saying that whether the US government, the Canadian government, whether the foreign government uh, su supports, put people's lives in danger. Look, this is very clear. Human rights, women's rights is a global issue. And everyone, everyone, should take a stance. When Burkini ban happened in France, when George Floyd brutally got killed in America, what was the reaction of the rest of the world? Everyone got united, no? Then what is different between the people of Iran, the people of Afghanistan, and the people in the West? Now teenagers are getting killed. Children, children are getting killed in Iran. Of course the US government should call its allies in the West to kick out all the diplomats. Of course, this is the time for the Western countries to close their embassy and cut their ties with these murderers. Of course, they have to support. I mean, that was the, the wrong narrative of the, you know, some of the apologists and lobbyists convinced Obama, Obama's administration, to stop supporting green movement. What happened? Obama recently admitted that it was a mistake. So, organizing a democratic opposition and whether there were military elements that could be brought Yes, but the, the Western government should start supporting and legitimizing the revolution first. And now the oil workers are walking out from their works. So where is the help from Western government? You know, they have to survive. I strongly believe, I have a very radical idea here. I strongly believe that the Western government should actually offer the army in Iran, stop killing people, we're gonna pay your salaries. Yes, they have to do it. Especially, there is a lot of, you know, uh, the, like people, the, you see that the, the Iranian regime even don't dare to ask the army to take to the street. There are plain clothes there, Basiji there, revolutionary guards there. So the army is ready, but they have to see the signal, you know? So that is why it breaks my heart when I still see that 
the Western democratic countries, they hesitate to say that we are with you, the people of Iran, because Iranian people are risking their lives, getting killed, facing guns and bullets every day. They're just ready, ready to bring this regime down, but they have to see the signal that the democratic countries are going to help them morally and not just morally, practically saying that we are with you. Instead of sending billions of dollars to the regime, they have to send money to oil workers, to army, to people inside Iran who are fighting the Islamic Republic. I have only one last question that requires only a five second answer. Oh, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm sure you understand my anger. Listen, a, a you know? man's reach must exceed his grasp or what's a heavens for? <laughs> uh, when the regime comes to an end, as it will, will you be part of the new government? Um, my dream is to bring this regime down and go back and hug all those true leaders who are in prison right now and hug them. Believe me, we, the people of Iran, can run the country better than these backward and barbaric mullahs. Massey, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, there sir. you go. Even shaking hand with men is forbidden. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Louisa Savage. I'm executive editor for Growth at Politico, and we're incredibly proud to be a media partner for the Halifax International Security Forum. Uh, as a transatlantic news organization in the United States, in Europe, and in Canada, this is uh, a wonderful forum for us to, to partner on. Um, this panel today, I don't think an hour is going to be enough, so we'll consider this just the beginning of what I think is one of the most important conversations at this forum. We have an unbelievable panel of so many incredible experts and perspectives from um, several parts of the alliance here, so this is going to be incredibly educational. Um, I'm just going to introduce our panel from the far end, um, coming closer in. Um, Laurent Rusekis is Executive Director of Gas and Power Renewables, of Gas, Power and Renewables at S&P Global Commodity Insights. And I had the distinct pleasure of sitting next to him on the bus from the airport this morning, and I basically got a master class in energy uh, analysis this morning, so I'm hoping he'll bring that uh, to our conversation today. Um, next to him, it is my absolute honor to introduce Ambassador Yulia Kovalev, who is uh, Ukraine's ambassador to Canada. And not only that, but she was an energy regulator before that and uh, sat on the board of uh, Ukraine's biggest uh, gas company. So she has a, a wealth of expertise as well. Um, next to the ambassador is General Raimund Andrzejczak, and he is the chief of the general staff of the Polish Armed Forces. And we had an incredible conversation yesterday uh, outside the bar. So I can't wait to share some of his insights as well. Um, next to him is Nancy Southern, the chair and CEO of Atco Limited, um, Atco and Canadian Utilities Limited. And I have to say, I grew up in Calgary, and those Atco trailers are an indelible part of my childhood. So great to have you here as well for a Canadian perspective. Um, and next to me, um, straight from Camelot, Sir Michael Arthur, <laughs> the president of Boeing International, who's here from the UK and has a really global perspective. Uh, on the future of industry, the future of aviation as well. So we're very excited to have him here. Um, so this is just a, a great group of people, but I think where I'd like to start this conversation is I think what's on all of our minds, which is the situation right now on the ground in Ukraine. Um, Ambassador, there have been many severe attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. What is happening there right now on the ground? Um, and going into this cold winter, are we going to be able to rebuild that infrastructure in time? Thank you for, for that question. And actually, one of the instruments of Russia's war in Ukraine, except for the tanks, except for the missiles that hit our uh, throughout the country, is actually using the energy as a weapon. We saw it from the very beginning of the war was when Russia was threatening non, not only Ukraine by using energy, but also threatening the unity of our allies, using the gas as a power to heed the, this coalition of the countries supporting Ukraine. But we all showed the, the unity. And as we heard also yesterday on the panel, everybody is more confident on this winter on the European continent. And within the recent attacks, especially the one was, that was on Tuesday this week, Russia specifically hit the electricity infrastructure throughout all of the country. Um, we estimate that around 40% of all of the electricity infrastructure have been destroyed or massively hit with this missiles attacks throughout 40% 40. 40 of all of the infrastructure. And of course, this Russia is doing, trying to break the morale of Ukrainians, because the winter is coming. The winter is very cold in Ukraine, probably not so cold as in Canada, but it's still snow and uh, quite a low temperature. And as we are sitting today in a beautiful hall with a lot of light, many of Ukrainians for many hours a day have no electricity at all. And this war showed also us many things that we took for granted. Like you just enter the room, switch on the light, and you have it. You can prepare the food. You can uh, be in a, your warm house in winter. What Russia is doing now is depriving Ukrainians of those basic needs, which is also a, a genocide ex uh, against the Ukrainian people, having no ability even to, 
to connect with their parents. Because if you don't have the electricity for many uh, cities, you just don't have the mobile connection, which makes the life very hard to Ukrainians. Another thing which is, uh, which is a big threat, both for Ukraine, but for the global security, is the nuclear. This is the first time when, during the war, the nuclear power facilities, civilian one, has been hit. We all remember within the first days of the war, Russian troops occupying Chernobyl nuclear station. Now, Zaporizhia nuclear station. It's the biggest nuclear power plant in the Europe for the months years under the occupation. And the significant threat around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant makes all us to think about the security of the nuclear. And security not only for us in Ukraine, but that is a big global threat uh, for that. In terms of uh, the rebuilding, and I think we will talk a bit on, uh, on that panel uh, today and how we see this rebuilding, it is happening already. And we have a huge number of thousands of the heroes. These are the electricity workers that work in 24 seven. Just in day reconnecting, being innovative to try to deliver electricity with the shortest terms. And in order to help us, because this is the most uh, massive attack on the huge uh, critical infrastructure for the country, uh, we launched the same format uh, as we uh, were dealing with the defense and the military support, which we call Rammstein. Now we launched the energy Rammstein, uh, taking on board our partners throughout the world, the countries to coordinate the efforts on how we can find this equipment. It's, it's like in the weapons. It's not so easy and quickly when you can deliver hundreds of tons transformators uh, to replace the ones that have been destroyed. And this coordinated effort that we started a few weeks ago with our, all of our partners and allies, it is helping us to try to find this equipment, to try to facilitate its delivery to Ukraine so we can restart the normal life of Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. And on that point, you know, my colleagues at, at Politico, they've reported that Ukraine, uh, that the government of Ukraine is privately telling the US government that you will not have enough components and supplies to rebuild the energy grid this winter without US economic aid. And given the changes in Congress and the concern that maybe the Biden administration won't get all the economic aid that they're asking for from Congress, how, how worried are you about that? Uh, we are confident in all our partners and ourselves to coordinate this effort. The first, what I mentioned, it's, it's not easy to take. And we have here Nancy from the uh, energy sector in Canada, and she knows very well that it's not the equipment that can be easily bought on the market and delivered within a few days to Ukraine. And that's why we are both talking to the governments of all our partners and also to the private sector, saying if if it's, it's the same approach as we were dealing with the weapons. If there are the equipment with the companies that was being used and is planned to be replenished in a few months of the years, we would like to take both the used ones, the new ones, or whatever it is in the stock. Sometimes we also are trying to find these creative solutions, um, which was almost impossible like from the technical side before the attacks. Now, um, our engineers is also trying to do these innovations to try to feed the equipment, for example, from North America to Ukrainian grid. Um, and it's not only the problem for Ukraine. As we were facing Russia threatening the Europe, Ukraine stepped in and we were ready to export Ukrainian electricity to EU, try to help EU countries to substitute the deficit of Russian gas. And by these uh, attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure, it's actually pushed us to stop exporting electricity because we just don't have it for mm -hmm. Ukraine. So it's also a big risk for our European colleagues and our partners as Ukrainian system is now fully integrated with the uh, European market that we we're eager, but now, unfortunately, we are not able to help Europe with, with Ukrainian power. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go to Lauren. Um, 
my colleagues at Politico Europe recently got a lot of backlash uh, for a very provocative uh, piece that they did. They published their Green 28 list um, of you know, all the regulators, activists, politicians who were greening Europe. And uh, number one on the list, above all the activists and regulators, they listed uh, President Vladimir Putin. Um, and they wrote, it took a war criminal to speed up Europe's green revolution. Uh, Putin has achieved something generations of green campaigners could not. Clean energy is now a fundamental matter of European security. Now, I know it's a little bit more complicated than that, and I'd love for you to just sketch out for us, has this been a bonanza for green energy? Has it been a bonanza for fossil fuels? How has this war changed the trajectory that we're on towards the energy transition? <clears throat> Thank you. It's a good, I mean, it is provocative, uh, but there's something to it because what I think now everyone can see very clearly is that renewable energy and the energy transition is going to be a major contributor to energy security in Europe because you're not depending on fossil fuels coming from a country now, a, a hostile country, an adversary. Um, there are supply chain issues in the renewable sector, in the electricity sector, batteries, et cetera, but I don't think they're at the same critical level as the dependence on Russian gas, which has brought Europe to the, the place it is today. I think that in terms of what's going to happen tangibly with policy, the EU initial response, two weeks after the invasion, there was a first draft of a document called Repower EU, was put out, then it was fleshed out a couple months later, and the response was speed up the energy transition. So we're not only dealing with the loss of Russian gas, but we're also going to speed up moving away from gas altogether and speed up the construction of renewables, et cetera, batteries, uh, and all of that. I think in the, there's a difference between medium-term perspective and short-term. In the medium-term, for sure, this is going to speed up as much as it can be sped up, that energy transition investment in renewables. By the way, the EU already had very ambitious targets there. A and this is largely issues, there's no problem with capital for that. The capital is there. The issues are really things like permitting and speeding up permitting for renewables projects, which is something European Commission. Yeah, so is this the opportunity to basically end nimbyism when it comes to uh, energy infrastructure in Europe? Is that that's, what's going to happen here? That's the plan. It's hard for the Commission to do that because that's a national level responsibility. But what the, the, the renewable energy directive is being revised now, what they're going to say to EU member states is you have to designate a certain area which is a go-to site for renewable development. That's a, sort of pre-permitted where you're not going to get legal objections and nimbyism. So that could be very positive. But in the very short term, the crisis we face now, uh, which is a crisis not just for this winter and next winter, and I don't think it's primarily a crisis of freezing in the dark, not having enough gas. Price prices are working. Price signals are working. Demand is down. There's a lot of LNG coming in from around the world. Germany in particular is bringing in a lot more infrastructure very quickly to import more LNG. The problem is price. Gas prices in Europe are very, very high. They're six to eight times what they were back in the you know, normal times. Uh, and that's not going to change for a few years. The LNG industry, it takes four and a half years from the time you take an investment decision till you have a liquefaction plant operating. So the supply of LNG is essentially fixed till about 2026 uh, based on projects that are already underway. And so now you have Europe taking a lot more of this LNG to replace Russian gas, that LNG has to come from somewhere else. And that, I think, is a threat to the energy transition in, in, in places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Those are the countries that are not getting LNG because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, you're having some brownouts, factories shut, shutting in those countries. Again, a direct result of Russia cutting the gas to Europe because mm -hmm. there's a global LNG market. And so then the question becomes, how do they cope with this? And the obvious way is to use more coal in the near term. In the very short term, Europe's also using a bit more coal. Um, uh, so I think in Europe, it's a very short term issue. And in terms of climate and net zero, things will be back on track pretty quickly. But for the rest of the world, I I'm, I'm, would be concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're sitting here in Canada, a major energy producer, producer of gas and oil. There's been some discussion in this country about whether Canada <coughs> should be providing more LNG, setting itself up to uh, provide more to its allies. Is that, uh, would that be a, a smart decision or 
given the timelines involved, will that not make a, a difference? Well, I mean, I think obviously it would, it would help. Again, I, there's this four, four and a half year timeline. So it's not going to, nothing Canada can do or nothing the U.S. can do right now is going to contribute in the next one or two years in terms of more LNG supply. Going forward, for sure. I mean, the problem is in North America and Canada and the U.S. too, it's really, really hard to build new <coughs> transmission pipelines. And in the, in the US, you know, you've got a lot of gas in Appalachia that's stuck there because nobody can get a pipeline built out of there. You have the Northeast still importing LNG because you can't build pipelines. So it's a d similar problem in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn to uh, General Andrzejczak for the view from Poland. Um, you know, being born in Poland myself, I'm very interested in your, in your view here on how vulnerable is Poland right now, both um, from a security perspective and an energy security perspective? And, and what are you doing um, to increase your security right now? Thank you. Um, a lot of efforts well, Poland put last uh, couple of years to, uh, to be independent in energy, which makes me happy as a citizen of Poland because we have a lot of investments, but also uh, a lot of challenges how to secure this infrastructure and this is the great example that everything is is uh, it's about energy so poland invested heavily uh, in the lng terminal in Świnoujście, north part of poland and there will be a, a big connection the blue pipe but connected to the norway gas and finally if there's operational we will be uh, very independent concerning gas as well as uh, gdansk and gdynia which is the city you know very well a, a lot of terminals and infrastructure and I think uh, uh, we are a pretty good example of how to invest properly uh, attention and, and, uh, and, and energy, kind of energy of a state to increase the uh, energy independence. But as well, it's, uh, it's very important to uh, synchronize uh, investments with the, the discussion how to, how to secure the recent events when we saw in the Nord Stream 2 is uh, you know the explosions this is answer that is very vulnerable and i'm not sure it is necessarily army job for navy but uh, we are experts to um to design the system uh, to be to be secure how vulnerable it is the ukraine is a, is a perfect example is extremely important and how much is the climate conversation coming into poland's energy planning or is it very much a security conversation uh, well, this is a very, very difficult question, and I would say, like in the map I show, it's not easy to be green. I, I'm green. I, <laughs> it's a typical question for uh, for politicians and for the energy experts. But I think, uh, <clears throat> yes, of course, it, it, it's, it goes that direction. Although Poland is very land-heavy, uh, ground-oriented uh, north, relatively, if you look in the region, but the situation and the climate change in Africa immediately goes to the uh, migrations and the people going from a certain direction is a mission for European Union, for NATO, observing our resources and so on. So everything is interconnected. Anything happen in, in Africa, uh, pretty soon concerning climate, goes to the, to the uh, migration, goes to um, the food issues. So uh, we as uh, the main experts of security have to be very, very close to those issues. So. Well, the ambassador was talking about the difficulties of rebuilding the electricity grid, the logistics, the supply chain issues. And Poland um, is serving as a big logistics hub on, on its border, where most recently we had these errant missiles come and kill two Polish citizens. It is. Can you just give us here at the forum um, just a description of what that looks like there on the ground right now? How secure is that logistics hub? And in light of these recent missiles, are you doing anything differently um, to secure that operation? And what do you think allies should be doing to help secure that logistics area there in your Zeshuv that, that we discussed the other day? It is. So, so you don't have a, a problems to pronounce the Zeshuv, but it, <laughs> around the globe, that is most well known as a J town. It's, it's easier to It's about six con consonants uh, in a row, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So from the very beginning, in the first day, uh, Poland realized that we have uh, two missions in two directions. One is to, uh, to, uh, to uh, help the uh, situation when the Ukrainians are going in the western direction. More than six million Ukrainians crossed the Polish border. There was a one mission. A second mission was to support uh, any kind of uh, um, transportation and supplies to Ukraine. So 
most of the equipment, most of the ammunition, tanks, uh, artillery assets, and the medical uh, stuff is going through the, this lovely town. So immediately we set up the very effective uh, logistic base and the uh, first issue was security. So the United States contribution to helping us in the building uh, this uh, protection system together with the, with the Br uh, British component is absolutely critical. So no, now it is very effective, uh, but the very important message for everybody here is that Poland took a very uh, high level of strategical risk building so close, it's not so far away, the city you come from, uh, in the other side of a of, uh, of border. And uh, the protection and the sending a much uh, stronger, I would say, message to Russia is needed right now. The incident we observed a couple of days before is, is the conclusion that Russia is escalating and is going closer and closer to the NATO borders. I would say winter is coming, not necessarily only in the, as, a, as a season, but uh, in much wider meaning, winter is coming to the borders. And, and uh, this is the mission for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are you looking for from allies? Are you looking for a no-fly zone there? Like, what do you want to see in terms of securing that area? Uh, it's, it's, again, it's not easy to be a green. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I would say we, we need more uh, developed discussion in, in a strategical level to realize if, we, uh, if we're helping enough uh, Ukraine. Uh, technically, from the point of uh, infrastructure, our efforts, Poland is second donator uh, as, a, as a nation, and we send a lot of equipment, uh, but I would inspire and other countries as well to do uh, the same scale of uh, support for Ukraine. We, 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 Ukraine has to win. That's our mission, full stop. And uh, this is the question for us, uh, is it enough or not, what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, speaking of um, the, the logistics, uh, Nancy, ATCO plays a big role in um, helping, whether it's military or humanitarian aid around the world. Um, how are you looking at the uh, energy security situation from where you sit? I was really struck yesterday uh, by Admiral Bauer's uh, comments on the lack of preparedness of the industry to address the supply issues for munitions and defense weaponry. I also am very struck by the lack of preparedness to deal with energy transition today and also have industry ready for war. The amount of investment and um, time and machinery that is being taken up to do grid transformation and energy transition around the world is really quite remarkable. It's slow. It's not where we would like it to be. It is a massive undertaking to achieve a net zero world by 2050, massive, trillions of dollars, that many policymakers don't really understand the practicality of that. And quite frankly, industry has never been brought into the conversation with regards to security. And the readiness and stores of supplies that are required in a situation that we're experiencing today. Transformers around the world, we have hurricanes, we have all kinds of weather events. They are in short supply. And they require real expertise to get countries like the Ukraine back up and running. Generators that are modular and mobile. And quite frankly, in the middle of the Ukraine, in an active theater of war, where are we going to get or be able to build renewables? It's not possible. We're going to have to rely on fossil fuels to be able to make sure those generators are producing electricity to support the water supply system, to support agriculture, to support the technology. And I think from my perspective, I'm a, our company is making a big bet on hydrogen, renewables, clean technology around the world, Australia, Canada, Puerto Rico, Chile. But we have not been brought into a conversation 
by government or defense as to how we get prepared for situations like we're experiencing with the Ukraine today. And I, th I think that, that you know, I have been a big proponent of bringing industry to the table to make sure that we can be prepared. And today, we are seeing the consequences of that lack of preparation. What, what do you blame that on? <laughs> I, I, th I am a climate change believer, number one. Net zero is an is a noble goal, I think we heard on the uh, video. Right today, it's aspirational. And policymakers, um, I, I've been a participant at COP on uh, several occasions. But policymakers are not listening to what the practical aspects of costs and affordability and reliability, for both on the defense side, but from a practical side for nations being able to continue in the way that they have and progress to the future that we want. So I, I think there's been a de-link between policymakers. There's a uh, lack of mandate by regulators to follow the net zero. And then there's a lack of understanding of the preparedness that we need. So I, I blame all of us. <laughs> um, but I think this crisis in the Ukraine is a rallying cry for all of us to work much closer together and collaborate on what we can bring to the table in order to assist each other in making this world a better place and a safer place. Mm -hmm. Well, Sir Michael, um, obviously the world is arming itself right now in, uh, in the view of this war. Poland has ramped up um, its acquisition going around the world, uh, even to Korea, to, to find um, all kinds of armaments. Um, when they come to Boeing and ask for fighter jets or munition systems or whatever, how often do they, these governments ask you the carbon footprint? Does that ever come up in the conversation? A good question. Thank you, Louisa. But before I answer that, just a word of thanks to Peter. Hats off to Peter and the team for putting this on the agenda. I think this long-term energy impact on security is uh, these two are inseparable now we see it today with ukraine which is where we talked but as the general picked up you know what happens when africa starts migrating what happens in when bangladesh starts flooding you know there's a serious long-term security issue so i'm really pleased that the halifax is is is, is gripping uh, with this uh, and i think um, nancy mentioned the point about the long-term challenge and we're not yet gripping it I mean, some governments are trying to do that. Look at Don Kerry's first move with coalition with the World Economic Forum in Davos. I mean, they're trying to get us all on the same page to do it, but the journey is a difficult one. Uh, so to your question, um, when governments come in a hurry wanting um, planes for Ukrainian war, uh, sustainability is not top of their list. But I think the mood in the, in the world is changing in aviation. Aviation is a small part of this debate, but we've become the sort of focal point for that because, well, you can see aeroplanes with contrails and so on. Uh, we're 3% of the, of the output of CO2, but we're tackling it. And governments aren't yet asking that. They're beginning to, but for the longer term. But the airlines are because customers want to be green when they fly. And, I mean, 80% of the world has never set foot in an aeroplane. They deserve to fly, they want to fly, but they've got to fly green to your net zero point. So we're all working on that uh, quite hard and gradually we've got to set a target for the industry as a whole. Governments have agreed that in ICAO. By 2050 we will fly green, uh, net zero. And we've got a roadmap to get there, but it, as Nancy says, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I can give you some detail later if you'd mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, one thing I'm, I'm wondering about is, um, you know, all these technologies of the future need a lot of natural resources, right, right to um, build the batteries and so on. And it's a conversation uh, around supply chains that we've been having since COVID as well, right? And this realization that, oh, wait, China actually controls the refining of so many of these critical materials that we need. And I wonder, how are you, and 
and your company looking at your supply chains as you're thinking to the future of whatever it is, electric planes or you know, more efficient engines, you need a lot of metals and minerals. Um, where are you going to source them and, and how are you thinking about those supply chains? I mean, before we get on to the next generation, the current generation has a problem with titanium because you know, a third of the world's titanium came, very good titanium, came from Russia. So day two of the invasion, we cut off all our offtake of supply of, of we had a joint venture in Siberia and we stopped it. Um, and so we're now sourcing elsewhere in the world where we can find aerospace grade titanium. Actually fun enough we're looking with Canada at developing somewhere in Canada, which is quite exciting. So it's not just about uh, the, the rare earths, which you mentioned from, from China, but uh, they are very important because for the future of um, lots of things, but including flight, where electric um, batteries are going to be required, components for that need rare earths, and China has a lot of sources of those. There are other sources around the world, and we're all looking very carefully to make sure that we have adequate supplies. Mm -hmm. And that is the future uh, mm -hmm. for cars and for aviation. Mm -hmm. Can I just yes. add to that, Lisa? There, companies like Boeing are ad very adept at large-scale, rapid expansion from a factory perspective. And manufacturing is actually one of those areas that I believe we could retool quickly to help provide more munitions and more and deploy more, more products that are required. The minerals that are required, in Canada today, one of, those, one of those mines for a titanium or any of the rare earth minerals takes about 15 years to actually be commissioned. The permit and license, because of the green advocacy, not climate change, green advocacy against developing our resources is so difficult to get through. And then on, on another level, in Canada, we also have um, a duty to consult and actually partner with our indigenous peoples, which is a good thing, but it does take time. And so if we need <coughs> rapid response, which is what we need in wartime situations from industry, from civilians, from our defense, and we look to our defense, our, our military force, our armed forces to respond, we have to find a better way to deliver. Mm -hmm. Well, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to come in, I mean, you're talking about uh, urgent military equipment, but this pressure uh, for green in the, uh, the longer term, I'm now talking commercial, uh, let's go back to titanium. You have it in Canada, sponge. It's got to be developed and then certified. And for aerospace, we use 10 to the minus 9 as a safety criteria. Mm -hmm. That's pretty demanding. And uh, titanium, like that, it's just one example, lots of rare earth equivalents. You've got a huge amount of infrastructure investment which takes time to put in place. You can't flick your fingers and go green, mm -hmm. that's the trouble. But I want to ask Lauren, like, haven't we been having this conversation for as long as I can remember? <laughs> I mean, we, we want to go green, but it's hard. It's so hard, it takes time. I mean, are we, given that the timeline is not ours to choose, right? I mean, the, the warming of the earth is happening. It is being documented, and every year we're losing time. So how, where are we on that timeline, and like, how much do we need to accelerate? Well, one positive thing, the, the biggest, the, the earlier, the old problem has been solved, which is that wind and solar were expensive. They had to be subsidized. That's finished. Wind and solar are cheap. And that's very, very clear. So now we've moved on. We have the luxury of worrying about these second order problems, which are also critical, but the supply chain uh, and all of this. And also the capital markets. I mean, there's a good and a bad to ESG and capital markets. There's a lot of money available for renewable projects. There's a lot of money that financial institutions want to deploy there. And we've heard from General or Admiral Bauer yesterday that does that really make sense for ESG, for you, you not being able to invest in arms that are needed to defend Europe. Uh, it's the same thing, obviously, with oil and gas, where now everyone can see maybe it wasn't such a good idea. The, the, sh the shortage of gas in the world today was obviously caused by Vladimir Putin, but the fact that there was underinvestment for a few years because of ESG uh, trends is, is also not very helpful. Um, I, I think this final point that 
Obviously, industry is part of the solution. I mean, your words, Nancy, very clearly the case that there, there's been a tendency, you're speaking of not bringing industry into the dialogue, but there's also a tendency in terms of the energy transition to exclude or think oil and gas companies don't have a role to play. Of course they have a role to play. I think that's becoming more and more understood over time, but they have, first of all, they've got enormous cash flow right now because of high gas prices, high oil prices. So that's cash flow that many of those big, let's call them energy companies, now not oil and gas companies, that they're deploying to support the energy transition. And of course they have critical skills in terms of carbon capture and storage, in terms of hydrogen, that those companies have to be part of the solution. So it's part of the, the discussion we, we were hearing before. Great. Well, I want the audience to start thinking of their questions, um, and we'll um, take questions in one second. I would just like to ask the ambassador, when you look forward, what does energy security for Ukraine look like? What, what would you like to see after this war? The, the <clears throat> Ukraine, like historically, we were suffering from the Russian energy war for over the decades. And I would like to remind you three times in the middle of winter, around the 1st of January, Russia totally cut off gas supply to Ukraine, demanding some of the political bargain. And unfortunately, in 2012, um, Russia's policy to Ukraine was to sell Ukraine as much as possible, politically cheap Russian gas, and to trade with Ukrainian governments at that time um, to increase in Russian political presence in Ukraine. And unfortunately, we do already pay a huge price. In 2012, uh, when Russia offered to Ukrainian, at that time, uh, President, a cheap uh, gas contract, which is, of course, very favorable for any politician, they asked to prolong the uh, basing of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And that was used to increase Russian presence in Crimea. Mm. And led to the occupation of Crimea in 2014. That is a very painful story Ukraine lived through and understood how much Russia was playing and using energy as a political weapon. We were very loudly together with our po Polish colleagues um, advocating against Nord Stream, especially the Nord Stream 2, because we understood that by leveraging the countries with cheap Russian gas, um, they undermine the efforts for the green transition, then undermine the efforts on the energy security and diversification for the, both the conventional energy resources and the uh, renewable one. And unfortunately, it only became so clear when Russia invaded uh, into Ukraine. And the first thing they uh, actually destroyed in Ukraine is 90% of the wind farms and 50% of the solo farms. Mm, very intentionally. Very intentionally understanding that as we were moving to diversification of the uh, energy, they just started to destroy specifically the, the green energy. Because if we look on Russia, the major revenues Russia is getting and actually using to wage the war is the uh, oil and gas revenues. And we are on the edge of this uh, uh, six package of European sanctions banning uh, Russian oil and the price cap is under the discussion. It is important to deprive Russia from these huge revenues which are exceeding 100 billions of dollars only this year. But if we are looking about, uh, on the rebuilding, we were ambitious on the uh, renewables. Um, before the war, Ukraine had around 11% of the renewables in uh, overall energy mix. We had the, uh, the plan to increase them by 2030, around 20. Uh, we were building around two gigawatts a year, previous before the war. So the speed was quite big, especially in the wind, and we have this climate capacity uh, to build it. And after the rebuilding, there is a positive thing. We will have a chance to not only rebuild, but build better. Mm. And build, build back better. better. Build it better. <laughs> and build it better yeah. is also a part of the build better energy. Build more secure, more uh, addressing the climate change, and taking the, the best technology. This both the 
classical renewable wind and solar, but also the hydrogen, but also the biomass. Ukraine is among top 10 agri-countries, and the biomass and the biogas mm -hmm. is actually very natural for us as Ukraine to, to be self-reliant on the energy. And that we see as our future. We will build this better. Mm -hmm. um, Sir Michael. I just wanted to add one point. The ambassador makes a really clear example of the interrelationship of energy and political pressure. Uh, and I just think if you look at the wider global picture over the next generation, um, I mean, good example recently, Australia and China, uh, Australian coal to China, got very caught up in politics. Iran, we spoke about this morning, single biggest export is to China, um, Saudi Arabia, ditto. India is now trying to become more independent as their economy grows. I think this energy politics relationship around the world is just a crucial issue for Halifax to think about. And it's an incredible way to think about how geopolitics will change once we, we get. Uh, go ahead, General. If I may, just uh, a few comments. I got a feel, feeling that uh, we are you know, representing the other hemisphere and very close to the, to the danger. Let's, let's take some uh, strategical perspective. 2008, Russia invades Georgia. And uh, my president is going to the Georgia, and he says, 2008, and he says, today Georgia, tomorrow Ukraine, 2008. And then uh, is a, probably Baltic states, and one day maybe my country. He said that point at 2008. We lost him in uh, 2010 and, and small as Russia in, in the presidential crash, uh, a crash. And what the punishment we prepare for Russia for such a situation? Nord Stream 1, it was a kind of a yeah. punishment. And then everything is going exactly what he said is going to Ukraine, 2014. And we are not happy with the situation we see and what kind of punishment we prepare for him. It's, two, it's a Nord Stream 2. And then we have a 2022, 24th of February. And before we go with the, with the important questions, I would put some question, what kind of punishment we're gonna prepare for Russia today? Thank you. Scotty Greenwood. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, maybe for the private sector, um, participants in the panel, what does ideal public-private collaboration look like when we are trying to replace Russian energy, when we're trying to decouple with China? Nancy Southern said 15 years is too long to permit a facility. I couldn't agree more. So, so if you could design an ideal collaboration um, for energy security for the world and for the crisis in Ukraine, uh, what does government need to do differently? We know the Pentagon is trying to de-risk some capital, but what, what should it look like? Thank you. Thank you. I, I think industry and the, um, and policy makers in politics could take a lot of lessons and a lot of learnings out of training and preparation, planning, from our armed forces. They are the most well-trained of all of us in terms of thinking about scenarios and the, um, kind of the, the, the PERT chart or Gantt chart, whatever you want to call it. If action A happens, we have three options and we have front-end loaded the decision making about those three options. And I don't think uh, in politics or in industry we have that same training to think long term strategic, action oriented planning. So I would actually ask first of all, once you get finished um, looking after the world for us, that we find a way and I think we, I know in our company, we have, we've learned a lot by taking on uh, veterans from the forces that are teaching us about this preparedness and planning and strategic outlooks. So that's really, I think we need to start from mm -hmm. the fact that we don't have that training to the same degree, either in politics or in industry. I think we had a question from a gentleman at the back. 
Hi, my name is uh, Cody Blois. I'm the Member of Parliament uh, from King's Hands, just outside of Halifax, and Chair of the uh, House of Commons Agriculture Committee. Uh, Nancy, I can't agree more on the regulatory piece, so we should talk after and see what I could do to help uh, in Parliament to help drive that with some of my colleagues. Um, I missed the first 10 minutes of the remarks, but I didn't hear a whole lot on nuclear. And I think about uh, Canada, whether it be Cameco and some of the opportunities, and, and by the way, I agree, certainly hydrogen is where we're moving, huge opportunities here in the Atlantic. But I'm perplexed sometimes to see countries in Europe that seem to be stepping back on nuclear to focus on coal or other fossil fuels. Any comments from the panel, whether it be some of the folks on the energy side, when I look at North America and the uranium deposits that exist in Canada, along with our shared expertise, I see opportunities to not only have uh, that as a, amongst our allies, but certainly to help the world. Any comments? Juliana. So from Ukraine's perspective, Ukraine before the war was producing over 50% of all our electricity from the nuclear. Uh, what we have been doing for the last 10 years, as for the gas, just uh, not buying it, it's Russia and diversifying the flow. The same we understood that it's also, um, because they were building Soviet Union, most of them, on Russian technology, we understood that this is a risk. And the risk on the nuclear side is much higher. So we diversified the flow of nuclear fuel, uh, making them both US and, and part uh, on, on the other sources. And since we now understand the huge risk, especially around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which has been few times shelling, so there were the missiles just few hundred meters from the reactor. And this I would like to remind the biggest nuclear uh, uh, plant in the Europe. We understand that after the occupation, of, uh, of Zaporizhia nuclear, which is essential point that also EIAA mission uh, declared and said for the sake of nuclear security. We will need to maintain and work a lot on the Zaporizhia, but also the nuclear technology is coming forward. We see this technology on, on the model nuclear reactors, much sw smaller that can be deployed um, um, in, in different parts of the, uh, of the countries. And we are also looking at it as a future, as a future of our rebuilding and looking on, on that technology that can play a big role both in Ukraine and our Polish colleagues just made their uh, decision to go to the new uh, nuclear power, understanding about the, the energy threats and the need to uh, diversify. So, from our perspective, we, st we see that nuclear still plays a, a big role in Ukraine, and it will continue to play that role. Mm -hmm. Sir Michael. For a quick comment on that, um, not on nuclear. I don't think you want us to fly airplanes on nuclear power. But uh, from where you represent in Canada, I think Canada has a huge opportunity on the next generation of aviation fuel, sustainable aviation fuels, and there are lots of ways to make that but you have a lot of the ingredients here in this part of the world, and we're looking at that with Canada. Just pass on to you. Uh, Sir Michael, when are we going to get electric planes? <laughs> I mean, we... No, I live on the flight path from Reagan Airport. This is quite well, um, a yeah, relevant great. To um, me. We're making one at the moment, <laughs> actually, and um, uh, some engineers in Montreal are helping us do it. So we are developing a, an EV to electric vertical takeoff uh, taxi <laughs> To 12 little uh, rotors that lift it up, another one that pushes it along. Very silent, it's about as loud as a car, uh, and it will be autonomous. And the idea is that you have hundreds of these things buzzing across cities to and from the airport. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm excited Price or Uber. scared now. Well, you could have a pilot if you, long, if you like, but we're going to make it so you don't have to. And we're planning to bring that to market this decade. So this very decade? Exciting, yeah. Wow. All right. Do we have a question on this side? Oh, lots of questions uh, right here in the front. Um, my question is about the, um, the capacity or the natural endowments of some nation states to make that energy transition. Um, some, some states are more endowed or in a better position, whether it be um, land space, um, sun, wind. Um, how it, it, is this another form of... Um, uh, division in the world, haves and have-nots? Is there potential for state-on-state -state, um, disharmony as a result 
of that division um, and what can we do as a global community to overcome that um, so that we're not creating further divisions in the world. Mm, great question. I mean, Lauren, this is a big issue at COP, right? What are the responsibilities of some countries versus others? H how do you look at that question? Well, first of all, that's right. That was the key issue that sort of got, there was a statement at the end uh, about responsibility for lower income countries. But I think the question you're asking, it's true. And, and I think, I don't think it's going to recreate dependence on oil and gas that led to dependence on certain countries because I think there's a big problem in the supply chain with minerals, but those minerals are all over the place. Um, we just need to find them, mine them, and fix this permitting issue that takes 15 years to, to do. So I think that one will slowly uh, uh, get addressed. The US has done some of that with the IRA. Europe has been looking at this for a long time, trying to take, take action there. The other one, I think in Europe, from a European perspective, the European transition to hydrogen, there's an acknowledgement that uh, green hydrogen, hydrogen produced using clean electricity and electrolysis, that the resources in Europe are not sufficient for that. So Europe is trying to build partnerships with countries you know, that have tremendous solar, wind potential, North Africa, uh, Namibia is a big focus of attention now. Um, and then the question is a technical one, transporting that to Europe. And that's when I think the jury's still out how that's gonna be done. But that's the sort of thing that businesses know how to solve if the capital is there, which it is, and if the determination is there. But Laurent, the question of where you get the water for electrolysis also has not been solved. And so I think your, your point on have and have not countries with regards to energy transition is a really important one. And you have to look at the geographic region and the ability of that region to be actually be able to do electrolysis to produce hydrogen. Yes, there's plenty of sunshine. There's all kinds of deserts around the world and more coming. But where is the water for the electrolysis? And quite frankly, clean hydrogen, which now Europe has gone to say, okay, blue hydrogen is okay. Carbon capture is a natural. You know, in the province that you and I come from, last year, a year ago next month in December, three weeks of average temperature of minus 23 degrees centigrade. Three weeks. We have a grid with a capacity of 18 gigawatts. Peak load for the electricity was 15 gigawatts. The equivalent for home heating was 50 gigawatts of electricity that we use natural gas for. Now, trying to replace that without using that very fuel to create a new generation of energy by carbon capture and producing hydrogen is foolhardy. It is, it is an ab in abundance, and the reason that we would use it is because we have all the infrastructure available to use it. It isn't a full capital stock turnover. In Australia, you have to build desalination plants in order to get enough water to, to produce the hydrogen. But I think, quite frankly, um, and you need base load electricity in order to offset the intermittency of sun and, so, and wind. One question I had for the general, though, is how is he going to, how is he going to, or all of you, in your maneuvers, in what you have to do and propel your ships, what fuel are you going to use in the future when the Russians and the Chinese target the grid? Are you, is there a refueling station for you that is uh, uh, going to power your tanks with electricity? What, I think we all have to come together to figure this out. And which countries have what access to what energy is a key question. Mm -hmm. uh, Sir Michael, final I just thought. want to finish on an optimistic note. I mean, I think you, you can write a story. <laughs> We're all I think, seriously, I think you can write a story that the history of humankind is based around a competition for energy. Uh, and I tell my grandchildren, I've got lots of them, that I think in their lifetime, for the first time in human history, we'll have unlimited energy at marginal cost. Now, the technology, you lot yes. will help sort it out, 
but I think it's coming. And that transforms geopolitics apart from anything else. And you desalinate in Australia and away you go. But anyway, that's my optimism. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a great beginning to what I think is one of the most important conversations that we can be having right now. And um, thank you to Peter uh, and the forum for putting this on. And uh, I hope we'll come back next year and check in on, on progress and, and hopefully with um, happier news at that time. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 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 yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General. It was great. Thank you. You're fantastic. Thank you. So, without the break, yeah, now? Yeah, so I have to stay here and I'm going to introduce him. I was born in Gdansk. In this short transition, Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to please take your seats as we have a special interview lined up for you right now. Can I ask you to? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special Halifax chat today with Andrei Yermak. He is the head of the office of the president of Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Yermak has served as the de facto chief of staff to President Zelensky since February. Distinguished participants of the forum, ladies and gentlemen, it is snow and chilly in Kiev today, a great weather to play hockey in the yard. In childhood, we often did, especially in the evening after lesson and homework, in the light of street lamps, but now, we are not many children in Kiev yards. And they don't play hockey. You can hardly see the neck in the dark. Elsewhere, it could be even worse. Hot meals and considered luxury in some places. Due to regular Russian attack on our power grid, we have to save electricity more and more. Yes, you already know that on November 15 alone, we Russian fired almost 100 cruise, cruise missiles. Our armed force successfully intercepted most of them, but not at all. And now our life rhythm is set by blackout shadow. We will endure, I'm sure of this, our military people are certain of this. Our society is defined, defined of this. We must win, but it's not self only that we are defending. Europe is behind us. Russian aggression against Ukraine is the largest armed conflict in Europe since World War II. And without a doubt, it's the biggest security threat to the humanity since the beginning of the 21st century. The main red line in the world today is the line of the Russian-Ukrainian front. 3.7 thousand kilometers long line of fire, blood, sweat and death. If you have a hard time imagine, imagining, I will say, we use Mexico border is shorter by 640 kilometers. Now you see the scale 
of the threats. Millions of peaceful Ukrainians, thousands of settlements are under constant Russian attacks. Day by day, total war is the Kremlin strategy. Any target is legitimate and harm, and harm is uh, advisable. Any death is acceptable. This barbarism is measured and carefully calculated. Russian troops can't win, we fight against our army. Sometimes they just uh, flee better fields, but instead we Kremlin indiscriminately terrorize the civilian people, the elderly women and children. They hit civilian objects, houses, hospitals, schools. They are determined to destroy our power grids. The calculation is simple, a humanitarian catastrophe. Moscow always considers frost and darkness as its allies. It always uses the deprivation of the basic life needs as a war tool. It always despises humanitarian law. Russia is a terrorist state. There is not a war for the territory. It's a value conflict between democracy-based European civilization and remains of the Frankenstein monster mix of the Russian Empire and the Soviet totalitarian ideology. A value conflict is always existential. For Russia, it's about the destruction of Ukrainian nation. It's about genocide. For us, it's a fight for survival. Ukrainian's resistance is a guarantee that Russian aggression will not spread to the other European countries. Our success should guarantee that our nation will not be subjected to aggression. Our sacrifices must not be in vain. We are very grateful to our American, Canadian, European partners and our alliance around the world for their constant and invaluable support. Dear friends, in today's world, the best security guarantees is the Article 5 of the NATO Washington Treaty. So Ukraine's inspiration to join the alliance remain unchanged. In the course of this war, we fighting capacity of the Ukrainian army increased significantly. And as a President Volodymyr Zelensky noted, Ukraine has already proven compatibility with alien standards. We are real for us on the battlefield and the all aspects of our interactions. Ukraine is making a huge contribution to the security of the Euro-Atlantic uh, Euro region. Our state is effectively repealing the biggest threat to the peace and stability of the Euro-Atlantic region. And we'll go on. I believe that Ukrainians' membership in NATO will significantly strengthen the alliance. Many thanks to our partners, including Canadians, who think likewise and support us. But we understand that it will be take time sometimes to reach an enormous consent from the all 30 member states. So for the transition period, we need consolidated efforts to create effective security guarantees for Ukraine to prevent the repetition of the aggressions like this in the future. The Kyiv Security Compact concept we developed together with the NATO Ex-Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen could bring us solutions. It should be joint documents on the strategic partnership that united Ukraine and the guarantor states. The principles is very simple. Ukraine's security relies preliminary on its ability to defend itself. To do this effectively, Ukraine needs long-term contribution 
from its aliens. Security guarantees, not insurance, but guarantees must come from the core group of Ukrainians, aliens with significant military capabilities. They should be prepared to give both political and legally binding commitments. Uh, alongside the commitments of the military support, a broader group of international partners should back a set of non-military guarantees based on the sanctions. We must ensure that the cost of the aggression is too high for Russia to bear. Helping Ukraine defend, survive and prevail is the investments in the safe future for the wild world. Dear colleagues, as Russian attacks on Ukrainian cities and critical infrastructure are going to continue, Ukraine desperately needs an effective missile defense system very quick before onset of the winter. Effective protection of our sky is an important security guarantee component. What's why Ukraine together with its close islands started the development of the joint declaration of the Ukrainian sky shield. We aim to build complex multi-level system of the anti-aircraft and anti-missiles defense. It will be contribute to the inter-European air security. Dear friends, tomorrow the Russian full-scale war against Ukraine will enter its 270 day. The 270 day of fighting for the future. However, it became obvious months ago. The Kremlin plans failed. Russia will not win this war. We're sure about it. But this is not enough. Ukraine need to prevail. Tyranny must fall. Large-scale acts of the state terrorism must be never happen again after the war ends. Dozens of countries should be constantly uh, endangered. Russian neo-fascism must be finally fade into oblivion. The light must return to our cities. Finally, too. I believe it will be that a way. Together, we can achieve the goal. Thanks again to your countries for their significant historical support. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yermak, for that um, great summary of where Ukraine sees its long-term security guarantees and what you're looking for. For a moment, I'd like to come back to the short term. Um, Ukraine's deputy defense minister in the last 24 hours told Sky News that he expects Ukraine will be in Crimea by December and the war will be over in the spring. What is your assessment? <laughs> um, you know, you uh, looking to this phrase of the deputy of the Ministry of Defense, uh, it uh, looks like a dream. And of course, the million of Ukrainians uh, dream that this war is ended as soon as possible. But I will be more realistic. I think that uh, this week we have significant victory for the liberated uh, Kherson. We have some success in the Kharkiv uh, uh, directions, but this war is continuing. I'm not ready to, uh, to give you the answer exactly date, exactly hours when it's happened. But I'm sure that it's happened. Uh, now, uh, you know, it's, uh, I will be very honest with you. 
you know how it started and uh, many uh, people in the world gave to us three days one week one month already nine months and today i'm sure that the mostly people in the world now sure about our victory uh, believe that all ukrainian nations together with our partners with our friends and once again i'd like to say thank you very much for everybody in the world who support us and help and we do our best every day every minute every hours 24 hours seven days to do uh, everything that our victory our very important our joint victory with our partners will come as soon as possible mm -hmm. thank you thank you um, president zelensky told this forum just yesterday that russia is looking for a short truce to regain its strength has Moscow made any direct appeals to your government? Um, you know, the President Zelensky in his speech in uh, uh, G20 summit, uh, first of all, uh, he noted that Ukrainian positions it's uh, to talk very transparently, openly, that because we have the price of the worlds uh, from Kremlin, from Russia. And now we are absolutely not interested in, in any negotiations and any talking, uh, which will be not public and not officials. Uh, concretely uh, answer to your questions. Not, we have not any official uh, application from the Russian side about some conversations, some negotiations. But the Ukrainian position is very clear. First of all, we, for us, it's uh, not acceptable any conversation which not based in the international law, which not based of the uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and full territorial integrity in the limits of the international recognized border and our independence. It means that the first steps it's necessary to do from the Russian side is withdraw all Russian troops from Ukrainian territory. Is that It can be a significant signal about a real political will to end this war. But once again, President Zelensky noted and proposed to the world uh, 10 points of our war, uh, way to the peace, real peace, not some manipulation, but real peace. I hope that uh, I know that a lot of world leaders supported this plan and now we are working very closely with our partners uh, for re realization of this plan mm -hmm. but of course it's a lot of depends on the political will of russia we understand the 10 points of the required for the peace plan what are the conditions that would be required for you to sit down at the table to discuss that plan with Russia? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very uh, logically, if, if you attentively can see to this plan of 10 points, uh, it's absolutely understandable in, w in which moment will be uh, possible to start to talk about real ending of the war and to back the peace on our lands. Uh, but before it, it's necessary to do a lot of things. What is very important? Uh, all these points, 100% based 
of the norms of international law and chatter of United Nations. I can't see any arguments for the, uh, for the countries, for the countries in the world who just not supported, maybe now occupied neutral position. But uh, I, I will be very surprised if the countries who is, uh, respect the international law, respect the territorial integrity, sovereignty of the countries, chatter or United Nations will be against these points because it's absolutely logical based. It's not our just wishes. It's uh, absolutely corresponded for the uh, norms and the rights which countries so many uh, years ago uh, when it was adopted chapter of United Nations agree to keep this system. I think uh, it's, it's a very important. It's not just important to Ukraine because for us, of course, we want to end this war. We want that our people stop killing every day, stop killing uh, by the Russian aggressors uh, our children, stop torture our people who is uh, in the, uh, you can imagine, we now once again have in the Central Europe, we have concentrated camp. Of course, we'd like to stop it, but from another side, it's a very important to the world because this war, it's show that the system of security, it's not so strong, or I can say more strongly, it's not exist. It's necessary to back because it's security for all people in the world. And you can see what happened in many areas. It, this is it's, uh, as, as well includes to our plan. I mean, food security, I mean, nuclear security, I mean, ecology and many others. This war, it showed uh, that we need to work hardly together, all adequate people, all the people who is looking to the future of our world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to invite uh, our audience, if they have a question, to please um, raise your hand. We have a few minutes left. We have a question down here. And please identify yourself. Vitaly Andriu, this is Paul Grod. I'm the uh, president of the Ukrainian World Congress. Great to see you, and thank you for joining us, uh, Andriy. Uh, really enjoyed your remarks, and uh, hats off to you and President Zelensky and the entire team for your leadership on the global stage. Uh, you've really been the talk of, uh, of this conference, and uh, everybody is very uh, motivated by you and, and President Zelensky. My question is just to focus more a little bit around sanctions, because uh, you and Ambassador McFaul uh, chair a, uh, an international sanctions group and recently re uh, released a roadmap uh, last month on uh, renewed sanctions policy. And uh, obviously, the Russia, Russia is able to continue to fuel their war based on their economic position. How does the world continue to ratchet up sanctions? What are some of the, the key initiatives that you'd like to share with this forum and, and asks you'd like from uh, your allies to enhance sanctions opportunities? Thank you. Slav Ukraini. Thank you, Pavlo. Happy to see you. Thank you for your warm words. And uh, thank you for your, these questions. Yes, of course, uh, because this war is continue, it means that it's not enough, uh, the sanctions which it's already issued. Of course, our group, the Michael McFall, it's continued to work. We already have the uh, ninth documents uh, uh, of our group, which concentrated in the different area uh, of the sanctions. We are not stopping. We are growing our group and new people, new experts added uh, uh, practically every week. I think and I'm sure that it's uh, very important to not stop 
the uh, issue of the new sanctions. Of course, uh, now the, each new package of the sanctions after this nine months of the war, of this invasion, of course, uh, each new package, it's more serious, it's more strong, because now already we have the experience, we exactly understand which sanction is really working, because honestly, in the beginning, a lot of sanctions have the very good names, title, but not work, have the, some difficulties. But uh, I'm absolutely sure and uh, I'm happy that our partners support our positions and we are listening and waiting for the new package of the sanctions from the United States, from the European Union, from the Canada, from the Great Britain. And once again, it's uh, thank you very much because, you know, it's still the uh, military Russian machines have big money uh, to support this invasion, to support this missiles attack, to support us to uh, increase terror against uh, civilians. Uh, this war will be continued. It's necessary to make a big problems for the Russian economy, for the people who make these crime decisions. I think it's a very, very important. Thank you. Um, Jane Harmon. Jane Harmon, former member of Congress, Freedom House. Last week, or maybe it was this long week, uh, a, uh, an Iranian, uh, uh, Ukrainian missile landed in Poland by accident. I know President Zelensky says he has his doubts, but the international community concluded it was an accident. Uh, what do you think you need to do to prevent this from happening again, and or do you think the Russians could try to manipulate this whole situation? Uh, to increase the risks uh, to your country. Thank you very much. I'd like, and thank you for these important questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say and uh, repeat the words of uh, uh, President Zelensky. It will be not right to say that it's in Ukrainian rockets or Russian rockets before ending of the real investigation. I can inform that Ukraine, and my president said it's in, in the beginning, absolutely open to make the clear, and then this is a very important, to know the truth. And now our mission uh, going and uh, now in the place in Poland, and we are working very closely with the Polish friends the, uh, to really investigate what really happened. I think it's critically important for everybody. And my, I think it will be absolutely logical and right to not make uh, some comments because, you know, it's really necessary to wait of the results of the investigation in which Ukraine have to participate. And now we can say that we are started uh, participated in this only after it's possible to say and to make the real conclusion. Before, I think all these comments work just on the um, for, for one side, to Russian Federation. I think that today we have historical uh, united of all democracy countries around Ukraine. And this is a very important. We are together. We will be together after the, before we win, really win this war. And of course, we're very happy that today the level of the cooperation between our military, between our intelligence, in historically high level. I hope 
that this investigation will be open, transparent, and we very soon will know real uh, truth and real verdict of the, of the commission which uh, now created. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yermak. We are so grateful and honored that you made time to spend time with us today. And our thoughts and our hearts are with you as we spend this weekend thinking of ways that the world can come together and end this aggression. So we thank you so much for your being here today. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for your support. Thank you for this big attention to the, our country. Uh, and I'm absolutely sure that very soon we can celebrate it, our joint victory. Slava Ukraini!
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Take your seats, please. The program begins now. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Mark Lippert, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Halifax Forum. My charge here today is to be as brief as possible and introduce the man that everyone wants to hear, the 28th Secretary of Defense of the United States, Lloyd Austin. Frankly, Minister Anand did a terrific job of warmly introducing the Secretary last night at dinner. Couldn't have been better. This lightens the load here today, so let me just quickly walk through a bit more of his impressive background to set context. I had the privilege of meeting then General Austin for the first time in 2008 as part of a bipartisan CODEL to Iraq led by Senators Jack Reed, Chuck Hagel, and Barack Obama. Also included a staffer named Tony Blinken who helped carry the bags. Um, I can safely say we were all extremely impressed by General Austin, who was then in charge of multinational core Iraq, especially his expert knowledge of the issues and environment, focus on the needs of U.S. and coalition service members, and his intense yet humble nature. I was late, late, later able to interact with him in my capacity as Secretary Hagel's chief of staff when General Austin was serving as the 12th commander of CENTCOM. Here, too, his knowledge was sharp, his commitment to the mission deep and abiding, and he commanded the respect of the men and women of the Department of Defense in and out of uniform and from different and diverse backgrounds. So it comes as no surprise when President Biden selected and the Senate overwhelmingly confirmed Lloyd Austin to become the 28th Secretary of Defense, the first African American to hold this position. His path-breaking bio is remarkable. Hailing from Mobile, Alabama, and growing up in Georgia, Secretary Austin is a West Point graduate, later earning a master's degree from Auburn. A few of his highlights of his 41-year career in the Army include the Silver Star for his leadership of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division during the invasion of Iraq in 2003, service as Commanding General of United States Forces Iraq, overseeing all combat operations in the country. Time as director, time as the director rather of the Joint Staff, one of the most underrated, toughest, and important jobs in the Pentagon. A tour of the Army Vice Chief as Army Vice Chief of Staff, and of course, Commander CENTCOM, responsible for all military operations in the Middle East and Afghanistan. After retiring from the Army in 2016, gained valuable experience in the private sector and the defense industry. Critically important issue set, as Admiral Braun noted yesterday. In his current position as SecDef, the United States and its friends, partners, allies around the world face an extremely dynamic international security environment we, that we are grappling with this weekend here at Halifax, especially Ukraine, and we're all looking forward to the Secretary's comments on this critical issue, but also China, terrorism, technology, to name just a few. We at the Halifax International Security Forum are honored. We're delighted, we're fortunate to hear from the 28th Secretary of Defense, Mr. Austin. The floor is yours, thank you. Well, Mark, thanks for that very generous introduction. It's great to be here with all of you. And it's always great to visit our outstanding Canadian allies. 
Although, I have to admit, I'm glad this conference isn't held in February. <laughs> Americans and Canadians share a deep commitment to freedom, to human rights, and human dignity. So we're here in Halifax, not just because of our common interests. We're here because of our shared values. Now, the city of Halifax is an extraordinary natural harbor. And this conference has always provided a wonderful harbor of its own for fellow democracies to come together and to work through the great security challenges of the day. And as partners in that work, I'm especially pleased that we're joined by an outstanding bipartisan delegation from the United States Congress. It's also great to see so many friends and colleagues, including my counterparts and, and friends from our allied and partner countries. And I'm especially moved that we're joined today by several leaders of the embattled nation of Ukraine, including the Deputy Prime Minister. Let's give them a hand. And let's also give it up for my friend and Canadian counterpart, Anita Anand. <laughs> uh, Minister Anand is always thoughtful and clear-eyed and dynamic. And Anita, I'm delighted to be here in Nova Scotia, the province where you were born and raised. Now, it's great to be in Canada for my first visit as Secretary of Defense. Canada has long been an extraordinary ally to the United States. Canadian troops are standing strong today with our NATO allies in Latvia. Canadians flew with us to save innocent lives in Kosovo and fought by our sides in Afghanistan after 9-11. And the world has witnessed the valor of Canada's troops again and again, from Vimy Ridge to Juneau Beach and from Korea to Kuwait. And you know, I saw their courage firsthand during my own time in uniform when brave Canadian forces joined the coalition to fight the terror of ISIS. And so you're more than allies. You are more than friends. You're family. Now, let me just say a word or two about the rest of my week. Later today, my team and I are flying on from here to visit our valued strategic partners in Indonesia, which is the world's third largest democracy and a strong advocate for the rules-based international order. And then I'm headed to Cambodia, where I'll discuss the region's most pressing security challenges with our allies and partners at the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. And this will be my fifth visit to the Indo-Pacific as Secretary of Defense, and my third visit to Southeast Asia. And that's because the Indo-Pacific is key to an open, secure, and prosperous world. And the U.S. Defense Department's pacing challenge is an increase, increasingly assertive China. A China that's trying to refashion both the region and the international system to suit its authoritarian preferences. And so keeping the international system open and secure is at the heart of everything that we do. But today, that stable system that open system is under threat. And not just from the generational challenge of the People's Republic of China, but from a tragic, devastating war in the heart of Europe. And that's what I'd like to discuss today. Now, we start from a position of moral clarity. Ladies and gentlemen, Russia chose war. Russia chose aggression, but Ukraine chose to fight back. 
And Ukraine chose to defend itself. And the world came together to help. President Biden has rallied nations of goodwill, as he put it, to stand against the global politics of fear and coercion. And ever since Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, countries from around the world have rallied behind some clear first principles. And those first pr principles are that countries don't get to invade their peaceful neighbors. Autocrats don't get to redraw borders by force. And the imperial, imperial ambition of bullies doesn't outweigh the sovereign rights of UN member states. That's something that all countries around the world agree on. From Finland to Japan, from Morocco to New Zealand. The outcome of the war in Ukraine will help determine the course of global security in this young century. And those of us in North America don't have the option of sitting this one out. Stability and prosperity on both sides of the Atlantic are at stake. You know, the U.S. trading relationship with the European Union is the largest in the world. So when an aggressor manufactures a huge security crisis in Europe, it hits home for everyday Americans and Canadians. When President Franklin Roosevelt visited Canada in 1938, he gave a speech at Queen's University, where Minister Anand would later study and teach law. But FDR said, quote, we in the Americas are no longer a faraway continent, one whose security can stand isolated from conflicts across the seas. And the tragic and troubling explosion in Poland this week reminded the whole world of the recklessness of Putin's war of choice. So today I'd like to talk about four reasons why Ukraine matters to all of us. First, Putin's war of choice is a direct threat to European security. Second, Russian aggression is a clear challenge to our NATO allies. Third, Russia's deliberate cruelty is an attack on our shared values and on the rules of law. And finally, Russia's invasion tears at the rules-based international order that keeps us all secure. So our support for Ukraine's self-defense is an investment in our own security and prosperity as well. But first, let's be clear. Putin's invasion has caused the worst crisis in American security since the end of the Second World War. You know, Putin tried to conquer the largest country in Europe outside of his own and a member of the UN Security Council tried to deny democracy to more than 43 million people. So that's why our recently released national defense strategy calls out Russia as an acute threat. And Russia's neighbors in Europe have watched its aggression with rising alarm. They fully understand that February 24th changed the world. And they are grappling with the instability and the destruction and the human misery, the flood of refugees, and the other dangers that an even more reckless and aggressive Russia present. Yet we've seen an incredible response from our friends in Europe as well as others all around the globe. Allies and partners have raced to bolster Ukraine's air defenses they pushed hard to train Ukrainian troops on new defensive systems. They provided thousands of UAV systems, more than 3,000 anti-tank systems, and vast, vast amounts of ammunition. And they've rushed to invest in their own industrial production, 
to meet their security needs, even while giving Ukraine the capabilities to, de to defend itself in the hard months and years ahead. Now that brings me to my second reason why Ukraine matters. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has posed an historic challenge to our NATO allies, including Canada. We've updated our posture to ensure that NATO's defense and deterrence are ready for the dangers ahead. In the words of my good friend and colleague, Secretary General Stoltenberg, NATO's purpose is, quote, to prevent war and preserve peace. And NATO has done this for 70 years. And the foundation of this great defensive alliance is Article 5 of the NATO of the North Atlantic Treaty. Article 5 declares that an armed attack against one or more allies shall be considered an attack against them all. That's our commitment, and it is ironclad. As the National Defense Strategy says, we'll continue to focus on deterring Russian attacks on our NATO allies and reinforcing our treaty commitments, and we'll work with our outstanding allies to increase interoperability and to share intelligence and to improve our resilience against attack and coercion. And so since February, we've moved swiftly and surely to reinforce our NATO allies. NATO has strengthened its forward defenses and enhanced its, its forces on its eastern flank. And since February, we've deployed or extended more than 20,000 additional U.S. forces to Europe, bringing our current total to more than 100,000 American service members across Europe. In Poland, we have permanently forward stationed the 5th Corps Headquarters Forward Command Post, an Army, Gar Army Garrison Headquarters, and a Field Support Battalion. Now, those are the first permanent U.S. forces on NATO's eastern flank. And we're looking forward to welcoming Finland and Sweden, which, as you know, are two highly capable democracies to NATO's uh, ranks. And ladies and gentlemen, NATO is a defensive alliance. It does not seek confrontation with Russia. It poses no threat to Russia. Make no mistake, we will not be dragged into Putin's war of choice. But we will stand by Ukraine as it, it fights to defend itself. And we will defend every inch of NATO territory, and we will continue to strengthen NATO's collective defense and deterrence. Through two world wars and the Cold War, we've learned that our security requires defending not just our side of the Atlantic, but also a larger transatlantic community of freedom. And as Russia has looked to others for help, it has actually caused new security concerns for allies and partners beyond NATO. Russia has turned to Iran and North Korea to help its assault on Ukraine, including using Iranian drones to kill Ukrainian citizens. And Iran is gaining important battlefield experience. And this kind of irresponsible behavior from Iran and the DPRK is a serious concern for our allies and partners in the Middle East and in the Indo-Pacific. Now that brings me to my third reason why Ukraine matters. You see, there are still rules in war. And if a big power can flaunt those rules, it encourages others to defy international law and international norms. So we are determined to defend those rules, and especially the bedrock principle of non-combatant immunity. Because the more that it's eroded, the more dangerous our world becomes. You see, Russia isn't just waging a, waging a war of aggression. It's also deliberately attacking civilian targets and civilian infrastructure with no military purpose whatsoever. Now, these aren't just lapses. 
these aren't exceptions to the rules. These are atrocities. And Russian military barrages have left innocent Ukrainians without heat and water and electricity. And we've seen schools attacked. We've seen children killed, hospitals bombed, and centers of Ukrainian history and culture reduced to rubble. And Russia has killed thousands of civilians in Ukraine, according to the UN. And more than 7 million Ukrainian refugees have fled to other countries. And all this comes after disturbingly radical statements from Russia's leaders. You know, days before his invasion, Putin declared that, quote, modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia. Now, that's an alarming preview of Putin's vision. A vision in which, of a world in which autocrats decide which countries are real and which countries can be snuffed out. And as President Biden said at the UN General Assembly, quote, this war is about extinguishing Ukraine's right to exist as a state, plain and simple. And then he added, whoever you are, wherever you live, Whatever you believe in, that should make your blood run, run cold. And it has. And that's why so many nations of goodwill have stepped up to fight for Ukraine's right to defend itself. And that's why the world rejected Russia's bogus referenda, its claims to annex sovereign Ukrainian territory, and its hollow assertions that Ukraine is somehow a part of Russia. And that's why 141 countries, let me say that again, 141 countries in the UN General Assembly stood together to condemn Russia's lawless, choice of, uh, lawless war of choice. Now, the ripples of Russia's invasion have traveled far, far beyond Europe. And Putin's war has underscored the challenge that we face in the Indo-Pacific, where the PRC is also pushing for something very far from our vision of a free and stable and open international system. Beijing, like Moscow, seeks a world where might makes right where disputes are resolved by force and where autocrats can stamp out the flame of freedom. As President Biden said this week after his meeting with President Xi, there need not be a Cold War. But we remain clear-eyed about the China, China challenge. The PRC's military activities in the Taiwan Strait are growing increasingly provocative, with PLA aircraft flying near Taiwan in record numbers on a near daily basis. And we've seen a sharp increase in the number of dangerous PLA intercepts of U.S. and allied forces, including Canadian aircraft, that were operating lawfully in international airspace over the South and East China Seas. Now, these troubling trends highlight the imperative of working with our unparalleled network of allies and partners, both across both the Atlantic and the Pacific to deter aggression. So we are drawing on the lessons from Ukraine to further bolster the self-defense capabilities of our Indo-Pacific partners. And we'll he we're helping them to become more agile and resilient, and we're working towards an open and secure future that advances our shared interests and our shared values. Now, the shorthand for that type of open and decent and stable world is the rules-based international order. Now, I know that phrase doesn't necessarily get everyone's pulse racing, <laughs> but the rules-based international order isn't some P 
piece of abstract political science jargon. It is one of the towering achievements of human government. It's the structure of international institutions, alliances, laws, and norms built at staggering cost by the Allies, including and especially the United States in the awful aftermath of World War II. The World War II Allies came together, in Winston Churchill's words, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. The price of stopping Nazi Germany and the Axis was almost unimaginable. More than 400,000 American service members and more than 44,000 Canadians alone died in that war. And tens of millions of civilians around the world were lost to war and genocide. But the Allies prevailed, including the mighty contribution of the Soviet military, which suffered a shattering cost of an estimated 8 million dead or more. And the Allies came together to build a better world out of the devastation. And as it happens, the vision of that world was, was first painted here in Canada. In 1941, Churchill crossed the Atlantic to meet President Roosevelt in Newfoundland. And the principles that FDR and Churchill laid out in the Atlantic Charter still ring true today. That charter condemns aggression. It rejects territorial changes against the free, against the free will of, of the people's concern. And it respects the right of all peoples, big and small, to choose their own governments. Now, those principles still help ground the rules-based international order. It is an order where small states have the same rights as large ones, where prosperity is shared by all peoples and not hoarded by empires or, or autocrats, where nuclear weapons are responsibly controlled and not used to threaten the world, where disputes are resolved by negotiations and not bloodsheds. It's a world where sovereignty is respected and not trampled where civilians are protected and not targeted, in a world where borders are honored and not redrawn by force. The price of, re of establishing the post-World War II order was far too high to just walk away from. We have security obligations that we cannot walk away from. Our U.S. leadership helped to build the rules-based international order, and U.S. leadership is vital to sustain it. And the people of the world don't want to go back to endure a grim new era of upheaval and chaos and war. And Russia's invasion offers a preview of a possible world of tyranny and turmoil, turmoil that none of us want to live in. And it's an invitation to an increasingly insecure world haunted by the shadow of nuclear proliferation. Because Putin's fellow autocrats are watching. And they could well conclude that getting nuclear weapons would give them a, a hunting license of their own. And that could drive a dangerous spiral of, on, of nuclear proliferation. Putin's war of choice shows the whole world the dangers of disorder. That's the security challenge that we face. It is urgent and is, it is historic. But we're going to meet it. Ladies and gentlemen, the basic principles of democracy are under siege around the world. But we meet here among friends who share our democratic values. That at home, that means that we cherish free and fair elections and the rule of law. 
in a free, independent, and vigorous press, and the right to worship, the freedom to say what you, you think, to believe in what's in your heart, to rally for the causes that stir your soul. And abroad, it means that we rededicate ourselves to the proposition that free government, free minds, and free peoples will always be stronger than the autocrats who believe that their grip on power is all that matters. And so the world has seen something extraordinary over these tragic months of unnecessary war. You see, Russia thought that it could easily conquer Ukraine, but the Ukrainians are defending themselves magnificently. Russia thought that the West would splinter, but our allies and partners stand united and firm. Russia thought that democracy was a spent force, but free people everywhere have rallied behind Ukraine's right to self-defense. Now we know that hard times may lie ahead as Ukraine faces a harsh winter. And as Russia's position on a battlefield erodes, Putin may resort again to profoundly irresponsible nuclear saber rattling. But we will meet these challenges together. And we will continue to draw inspiration from the Ukrainian people. You know, just days ago, a father in Kyiv waited calmly to fill up a container of water for his wife and her newborn baby. His family was living without heat during rolling blackouts. And he said that however bad the winter might be, it was better than giving in to tyranny. Now that's the spirit of Ukraine. That's the spirit that won the Battle of Kyiv that retook Snake Island and freed Kherson and Kharkiv. And it shows the moral power of a free people fighting to defend their lives, their country, and their un unalienable rights. You know, Russia, the Russians have a massive military and impressive weapons. But it hasn't helped them prevail in a campaign of conquest and cruelty. And the reason is simple. You see, war isn't just about the weapons. It's about the cause, and it's about those who fight for it. And as President Biden has said, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. For free people refuse to live in a world of hopeless, hopelessness and darkness. And the Canadian parliament heard a similar message from another American president back in May of, 19, of 1961 when John F. Kennedy made his first foreign trip of his presidency. Our alliance, he declared, is born not of fear, but of hope. And ladies and gentlemen, we are the guardians of that alliance born of hope. And I believe that our support for the forces of freedom in Ukraine will hold fast in any season or any storm. And free people always refuse to replace an open order of rules and rights with one dictated by force and fear. And that's why Ukraine matter. Because rules matter. Sovereignty matters. And freedom matters. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we make this short transition.
Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Halifax Security Forum. My name is Evan Solomon. I am now the publisher of G Zero Media, which is a subsidiary company of the Eurasia Group. I'm also on the senior management committee there, and I'm a special correspondent now with CTV, which is very recent. Uh, I am delighted to be here for uh, this conversation on the disinformation nation, kidnapping our citizens, corrupting our officials, and stealing our stuff, which is about as colloquial as you can get for some very serious issues. We have a remarkable panel for the next hour. We will take questions, uh, and I hope it's a lively debate. I think the senator said, avoid being turgid, and he used the word turgis turgidity. I made that up. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> and that could be our first form of new information. Uh, let me introduce our panel, uh, and then uh, we'll get into, I think, a fascinating matter. I will start with Senator Chris Coons, the senator from Delaware, who serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee and chairs uh, the Ethics Committee on Senate. Uh, he's also on the Judiciary Committee on Privacy, Technology, and Law. He's, he's very involved in this, so it's a pleasure to welcome uh, the senator here. I want to then introduce uh, Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya. You will know uh, Svetlana very well as the leader, uh, national leader of Belarus, widely seen probably by everyone in this room, as the winner of the elections in Belarus uh, against um, Lukashenko. Uh, she had to leave the country. Her husband has been imprisoned and brutally tortured there. Uh, she's a two-time Nobel Prize uh, nominee. And uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here uh, in the country and, and uh, here. I want to also introduce uh, Ms. Yasmin Green. She's the CEO of Jigsaw. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure most of you know Jigsaw is a division within in Google that addresses threats to open societies. They publish lots of uh, remarkable work, and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing, to hearing what Yasmin has to say. I, I also then want to introduce you to uh, Yevhen Fedchenko, who's the editor in chief of Stop Fake Ukraine. They are combating uh, disinformation. If you think you're busy, you're not compared to what Yvonne has to handle. The amount of disinformation is, is a, a deadly tsunami. And then, of course, uh, I, I am delighted as well um, to uh, introduce Andrew Shearer, the Director General of the Office of National Intelligence in Australia, and of course, uh, facing multiple threats, much like the Canadian context, whether it's from China or other national governments or other uh, malevolent forces. So a pleasure to have you here. Um, we're going to do quick opening statements, and then we'll get a series of questions, and then, uh, of course, we'll get to the questions. Um, but given the situation, Svetlana, I want to start with you. Um, obviously, the situation in Belarus, uh, people are deeply concerned not only about how uh, Putin is trying to potentially open up another front there, but talk about the... Uh, disinformation and, and the repression that Lukashenko um, and how he's doing that inside um, Belarus and how, what kind of information are citizens getting? How are they combating that? Uh, so first of all, I have to say that Lukashenko's uh, regime is uh, built on lie. Uh, for many, many years using uh, state TV, state newspapers, uh, they uh, like, wanted to assure persons that they are living in a wonderful country, like island of stability, that uh, uh, Western countries are rotten, that, uh, uh, but persons uh, are living in, in uh, with wonderful life. But when uh, new opportunities with the help of internet, with the uh, opportunity to travel, uh, visas were uh, opened for persons, young generation uh, get opportunity to visit our countries to see how in reality other people live. They uh, you know, started ask questions to themselves, first of all. Do we really live in a wonderful country? Our relationship with the uh, Russian Federation are so profitable for uh, Belarus. And uh, uh, Lukashenko couldn't stop uh, this development of the situation. And uh, uh, all this burst into a uh, huge uprising in 2020 after front elections. And what Lukashenko did at that moment, he just blocked internet for a couple of days. For people didn't have opportunity to communicate, uh, to coordinate their actions. And the only uh, like opportunity for them to communicate at that moment was TikTok. So people tried to use every possible uh, you know, opportunity you know, to communicate. Uh, but uh, then when 
uh, people's uh, uprising was going on and Lukashenko understood that it's not just uh, usual uprising that took place in previous years, um, he started to um, block uh, alternative media in our country. And he declared all the media as extremists and uh, like forbade people to read uh, to watch YouTube, you know, to, to uh, read alternative media, and uh, media had to flee Belarus. They relocated the uh, media in exile and uh, started to work from there. So now Lukashenko, uh, when you are uh, in Belarus, and for example, when you are kidnapped and KGB people see that you are sub subscribed to one channel, you know, to Telegram, uh, to alternative media, you, it's like real way to prison. You will be detained for many, many years just for uh, comment, for tweet, for like in, uh, uh, in uh, any, um, uh, any platforms. So, but people uh, are studying, they know how to, to circumvent the restrictions. We are using VPNs, you know, people have to delete the history of the searches and so on, but it's a huge stress for people. But um, through, uh, you know, propaganda uh, means are still in Belarus, they using TV, newspapers, you know, to uh, send like wrong messages to people. So uh, now, for example, when uh, Belarus was dragged into this war, when Lukashenko became accomplice to Putin in uh, the war against Ukraine, um, Lukashenko, to justify his actions, he says that Ukrainians are our enemies, Ukrainians want to bomb us, uh, that Tikhanovskaya and all the democratic movement is uh, uh, follow uh, Nazism, uh, Nazi values and so on. Uh, and our task now is to counter this propaganda. It's very important, it's like sometimes for us it seems that uh, uh, Informational war is even more important than uh, war on the ground. Because we don't need uh, HIMARS, for example, as uh, Ukrainians do, and we fully support these demands, requests, uh, all the attention has to be paid to Ukraine now. But we need more assistance in informational space. Okay, and we'll get to that. Uh, just when you say the shutdown on the internet in Belarus, I think the stat is since 2016, according to Access Now, about 225 uh, uh, occurrences of repressive regimes, whether it's Iran, Cuba, Congo, who have shut down the internet in order to repress their regime. So it's a very, they're learned, the repressive regimes are learning from each other, from Belarus, from Lukashenko. Uh, let me go to uh, opening statements. I know, uh, Senator, but good to have you here. I mean, in some sense, there's both what we're looking at in Belarus, Ukraine, uh, but also disinformation is a domestic issue. Uh, your country's just gone through the midterm elections, which was different than 2020. Uh, just a, on a big picture, how um, powerful a threat is the disinformation threat and, how, and, and some of the legislative tools that may be used to deal with it? Well, thanks, Evan, and um, thank you, Svetlana, both for your courage, your leadership, and your comments. It's a reminder that there are differently configured disinformation threats. Um, the citizens of countries like Iran or North Korea, Belarus or Russia have great difficulty accessing reliable independent information and the regimes there maintain their control over their populations by shutting off access to the rest of the world. We fund and support and many in the private sector have helped develop cutting edge tools to ensure access to reliable information for those who are living under regimes that disconnect them from the rest of the world. There's also huge challenges in open societies. There have been intentional efforts to interfere through disinformation and misinformation in Canada, in Australia, in the United States, in our recent elections. Obviously, it's had a significant impact uh, on our response to COVID um, and our own um, domestic democratic communications. Uh, I would argue one of our great challenges legislatively in the United States Congress is both understanding and coming to grips with the impact of social media on our body politic, uh, on our sense of ourselves, on our ability to focus. As a parent of three uh, college age, roughly, uh, kids, I'm, I'm struck at how differently uh, my wife and I consume social media, how our kids consume social media, how much time it takes and how it distracts. Um, and I think there are platforms, and I'll call out TikTok right off top, um, that are malevolent, um, that are both um, siphoning off huge amounts of data, being used as a tool of state power, um, and significantly distracting. But getting my kids to stop looking at TikTok every day, every minute, is enormously challenging. It's engaging. 
I would even say addictive. Um, I've got one legislative proposal around this, the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, a bipartisan bill that would, um, with protections, subject social media algorithms to academic study and to analysis so we know whether or not Instagram really is demonstrably harmful to young people, so that we know whether or not state actors are able to use some of these tools to accelerate, to, to accelerate uh, radicalization or to shape our political space. Um, but I'll remind you this is a problem in some ways as old as humanity. The opening clip about Pinocchio is a reminder that truth lies, it's an old challenge. It's attributed to Mark Twain, but there's a quote that says that a lie runs halfway around the world before truth laces up its shoes. We need to invest in journalism, in free media. We need to take some of the lid off of the incredible concentration of power in social media platforms. Jigsaw has been doing some really interesting, innovative work in this space. But I think Congress in the United States has not yet done the work um, that the EU has in its digital services law that other democracies have. The United States needs to show leadership on digital privacy, on protecting the rights of individuals to know and own what companies are taking from them. Um, and we need to better resource our work in countering disinformation. Putin is increasing his investment in their platforms, RT and Sputnik and others. The Chinese are increasing their investment in their platforms. We're not doing a particularly great job of it in the United States. I don't really ever expect the State Department, that model of crisp, concise, edgy, funny communication, to be at the cutting edge of our engagement in the world. But our culture is one of our greatest sources of soft power. And if the United States better partnered between the private sector and the public sector, we could be more successful at countering disinformation. The State Department took that as a compliment, by the way. Just so you know. Uh, I suspect I'll get a five-page memo yeah. in my inbox three weeks from now <laughs> expressing, <laughs> expressing calm discontent. Uh, but uh, but it's you did mention uh, the EU Digital Services Act, and um, governments in Canada and the United States all over the world are struggling with legislative tools on this, uh, but um, the big tech companies themselves Yasmin, are, are very much involved. I know in, Jigsaw has done an enormous amount of work looking at disinformation, conspiracy theories, various other reports. Uh, I, again, we'll, we'll dig into this deeper as our session goes a little deeper on uh, how tech companies are responding outside of the legislative framework or in cooperation with it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I might just add a little bit of color to the to the the depth of the challenge around misinformation. There's definitely disinformation intentionally spread, you know, false or misleading information. There's a, it's the, 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 the peddlers of it or the creators of it very upstream. You might say the platforms that facilitate it, that's also supply side. But there's a demand side challenge that's really, um, really thorny. And one of the things that we do uh, on, in our group at Jigsaw is we do a lot of ethnographic research. So that just means that we spend a lot of time with the same human being over time, understanding how their whole life is playing out and then the role of technology within that. Um, and we have a kind of ongoing panel of people who are um, conspiracy minded and consume a lot of disinformation. Uh, and what we're seeing is that there is now this intersectionality of conspiracy belief, of um, disinformation purchase that intersects health misinformation that intersects election denial in uh, in the US uh, that uh, that spans you know 5g is a is a threat and there is a whole industry around mobilizing these people in you know there are conferences like the great reawakening like they tour America and they convene people religious leaders discredited medical professionals political pundits and they're selling merch t-shirts banners metal coins to protect you from 5G, medical cures. I mean, this, this is like, there is, um, there is something that um, has taken a hold of us. Uh, and I remember when we, we did our first um, study of, on conspiracy theorists, I said, like, I'm, I'm really interested in having some people who believe in um, health misinfo, some people who believe like false flags, you know, like the Sandy Hook shooting didn't happen, some people who believe in the great replacement, which is um, a really motivating conspiracy theory for violent white supremacists, that there's a secret cabal that's plotting to dilute the, the white race and take over. Anyway, so we, 
so I kind of gave the mandate, and then we got 100 people together. There wasn't a single person who only believed in one conspiracy theory. Because right. <laughs> once you have that world view, uh, you know, that there's a secret cabal, there's a hidden agenda, there's a cover story, you know, and the, the proxies and affiliates, then you're really primed to accept a lot of narratives. Um, in, in the case of the, the uh, midterms, because we were tracking this, this panel, I got to say, election deniers really felt the efficacy of effective moderation. Not to say that it's flawless, but um, they were really frustrated. You know, their posts about the election being stolen or about election irregularities were being taken down. And they were so frustrated with the major platforms that they had to go elsewhere. And I think that's something that we must increasingly consider is the platforms that are private. So, you know, Telegram or private messaging apps the platforms that are hyper-partisan, because those guys don't even, and in the US, the, the ones that are popular are Parler and Rumble, and they don't even have misinformation policies. I mean, the major platforms, you might criticize them for not enforcing them you know, perfectly or consistently. Those guys, their, their marketing shtick is that they don't have any policies against misinformation. Um, and of course, the ones that are, that are you know, authoritarian owned. Uh, so I think this challenge is getting uh, more complex, not less. Okay, so, so we'll get back to that, but let, let's go to Yevhen. Uh, you're on the front lines at Stop Fake. Um, give us a sense of the kind of uh, disinformation and the level of sophistication that, that, that the Russian disinformation before February and then as it evolves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, I would like to start with the beginning of our panel when the uh, light went off. I uh, immediately imagine that the situation in which my colleagues are now working in Ukraine, without light, without internet, but they still continue doing their fact-checking because they understand the important role fact-checking is playing in this war and in defending Ukraine and Ukrainians at this point. And uh, we've been looking at this problem for the last eight years. We created the project back in 2014, immediately when the war started, because our feeling was that's the future of the war. And in order to understand the future of the war, we need to understand the informational component of it and to, to analyze it. So we've been working on it on a daily basis since 2014, looking into the, this black depths of Russian disinformation. As you might imagine, it's not, it's not the most pleasant place you want to be. Uh, but someone needs to, to do that. And my team was doing that work on a daily basis, as I said, and we collected the huge data set which explained how we were approaching to the February 24th. So it did not occur uh, unexpectedly. We've been noticing the, the, the increasing amount of disinformation. We've seen the increasing volume of this disinformation. And we analyzed the main narratives which Russia were pushing, uh, which were to justify this incursion against Ukraine. So basically, we are doing what Russians were blaming us we are doing. So they are, called, they are calling Stop Fake private intelligence company uh, just because we take information from open sources. Uh, and that's exactly what we've been doing. We were taking all information or disinformation Russia was pushing, taking it from open sources, analyzing it, and making conclusions on what going, what's going to happen next on the kinetic side of the war, because in uh, our case, everything which Russia was putting on disinformation side was absolutely tightly connected to what was happening on the front line. So we were absolutely capable to predict the beginning of this incursion up to the weeks. And we knew exactly what narratives Russia would be using to justify it. And it was exactly what, what happened. So they were saying that Ukraine is a uh, Nazi state, Ukraine is non existent state, Ukraine is not a real state, and that's why it should be just, uh, uh, should not exist anymore. And when the volume again went up, we realized that this is it, we, we are at the very beginning of this war. So my team continued this work without any stop, and we just continued doing what we've been doing on, on February 25th as well. And we, again, uh, looking at this data set we collected, we could also look at the, how these narratives change. And that was also very important, because, again, it explained what Russia is going to do next uh, militarily, politically, 
diplomatically. And for example, if at the beginning, as I said, they were preparing justification for this war, then they realized nobody believes it anymore. So they came to the next stage. They started to sow doubts in Ukraine, like Ukraine is selling weapons which are supplied by allies. Ukraine is a corrupt state. That's why you should not give any money to Ukraine. And others, so they're in a business of sowing doubts. And uh, as you might imagine, there is always uh, an audience for that. And uh, now they are going to the next stage and trying to put all the blame for this war on Ukraine, blaming Ukraine in food crisis, energy crisis, uh, any other things which are happening now in the world. And these narratives are heard very strongly in many places throughout the world. So my point is that you cannot fight disinformation in one place. You cannot solve this problem in Ukraine only, or you cannot solve this problem in Russia only. You, you should approach it internationally. You should see this as part of the war efforts. It's not just misinformation or just another kind of truth as they want to pretend, but this is a part of the war efforts which Russia was building for years. And the biggest problem is that this infrastructure they built is still intact. It did not disappear anywhere. They are using the same uh, platforms. They are using the same networks, influencers. And it would take quite a lot of time to stop this machine. Uh, and uh, we can do that only, again, if we would do that uh, internationally, uh, holistically. Uh, working with uh, actors in different parts of the world, including social media platforms. Okay. Um, gosh, we've got so many things to dig into. So hang in there. We're going to mix it up a bit. We'll get some questions, but uh, let me go to Andrew. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to kind of pivot a little from particularly the Russia-Ukraine, although I'm sure you'll pivot back to it. But the other issue, uh, part of our disinformation nation is about corrupting officials, stealing our stuff, kidnapping our citizens, and... Uh, I, I want to turn to China here, obviously. Um, um, the two Michael situation was an international situation. I know uh, Vina Najwula, who led the uh, part of the campaign to um, free her husband and, and the other Michaels here. So we're very, this is very close. Obviously, in the U.S., the Brittany Griner situation uh, is, is a big deal. Uh, here, there's allegations of election interference in the last Canadian election. Um, uh, there was just recently an arrest uh, in, uh, about uh, a Chinese official uh, in Hydro-Quebec. To talk about how in Australia, whether it's cyber attacks, whether it's meddling with elections, and whether it's the theft of intellectual property, um, um, how, how much of a threat has that become and, is, and, and where is that heading? Well, thanks, Evan. And the short answer is um, these issues are very <coughs> prominent in Australia. We've had a couple of very large corporate hacks just over the last few weeks. They've been reported around the world. That's really, um, that's really shone a spotlight on this. And I would say the, the issues that we were talking about around Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine have also brought a lot of these issues right to the fore in, in Australia. But... Um, you know, as, a, as an intelligence professional, I guess I'd say we, sh we shouldn't be too surprised. You know, these, these techniques have been around as long as there's been statecraft. Um, you know, the Cold War, um, Soviet active measures, political warfare, um, the, the, the labelling sometimes shifts, but the thinking behind it, the sort of the deep desire to reach into our societies, to shape our narratives, to... Um, uh, to steal our secrets, to, to uh, sow seeds of uh, domestic discontent and so forth is a very long story. And, um, you know, when I think about our response to that, I think, you know, we look at, we look at what we're up against and it's incredibly daunting. But um, perhaps because I'm historically minded, I, I take some comfort from the, the challenges we've overcome in the past. And, you know, we, we did rise during the Cold War to that challenge to that contest that was thrown at us, that systemic challenge, uh, and um, agencies like mine with our Five Eyes and other partners did extraordinary work all around the world in response um, during, the, um, during the ISIL explosion. You know, we, again, we responded effectively. We developed and adapted our toolkit. We, we, um, we formed new partnerships outside government, across government, a much bigger span of governments. 
and we we overcame and then um, it, it was touched on but I I can't really be here and not not give a shout out especially to my American counterparts Vril Haynes and the entire US intelligence community and the and the master class that they put on leading up to and following the the Russian invasion where uh, intelligence has completely reshaped the international narrative and gave the West the strategic initiative in an incredibly powerful way against a guy who made his whole life about um, these techniques that we're, we're talking about here. So, you know, there, there are some successes there, I think, that lead us to, uh, to where the answers are. I guess what's changed, um, technology, bots, troll farms, etc. obvious point, but with its speed and scale, and that's something that, you know, I think we're all grappling with. And when I think about what's the intelligence component of this, you know, this is about truth and, and responding to these, these different tactics. Um, how do we, how do we uh, provide our traditional function in a way, which is strategic warning, it's actionable insights into intelligence, um, uh, collecting information that, that enables us to verify what's going on and, and making sense of it, assessing it. None of that's changed, but we have to do it in this incredibly dynamic, um, uh, ultra-fast, massive, high volume, information volume world. And I think that's a real challenge. Um, does, it, does it come with a strategic decoupling from places like China? I mean, your economy, so how do you do that? And how do you give strategic advice on integrated economies like that? And so that information becomes practically um, relevant when you're trying to do uh, business. Data will be at the heart of this. And, you know, I'm personally proud of the role that um, that the Five Eyes played in helping to um, uh, warn of some of the perils of, um, of 5G technologies, for example. I think that's, that's a good example of, of where we need to go. But it also leads you to um, new partnerships. You know, back in that Cold War model that I was talking about, that was essentially a government-led contest. Um, we can't win this contest just with government. We need to partner with the platforms, with civil society in completely different ways. Uh, from an intelligence point, point of view, we need the, the technology and the trade craft to do uh, open source collection at a massive scale. Uh, and we also need to be exploring things like artificial intelligence that can help us get behind deep fakes and so forth. Again, um, going to the senators, excellent point, you know, not three weeks after all the actions happened and, and the initiative's already been lost. Senator, maybe just pick up on that uh, because the Economic uh, and Security Review Committee, I know in the States, said China as a cyber power is playing by different rules. They're a serious threat to our government. I know there's been concerns here in, our, in Canada that we don't have tough enough rules on that to protect against criminal theft and intellectual property. Just on that, the sort of on the, under the stealing our stuff, I think in the US there's been something like 400 and, 20 or something people arrested under the Criminal Trade Secrets Act, but that's not a lot since like 96. Uh, do, you, do you need tougher laws against uh, the, the, that kind of uh, attack by countries like China? Yes, and it's funny you should mention that. that. That was literally my first major piece of legislation, was taking the antiquated and under-resourced um, trade secret law and strengthening it. Senator Orrin Hatch and I got that to President Obama's desk. Um, and making it possible for there to be private rights of action for companies that know that their core trade secrets have been stolen to be able to initiate action and not have to wait for a U.S. attorney to validate it. Um, there were many more pressing national security and public safety crises that were taking a higher priority than defending inventions through trade secrets. So um, we need to continue to strengthen intellectual property protections in the United States and to work with our allies um, in that direction. Um, look, one of the greatest transfers of wealth by theft in human history has been an intentional strategy of state-sponsored theft of intellectual property um, from the West by the PRC. Um, some who know history would suggest the Americans actually um, did that during the colonial era and in our early development stages of uh, industry. Um, it may have been practiced before, but it's never been perfected at this scale. Um, and digitally and at the speed and with the national security consequences it has. We need to be more agile, more clear-eyed, 
and more engaged on protecting our inventions and innovation. We've got about 23 minutes left. We've got nine minutes to questions, so I'm going to uh, mix it up if you want. We can. Uh, uh, I don't want to fall into the pool of turgidity, uh, which is now my new favorite word. Um, Svetlana, I, I want to go to you. Uh, we're, we're talking a bit about disinformation, but it's real. I know your husband remains in prison. Uh, we all think about that. It's very personal. Um, there's 1,350 political prisoners in Belarus, probably more journalists. Um, talk about what you think, how tech companies, and uh, Yasmin, you follow up, um, and, and governments can help um, combat that kind of repression, through whether it's through disinformation or literally shutting down internet, arresting journalists. What, what does someone like you need and to, to, to see? You know, as for governments, we are asking to have like a two-sided approach towards Belarus, you know, to um, create multiple points of pressure on the regime, political pressure, economical pressure, you know, to deprive regime of resources, you know, to break corruption schemes, uh, and on the other side, to give energy to people to uh, resist. Because we uh, people are really getting exhausted uh, because we are fighting with the huge uh, propagandistic and pro-regime machine. And uh, so uh, help our people, help our human rights defending centers uh, to provide lawyers to political prisoners, help our media uh, increase, uh, increase uh, assistance to our activists, especially those who are on the ground. As for uh, huge tech companies, as Google, Meta, Twitter, I don't know, whatever, uh, they can play a crucial role in such uh, dictatorial regimes as uh, in our country. Because uh, you can uh, defend uh, journalists and activists from uh, KGB. You can delete uh, the content of uh, uh, of regime uh, media, you know, when I, I'll just give you an example. When, for example, I uh, appeal to people with some message, you know, communicating to people in, in very front of uh, each YouTube video, uh, KGB people put, uh, like, with the help of advertising, put um, a video of uh, uh, confessional video where a person uh, who have been kidnapped, detained, uh, he confessed the crimes he never committed. It is made to threat people, you know, to scare them. Look, you, everybody will be detained, you know, who will support the pro-democratic movement and so on. Uh, so you can help us to restore our content that is deleted by KGB. Again, when a person is kidnapped, the first thing KGB is doing, they check their mobiles or, uh, or computers and uh, uh, delete or Telegram channels they created or YouTube channels they created. And we need uh, your, company, your companies you know, to help us restore, restore this um, media. As recently, one very uh, famous Belarusian band uh, was kidnapped. Uh, they are detained at the moment, and all the music that was inspiring thousands of people during our protests were, uh, was deleted from YouTube. They deleted our history, and now we are trying to, to restore this uh, content. It's uh, very, uh, assistance of uh, Google is very important. Uh, what's more, um, you know, we are struggling now for our national identity. Uh, for many, many years, you know, uh, Lukashenko erased everything Belarusians, uh, everything Belarusian uh, from Belarus. Now, Belarusian books are forbidden. You can be detained if you are speaking Belarusian question. And nation is about identity. Nation is about uh, understanding that you are uh, have your culture, you have your language. But many, uh, many. Uh, uh, Belarusian language is not supported by many uh, Google um, uh, uh, services. Yeah. And people have to switch to Russian language. So we are asking, we are working on this, you know, to put Belarusian language among others. Like, for example, um, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, our European languages, they, they're rather small uh, countries, rather small nations, but they have their languages right. uh, in Google. We don't have, so we ask, you know, to continue work on this. What is important? And now it'll be short. You know, it's very important to uh, create uh, a special group of people, five, ten, I don't know, that will be working on Belarusian issue. 
they will not work at hoc, you know, but uh, constantly, like um, like uh, uh, constant uh, work on, on Belarusian content and Belarusian problems, and it will help us a lot. Uh, I know you asked me you want to pick up on it, but just interesting, we're talking a lot about the disinformation campaigns in Belarus and in uh, uh, Ukraine and, and, and all over the world. But one of the, on the flip side, um, there's a question of what the people in Belarus, the people in Russia are getting. Uh, recently, a, a U.S. official said to me, we're, I'm really disappointed that we can't seem to penetrate inside the Russian mindset. They just believe everything Putin says, like his censorship uh, is working. And, and I said, well, you know, it's hard to penetrate in the U.S. You know, you've got, as you've tracked, in a free media, you've got 35 percent of people believing in conspiracy theories anyway or more. So it's difficult in any kind of information environment right now. How, what's your sense of the kinds of information citizens in Belarus or Russia or China or Cuba, or some repressive regimes, may be getting? And, and what's the role in tech in those places? Yeah, that actually reminds me of a, um, uh, something someone said to us, we speak to a lot of people who have left repressive regimes, and we, we had the opportunity to interview like a dozen people who had defected from North Korea. So they'd left via South Korea or China. And um, when this one woman was telling me about her fears as after she had left and, and crossed the border, she said, we didn't just believe that uh, this, the, the leader was um, omnipotent, that he was all powerful. Um, we believe that he was omniscient and that that he would know what I was thinking. So when she left, she had the burden of thinking that uh, she was either in danger or she was going to be um, somehow exposed because of her, her thoughts. That's that, you know. So I mean, we have the opposite problem in the US, which is that you know, there's too much critical thinking. You know, like the people on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the mantra of the conspiracy theorists is do your own research. Don't trust the person who has the credentials or the expertise or studied it at university or mm -hmm. doctor. You should do your own research into this climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, it's very different, very different dynamics. Um, so, I mean, to, to, your, to your question, Evan, the, the, the challenge for us in places like uh, Russia and Belarus and Iran is exactly what Senator Kuhn said, which is give them access to the outside web. Of course, if you are only exposed to, uh, you know, um, if you have, if there's a monopoly of information and you're only exposed to one type of propaganda over time, you will internalize it. Mm. Uh, so that's the job, and we we do some work on, uh, in my group to offer um, VPNs that um, uh, President uh, Chikinyava, uh, sorry, <laughs> Chikinskaya uh, uh, mentioned, which is you know allow people to tunnel outside of the national firewalls, um, and no, no country has yet fully perfected the idea of a. a uh, a national firewall. They generally do it based on uh, blacklisting websites that they don't allow to come in. So the way that these VPNs, these virtual private networks, operate is that they uh, they are inoffensive looking. Like there'll be a server, uh, like uh, you know, uh, just you know, I don't know, McDonald's.com server, and uh, the, the traffic will be sent there. And then once you get outside of the country, it can send you to social media platforms or other places to get other information. The challenge is that if they become very popular, then they become anomalous to the, the sensors, and they, they see them and they want to take them down. So the strategy that, that we have at Jigsaw is the democratization of VPNs. Allow many people to set up VPNs, civil society uh, and others, and then it's decentralized and it's less uh, obvious where they're showing up. I'm seeing some nodding heads, which is reassuring. Um, and, uh, um, and then if there, there might be innovation in the way that they're customized, which would also help with building resilience to, to censorship. The challenge, I think, with the, with the attribute of the internet that it, it's allowed disinformation nations to affect yeah. uh, audiences overseas, um, and then I think there's a, um, you know, listening to Yevon talk about uh, being able to anticipate everything that happened. Um, that aspect of disinformation, the, uh, the recurring tropes feels so damning. It's so demoralizing that you can see it coming and it comes and then it, you know, and then yeah, it has purchase. Um, but, but really, I think that aspect of the predictability of disinformation can, can be its undoing. Um, and, and I know the U.S. government has some really impressive examples that maybe Senator Coons can talk about in terms of how pre-bunking, this idea of preceding the bunk, 
can be an incredibly powerful way of, of getting on the front foot, you know, moving from defense to offense when it comes to disinformation. And we've, uh, we've done some work also uh, working with civil society at Jigsaw in terms of trying to anticipate, for example, these, you know, millions of Ukrainians who've hopefully temporarily displaced people who've left uh, the country are in na these frontline nations, and uh, it's not going to take long for uh, the, the pot stirring of the Kremlin to really turn those nations against them if there is no expansion infrastructure and support. Uh, I know we've got to get to questions. There's a lot of them. This is like a room of, um, in the bunker of pre-bunkers here. Uh, okay, you got, uh, they're hoping to pre -bunkers. Yeah, you, sir. And again, uh, just, be, we, we're so limited on time, and some of the panelists have had one intervention. I'd love to get more of them. But go ahead, sir, if you get to yes. your question. <clears throat> That's all the time you've got. You didn't get the mic okay. down. You're done. Sorry. <laughs> hey, go ahead. Sorry, Mauricio Meshulam from the Mexico Research Center for Peace. I, I just wanted to connect what you're saying to the other side of the coin, which is trust. Uh, if you take a look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, mm -hmm. the mistrust in, in government and mistrust in media is huge around the world. We have conducted studies on that in Mexico as well. So how do you build trust, which would be like the structure of, the, of this issue? So I'll go back to the point Desmond just made and then uh, get to you if I can on this, about pre-bunking. Provide something that is true and useful. So things that are untrue, that are disinformation, uh, often are sort of sticky. What the Russians are particularly good at is identifying and exploiting existing um, disconnects, um, places where our society is fractured. They're not just airdropping in and spreading completely wild theories. They've got a germ of truth to them. The American intelligence community um, did not cover itself in glory in the run-up to the Iraq war. What was critical in the weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine was that first privately and then publicly, we shared not small amounts, but lots of credible, real-time intelligence information that our allies and, frankly, the rest of the world got to review. And then events proved that we were telling the truth. That's critical. First, second, uh, I was looking at some of the data on uh, Russian-funded disinformation in the Spanish language. RT has more Spanish language followers than CNN in Espanol. And um, we need to do a much better job at localization. I don't mean hire armies of US public diplomacy funded content creators. I mean helping fund the ecosystem of independent journalists and those who create valuable, timely, useful local content that also helps to push back against these disinformation narratives. If we give people usable, meaningful information in their language, in their context, that is helpful to their lives, much as we did in the intelligence context with the Ukraine war, with Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, if we're doing that in local languages by credible local providers, we can help reanimate trust between the consumers of information and sources of information. We've got a lot of questions. So what I'm going to do is change up. I'm going to do uh, two questions in a row, and then we'll uh, sort of uh, I know uh, you had a question there, uh, and then I know Andrei Shevchenko had one. Oh, oh, okay, hold on. Let me, there's a quick, just a sec, Justin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have the mic. Okay, real quick. <laughs> Stop trying to censor me, Solomon. Uh, just really quickly, um, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, Russia importing disinformation into North America and Europe, um, but we also export disinformation that gets weaponized by Moscow. I mean, the bio labs thing. I mean, uh, Tucker Carlson was being used by Russian state TV night after night. Um, so what do we do to disrupt um, those sort of, um, you know, uh, testing grounds for disinformation here? These are places, websites, Rumble, Gab, that don't want to be regulated. Uh, they don't want real journalism. They don't want to have their information pre-bunked. Uh, what do we do with them? And why are we so allergic to talking about de-radicalization in this context? OK, that's a great question. So we'll, we'll get to that. And, and someone maybe on the intelligence side. Andrei Shevchenko, you've got, uh, and I think there's another mic. Some, who's got the other mic? You, uh, OK, let me do Andre, and then we'll do two questions, and then uh, we'll answer and then get some more. So if we look at those classic four Ds of uh, disinformation, which uh, dismiss, uh, distort, uh, distract, and dismay, we don't see much of new stuff this year. It's mostly old tricks. 
Uh, and Russia does not impress with what it does domestically. I think they are on defensive in terms of propaganda there. But it amazes how they keep being successful in uh, dealing with the free world tools. When we see how uh, Kremlin narratives travel all the way from Sputnik to the public statements of elected officials, when we see major med media running headlines like 96% of Kherson voted in a referendum to join Russia and so on. So my question is about what Yasmin just was talking about, about anticipating. We've, we see the world actually uh, going into economic slowdown. We'll see more inflation, we'll see more domestic troubles. And it's a matter of time when there'll be temptation for politicians in the free world to use this domestically, saying we've got to cut support for Ukraine and let's use that money domestically, just like we saw in the midterms. What can we do to be one step ahead of Russia, which is going to use that narrative in that context? Okay, so let me take the first question, maybe Andrew, and then do you want to take the second question? Okay, go ahead, Andrew. With On the domestic uh, disinformation and disrupting. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get too much into the domestic because I'm not sure whose lane it is, but it's not mine. Um, but I, I will say this, you know, the intelligence role in this um, can be really important for getting back the strategic initiative, which I think is the power of the Ukraine example, and, and for getting ahead of it. And, and frankly, once that happened, because of the, the breadth and the depth and the robustness of that intelligence base, it was like a shutout, right? He, he, couldn't, he, he never has got the strategic initiative back in that contest. Uh, to my mind, that, that's the value intelligence can add, but, and there is a but, that's off the back of decades of intelligence work against the former Soviet Union and Russia um, by the United States, the United Kingdom, the other Five Eyes. Uh, it's off the back of uh, established, and going back to the trust word, um, networks for getting that intelligence out to your partners and allies. And we need to think hard about how do we learn the lessons and transfer them to other areas and other actors. Does anyone want to just take a quick uh, Justin's question about uh, disinformation here disrupting anyone uh, before we get to this question two? Uh, okay, so, um, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent point as well. Um, I know you wanted to get uh, to the, the second question that Andre uh, raised. How do you sort of pre-bunk the Russian propaganda attempt to use inflation to decouple support from Ukraine? Yeah, probably I would even try to combine answering both questions with the same answer, if possible. So, uh, my childhood went in Soviet Union, and we had three TV channels, two of which were showing the same content. So you 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 might want to switch between there, you know, but you would get the same the same content over there. But what was there? There was an appetite to get another type of information or real information, not the propaganda Soviet television was feeding to you. And now I think the whole system flipped and we see the opposite picture. We do not see the appetite for truth in the audiences. They have plenty of information around, but they never want to go beyond some patterns they already developed. They don't want uh, to go beyond the bubble they, they created or someone created around them and they don't want to look outside because, for example, what we fact checkers are doing can be done by ordinary people mostly. It's, sometimes it's very easy. You just go to Google, you ask the right question, you know, and you immediately get the answer. So the distance between disinformation and truth is just one click but nobody wants to take that, 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 that far away you know, uh, step. And that explains why disinformation is actually uh, winning uh, globally, uh, because uh, people don't want to take this uh, small step because they are very comfortable in what they already have. And they uh, also uh, don't want to, to, to look beyond that. Uh, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, uh, unwillingness to accept the destructive role of disinformation because stop fake and many other uh, fact checkers around the world were talking about this danger for eight years at least. And uh, nobody was paying attention to this danger, saying this, that's all about freedom of speech. 
And uh, finally, everybody realized that it's not about freedom of speech because this information is ruining freedom of speech, is occupying the space, which is usually occupied by real journalism, real information. And when incursion started, sometimes it was too late already to uh, get in into the game. And I'm grateful to social media platforms like uh, Jigsaw, who contacted us immediately and said, what we can do for you to help improve the situation, or Meta, who've been working with us for two years. Uh, but some platforms, uh, as Yasmin said, were just unregulated field where you don't have any rules mm -hmm. and you don't have any a way to, to enforce uh, those rules like Telegram, which is uh, considered globally as a neutral platform, despite of the fact that it's a Russian organized, Russian run, uh, where Russian is harvesting all the data from uh, users and other things. So uh, that's another problem. And finally, um, yes, I totally agree with uh, uh, Andre that Russia would be trying to weaponize those doubts again uh, because for the same reason, as I said, the whole infrastructure they created is still intact, especially if we would go to the global south. There is a huge audience over there to what Russia is producing. And for example, now we have stop fake in Spanish to reach out to South America. We have stop fake in French to reach out to African countries. And there is a huge uh, uh, evidence how proactive Russia is over there with physical presence on the ground, with uh, social media content, with local influencers, with local educational institutions working over there. That's how they are winning. And if we would, might say that, yes, we are winning information war, uh, for example, in uh, European countries, United States, Canada, and when I'm saying we, I'm not meaning only Ukraine, because we are fighting for, for, for the same truth, you know. But uh, in the rest of the world, uh, the situation is not that kind of uh, clear cut. And uh, the, the, the trust to everything Russia produced is still very high. Because if you would compare in Ukraine, nobody already trusts whatever which is connected to, to Russia. So it, it's coming from Russian uh, media or Russian government or Russian influencers. They don't have any impact anymore. But if you would go beyond Ukraine and you would go to other places, and for example, what Twitter did, they uh, limited the presence of Russian propagandistic uh, media. Uh, but only in the countries where they are uh, sanctioned in the EU, or United States, Canada, Australia, but in the rest of the world, they are fully available, they work in a food force, and again, they produce a lot of content in local languages. That's how they try to use to local audiences by domesticating uh, propaganda and localizing uh, their messages, trying to find uh, differences in societies, and just making those cracks bigger. That's how they've been working for years, and they continue doing that. We literally have a minute left, and I, I know we have many, many questions. And it's a sign that the disinformation issue, um, the um, rogue regime issue on anything from intellectual property is resonant. And uh, I'm going to leave the last 30 seconds to Svetlana. And, and, just, uh, be, and, uh, and if you have questions, I'm sure the panelists will be happy to answer them after. Um, because the, the, we're all watching the war in Ukraine, uh, tragically, but um, long before that started, long after, the disinformation war is continuing and it's affecting any country here and it sows the field, sadly, for uh, conflicts in the future. Um, just because you're on the front lines of this uh, in your country, uh, is there one message that you have here as, uh, from the outside, um, you are fighting essentially a disinformation war right now about your own country to have fair elections. Is there one last thing in the last 45 seconds we've got here that you could say to this group that you would need to, to, to penetrate back into your country some kind of pr uh, legitimate process where elections like the one you ran in may function? I know that was long. She told me to speak slower <laughs> last. One last word to the audience about what you think that you know. <laughs> She said, Evan, speak more slowly when you're asking me a question. And I you have a difficult accent. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for this opportunity you know, to speak in front of you, because I see that uh, 
uh, Belarus is a, a little bit overlooked uh, behind the war in Ukraine. Again, we are fully uh, supporting Ukrainians in uh, this dreadful f war uh, with Russia. And I, but I have to remind you that uh, Belarusian regime, Lukashenko's regime, is also a participant in this war. And don't overlook his participation in uh, the war. And when you, in information in media, uh, mention the war, always put. Putin or Russia and Belarusian regime, not Belarus. We don't want our country to be percepted as collaborant or co-aggressor. Just distinguish between the uh, Belarusian regime and Belarusian people, because 86% of Belarusians are against participation of Belarus in this war, and we are supporting Ukrainians as much as we can. But uh, you know, uh, people in Belarus are a little bit offended when they see Russia and Belarus are aggressors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and that, that's relevant from a military point of view as well, if they tried to open up. All right, I want to thank this panel, um, all of you. That was fantastic. We had, obviously, more than we could get to. Uh, please give them a hand, and thank you very much. This concludes the morning program. Please join us for lunch and discussion in the Atlantic Ballroom just down the hallway. Guides will direct you. Thank you.
Two minute warning. Uh, if I could get you guys to line up on the two mics if you're asking. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Jean Shaheen. I am a senator from the state of New Hampshire and am co-leading this delegation to the Halifax International Security Forum with Senator Jim Risch from Idaho. Um, if you were there last night at the dinner, you heard me say that we get to do this because we have the shortest shared border with Canada in our states. That's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't print that it is, as... It is to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but we're delighted to be here, and I want to thank all of the organizers of the... Peter Van Prague and the organizers of the Halifax International Security Forum for hosting us. And also point out that when we were here last year, we were still experiencing the fallout from COVID. I think people were masked at that time. Um, it's very nice as someone who comes from a state that borders Canada to have the border fully open, to have people and goods going back across that border in a way that is very important to the economies of both of our countries. Um, this is the biggest bipartisan, bicameral delegation to the Halifax Security Forum that I have participated in in my years here. We have six senators. Let me introduce them. They are. I said Senator Risch, we also have Senator Gillibrand from New York, Senator Coons from Delaware, Senator Rounds from North Dakota, and well, Senator, Dakota. I'm sorry, South Dakota. Pheasants, think pheasants. Fe pheasants, that's right. I do know they're different. Um, and Senator Rosen from Nevada. We also have from the House, um, Senator Congressman McCall from Texas, uh, Congressman Crow from Colorado, and Congresswoman Jacobs from California. So as you can see, this is a very bipartisan delegation that represents the full span of the United States. And I think it's important for us to be here and to be here with representation from the administration because this is an opportunity for us to engage with the international community. And this year, given the war in Ukraine, that is even more important, um, particularly as we think about the challenge of continuing to support Ukraine. I was very pleased that President Zelensky uh, spoke virtually to the forum, and his message was one that was shared by the Canadian Minister of Defense, Ms. Adnan, as well as Secretary of Defense for the United States, Austin. And that was the critical importance of standing up for democracy, of working with our allies to ensure that the support is there 
to win this war in Ukraine and to hold Vladimir Putin accountable for his unprovoked brutal aggression. So we will try and be short so we have a chance to answer some of your questions. And now I'd like to turn over the podium to Senator Risch. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gene. Look, uh, a lot has happened in the last year. As we uh, came here last year and, and talked to you, uh, there were three issues. They were China, China, and China. And, uh, of course, that uh, has changed dramatically. Our view has been uh, uh, diverted to, to uh, Europe. And uh, with the ongoing war in Europe, uh, the world faces a real challenge. I'm, I'm assuming all of you uh, heard... Uh, the Secretary of Defense this morning, uh, Lloyd Austin, uh, speak about this matter. It wasn't as much a speech, uh, really, as it was an essay. And uh, it was really, really well done. He not only talked about what the policy of the United States was, but more importantly, he talked about why that policy was uh, or is what it is. And uh, it, it was a fairly lengthy speech, but uh, I, it held people's attention for that uh, whole period of time. But to boil it down very simply, what's going on in Ukraine is really going to dictate how the world operates in the rest of this century. Uh, the United Nations was put together for very specific purposes. One of those was uh, to contain countries in the borders that they had and state very clearly that simply at the whim of another country, they couldn't take a piece or all of uh, a country adjacent or, or otherwise. Uh, that is the purpose of this. How this ends is going to uh, dictate how autocrats look at what their ability to do is as we go forward in the 21st century. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, I think this this uh, conference has been essential. Um, I've had two major takeaways. One, I think what uh, Secretary Austin laid out as the reason why America should care what's happening in Ukraine, that we care deeply about our shared values of democracy and freedom. We care deeply about the strength of NATO uh, as an alliance. We care deeply about the EU and the stability of Europe. Um, these are important shared values that we have to continue to hold dear and we have to protect. The second takeaway, uh, we heard from a lot of speakers uh, who are leading revolutions in their country, um, whether it's the opposition leader from Belarus or uh, opposition in Iran, we are seeing the rise of leaders and voices that we have not seen before. And this is the struggle that uh, I think is a shared one, that democracy must prevail and that um, we have to uh, help and support those who are fighting for it. Thanks. I'm Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. When I first came to the Halifax conference, it was as part of a delegation led by Senator John McCain, and I was uh, glad to see um, that we both, as you've heard, um, heard an address uh, from uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, but also that the John McCain uh, Public Service Leadership Award was given to the women of Ukraine and um, presented uh, by Jack McCain. Um, this is a great opportunity for us as a bipartisan and bicameral delegation um, to participate in panels, uh, to meet with leaders uh, of our partners and allies, uh, and to talk about our shared priorities, and for us with one voice to express our support for robust and sustained contributions to the Ukrainian war effort. Uh, President Biden has just sent to Congress uh, a significant supplemental funding request. Um, I think if you ask us, every single member of this delegation intends to support it. That's certainly been our public statements. Um, my view, we should increase it. We should add to the humanitarian investment. As of today, there are roughly 10 million Ukrainians struggling with the loss of power, water, heat as winter is beginning. I think the best thing we can do to contribute to victory in Ukraine is to make it clear that we intend to continue to support Ukraine's fight against Russia's brutal invasion. Thank you. Next up, Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon. Um, I think we're all here for one reason in particular, and, and that is to show our, bi our, our bipartisan support for the continued support for our Ukrainian friends. Um, a victory for Ukraine is truly a victory for the entire free world. Thank you. And now, out of Nevada and Las Vegas, Senator Jackie Rosen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, first off, I want to thank Senators Shaheen and Rish for leading us here today, for coming here every time and having this uh, conversation. It's extremely important. And as everyone has stated, my colleagues and I are committed to standing with the Ukrainian people, and we are resolute in making sure that we provide Ukraine with the resources it needs to defend itself. We also want to commit ourselves to the transatlantic unity that we must have against Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. But we're also here to talk about other things. So I'm going to bring up one additional thing that we haven't talked about yet, uh, attaining our technological superiority, specifically through cybersecurity. So we're also here today to talk about ensuring that the United States and our allied partners are resilient on threats, technological threats, and cybersecurity threats. These attacks, they post imminent threats to every business, government, our critical infrastructure, our energy grid, our water systems, we must take this seriously. Digital space knows no physical borders sometimes. And we've seen Russia and other bad actors launch these cyber attacks. So in addition to standing with Ukraine, we need to think about our digital world and how we can continue to keep that safe. Thank you. And next, we have from the great state of Texas, Congressman Michael McCall. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senators uh, Shaheen and Rich, for uh, inviting me. It's an honor to be part of the delegation. Uh, I'm Michael McCall. I'm the top Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, this has been a great opportunity to meet with our NATO allies um, and our allies in general. Uh, a good meeting with Sweden as we look at Sweden and Finland joining uh, NATO, hopefully soon. Um, but really focused on the task at hand, and that is Ukraine and how vitally important that is. And we have to educate people back home as to why it's so important. You know, when I was in uh, Poland, they said, uh, this is the largest invasion we've seen since World War II. And it reminded them very much of 1939 when Hitler invaded uh, Poland. And think if we had stopped that earlier, how many lives we could have saved uh, in World War II. And, but at the same time, you're seeing a very aggressive China uh, that's looking at, Chairman Xi is looking at uh, Taiwan, for instance, and our ambassador to China told me that um, the best deterrence would be a victory for Ukraine. We were told that this whole conflict, we knew it was gonna happen, by the way, that Putin was gonna invade, and we were told it'd be over in four days. And here we are nine months later, and the Ukrainians are winning this fight uh, in a very inspiring way. And it's our duty, and I think our NATO partners' responsibility to help them uh, win that fight, because as Senator Rich said, there's just too much at stake. It will impact uh, the rest of this century. Um, and so I'm proud to be a part of this, and thanks for having me. And now I want to introduce uh, Congressman Crow from uh, Colorado. Good afternoon. I'm Jason Crow from the state of Colorado. Um, I, you know, I come to this conference uh, with three frames. One frame as a U.S. combat veteran. Uh, I have served and fought with many of the allies and partners that we are meeting with and having these discussions with uh, over the, the next couple of days. Uh, the second is as a member of the House Armed Services Committee and the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, and I work with a lot of the foreign partners who are also here having discussions. Uh, but the third is, uh, as a uh, member from a state that's one of the most um, uh, national security defense-oriented states in the country. So bringing the, the, these three frames to bear, uh, what I've noticed is something very unique and special that's happening here this weekend. When you go into the halls in these sessions, there is robust and honest and candid discussion. And what that tells me is that we are more than just allies on paper, more than just partners, and more than just friends, that we are family. As a community of nations dedicated to sovereignty, to independence, to freedom, it requires a certain level of confidence to have family-oriented discussions about the future of free and open democratic states and how we address our collective challenges. That is a value proposition that Russia and our adversaries cannot and will not ever be able to provide. 
we come to this with mutual respect to have these discussions of how we can collectively address these problems. Uh, so with that, uh, I am proud to introduce uh, my great friend from the state of California, Sarah Jacobs. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Thank you to Senators Shaheen and Rish for leading this delegation and, and including me. It's my first time at the Halifax Security Forum, and it's been a wonderful experience so far. And I echo everything my colleagues said. I think it's very clear from the conversations we've had in our bilateral meetings, from the, the conversations we've had in the hallways, from the plenary sessions, that there is a, a real common united desire to see Ukraine succeed, uh, and that we're all thinking about what the future of the rules based international order is and how we continue to maintain that upholding our values and the values that we want people around the world to be able to live with. So thank you so much. I think we're happy to answer questions and our colleague will call on folks. So please state your name and outlet. It'll be one question per journalist and we'll start on the right side of the room. Steve Chase uh, with the Globe and Mail newspaper in Canada. I wanted to welcome you all here to Canada and uh, it's a conversation we're having with our NATO allies here and I wanted to ask you um, a continuity of leadership question at, uh, about NATO. Uh, the Secretary General's term ends next year and uh, there's been a Canadian name floating around in circles as a possible replacement, Krista Freeland. She's the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and a Ukrainian Canadian. Uh, it was the New York Times of all places that mentioned this. This was a name floating around Washington. So I wanted to invite uh, Senator, Senator Rish, Coons, Shaheen, anyone. Uh, would, you, would you be willing to support a Canadian candidate for the next Secretary General of NATO and Ms. Freeland in particular? Well, let me just say I'm not going to weigh in um, to that effort, but I do want to point out the excellent job that the current Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, has done uh, during his tenure, and I think that we need to look for someone who can provide that kind of leadership for NATO during what will continue to be challenging times. Um, I also think that it's important that we look at uh, the commitment that those countries who participate in NATO um, make both to the compact and to the, the resource requirement. And so I hope that that will be something that everyone will recommit to, to ensure that they're providing the 2% of GDP that um, NATO has asked of its members. Yeah, uh, Gene couldn't have said it better. Look, th this isn't our business to wade into this. Certainly, our Canadians are like cousins to us, uh, uh, siblings. Uh, we're, we're not going to have any problem with that at all. Uh, but uh, the good news is whoever takes it over is taking over an uh, organization that is stronger than it's ever been. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, Joe Gould from Defense News. Um, Senator Coons, you um, noted that you didn't you support increasing um, Ukraine aid. The, the Biden administration has um, several times um, uh, proposed packages and Congress has increased those packages. What's expected to happen? Is, is this, um, is the, is the, um, is Congress expected to add to, uh, to the president's um, Ukraine proposal? And also, or should we expect any kind of um, aid package for Taiwan, a similar um, security aid package for Taiwan? Uh, the supplemental touches on a number of areas, but the Ukraine portion of it is the largest. Uh, it is my hope that we will add to it. Uh, it's specifically my hope that we'll add to the humanitarian side of it. The military side is robust. The economic support side is robust. Um, but I also am clear that Ukraine's needs uh, are significant. And because of Russia's continued um, and tragically, in some ways, effective bombardment of their electrical infrastructure, I think they will grow. I think there is a real risk of a, another wave of refugees and of intensifying humanitarian need. I also think, frankly, while Ukraine is making steady progress uh, on the battlefront, uh, we ought to continue to provide them with robust support. We are grateful for the sustained investment by our allies and partners, Canada, <coughs> NATO, EU, and, and other nations. Um, but frankly, the United States needs to make it clear we are willing to not just provide the package the president has requested, but add to it in ways that we think will add to Ukraine's defense. You want to? Sure. 
Yeah, on the Taiwan uh, question, my uh, Taiwan Policy Act passed out of committee. It's currently in the National Defense Authorization, and it's a $2 billion foreign military financing uh, to Taiwan. It's very important we get weapons in there for deterrence. And we had a very good discussion with Secretary Austin about our defense industrial base and how we need to uh, really fix it and make it more robust. Uh, Stu Magnuson, National Defense Magazine. Uh, this is a question both from somebody who writes about disinformation uh, from foreign governments and also someone who cares very deeply about his profession, journalism. So it's for Senator Coons, you mentioned in the last panel about helping, maybe Congress could help U.S. journalism bolster it somehow. I'm, I'm interested in hearing some details. That's kind of a first. I've never heard anyone from Congress. And a lot of people in journalism would, you know, want to cherish their independence. So I'm curious about how you could uh, fill the holes of that so many small newspapers have gone out of business, especially small towns uh, in all your states. Uh, so just some um, details on what you're thinking. Three things. First, thank you. Um, we are investing time in this a press conference because we believe in investing time in the free media and having you ask us hard questions being accountable. That's one of the most foundational elements of a successful open society. Um, second, we do fund um, both within the State Department, the State Department's efforts at um, providing content and supporting uh, global media. Uh, I think there's more we can and should do. Um, Senator Klobuchar has a piece of legislation that uh, might strengthen revenue sharing with social media platforms for uh, independent journalistic outlets in the United States that I think is intriguing and worth our consideration. I also think we can and should provide support for um, communities of independent uh, content providers and journalists. We provide robust support for things like Fulbright programs that help uh, with training and professionalization of uh, journalism students from around the world. There's lots of other ways I think we can and should recognize that if the content that is being provided to the world is only that content coming from um, U.S. government sources, then we're mistaking our own core assumption, which is that an independent core of journalists is the best way to get the truth out to the people of the world. Um, both Russia and China invest multiples of what we do um, in their state-funded and state-run content uh, providers, uh, whether it's uh, RT or Sputnik or others. I think we should instead be providing funding that helps independent journalism around the world. Thank you. But, but let me also point out that um, when we did the CARES Act in response to the COVID pandemic, that there were provisions in there um, to help our small businesses, including um, small newspapers and media outlets um, that were really struggling. So we have already actually uh, done some things to, to try and help ensure that, that those critical local outlets don't go out of business. Connor O'Brien with uh, Politico. Uh, obviously, we're about two weeks past a midterm election where the control of the Senate, the Senate stays the same, but the House is going to change. Uh, I'm just curious, did you field any questions, concerns from allies about what does divided government mean for you, various U.S. security commitments, and uh, what did you tell them? Um, I haven't talked to anybody about the divided government question. It's been more around the continued bipartisan support for Ukraine, which we reassured them that that's the reason we're here. But perhaps Senator Risch or some of our House yeah. colleagues might have a different reaction. Yeah, this is probably uh, one of the most bipartisan issues uh, that I've seen since I've been in Congress. Um, uh, look, I, uh, media has hit me up a number of times saying, well, your Republicans say, uh, colleagues say, blah, blah, blah. Look, there's 535 members of Congress. Um, the, uh, America's a great country. People can think what they want. They can say what they want. They can do what they want. Um, even if you are in the vast, vast minority, there are only a handful of people that, uh, that are, uh, balking, uh, at, uh, uh, engaging in this struggle uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, they're getting a whole lot of ink from you guys, 
but there's uh, out of the 535 that probably only make up a half a dozen or so. So uh, focus on the majority. Uh, we are uh, bound uh, to do this in a bipartisan basis. Uh, we're arm in arm on this. You heard the Secretary of Defense uh, this morning. Uh, he stated the policy of America, uh, United States Congress, the policy of the United States of America is exactly what the Secretary uh, described for you this morning. Murray Brewster with CBC News here in Canada. Welcome, everyone, and welcome back uh, for, for some. Uh, there's been an awful lot of hand-wringing in our country about the AUKUS deal and Canada's not, Canada not being at the table. I'm wondering if anyone on the panel here could uh, answer whether or not there is room for Canada at that table and what the expectations might be. You may want to... Um, well, I think the AUKUS deal is uh, another opportunity for us to engage with our partners in the Indo-Pacific and to look at how, how we can continue to build on that. I think that's part of what the deal is, and they will continue to examine um, whether it should be expanded beyond the current participants. Let me tell you, if you think the Canadians are unhappy, you ought to talk to the French. Uh, <laughs> Uh, look, look that, that deal was put together by the administration, and uh, uh, I, I would criticize the administration on this. Uh, they, they, uh, they didn't consult uh, with us. I don't know, maybe they consulted on your side of the aisle. They didn't consult on our side of the aisle. That, that was ham-handed. Uh, it could have been done entirely differently. Um, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be an opportunity to back up a little bit, take a breath, and expand that. Uh, w what they did, the idea they had, was a really, really good idea. The execution was uh, left a lot to be desired. Um, I, I think you'll see. Uh, I, I think you'll see more go go forward. Uh, as you point out, uh, Canada is a natural participant for that. France is even a more natural uh, participant for that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping they'll get this right uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Sure. Uh, as a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I've been having many conversations with our partners and allies around the world, including some of them who are in AUKUS, and all of them would like to have the same relationship with us as Canada does. So while you might not formally be in AUKUS, just rest assured that everyone knows that our partnership, what we work on together in terms of our shared defense industrial base is well known among partners and allies and is recognized by us in the United States as well. Thank you. That's it. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nahal Tusi with Politico. Some of you know me as Holly. Um, you know, it's really interesting to see you guys use the word bipartisan so much up here, this show of unity, this act of diplomacy, all of you being here. But I've talked to a lot of foreign diplomats lately and a lot of US diplomats. And when they look at the US Congress, including the Senate, uh, they see a highly dysfunctional uh, institution. <laughs> one right with so extreme deep. partisanship, uh, one that has left dozens of ambassadorships empty, one that doesn't seem to value diplomacy. The US international affairs budget has been, you know, basically the same for about a decade, whereas the Pentagon's budget has risen by a lot more um, than that. Uh, they, they see one that can't even pass a State Department Authorization Act, except for once every 20 years, when it attaches it to the Defense Authorization Act. Uh, so what, when the rest of the world looks at you, why should they believe that you are <laughs> capable of big and amazing things uh, on these fronts when you can barely get along on most things? Well, first of all, I would say because we have and we continue to, and we are gonna pass a defense authorization bill that is gonna include a reauthorization of the State Department um, that has passed out of the committee, and I expect that to happen. I'm disappointed as everyone else is by the lack of action on ambassadorships, and I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of um, blame to go around on that, um, but hopefully we're gonna continue to make progress on that before the end of the year, and I, I would argue that what, what you're seeing here is a reaffirmation of the intent of those of us who care about our foreign policy and our national security to continue to work together in all of the ways that we can to ensure that that is robust and um, that we address the challenges going forward. Are we gonna fall short? Absolutely. But 
those of us here are going to continue to try. I want to ask a question. Sure. Um, I just disagree entirely. Um, the Senate has worked extremely well over the last two years. Uh, we passed some of the most landmark bipartisan pieces of legislation that we've been working on in some cases for a decade. Not only did we pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is going to result in massive job creation and investment across the country. We passed the CHIPS Act, which is essential for us to defeat Russia, uh, to, to be able to block aggressions of China. And the fact that we, as a country, continually pass a bipartisan defense bill is allowing Ukraine to survive and continue to fight on every single day. If America hadn't done the investments we've strategically done for readiness for the past decade and a half that I've been in Congress, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be standing strong against Russia and Ukraine won't be winning. All of that's bipartisan. And so the, the work that we do, the CHIPS Act, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the bipartisan gun bill, which put more money into mental health than our country's ever put into place, these are significant pieces of bipartisanship. I just want to be clear, I asked about diplomacy. His budget has and we're going to let Senator Coons talk about the diplomatic budget. But we work on a bipartisan basis on national security all the time. Your mood, Senator Coons. My Coon. turn. My turn. <laughs> go ahead. You go James. for it. Don't believe everything you write. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go for it, honey. Honey. Uh, look, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, did, did, forgive me for quoting you and, and smack me if I get this wrong, but Senator oh, Risch earlier made a point of saying, uh, in terms of the press coverage, of sustained bipartisan support for Ukraine. There are a few members of Congress who've gotten a lot of ink in recent weeks by expressing some doubts or concerns out of 535, maybe a dozen. There is a small minority on the Foreign Relations Committee um, that holds or attacks or challenges particular ambassadorial confirmations uh, from proceeding, and we've had challenges uh, growing the diplomacy, the 150 accounts. Uh, I believe we should be investing um, in increases in diplomacy and development at the same pace with which we're investing in defense. But I vote for the defense authorization bill and for the defense appropriations every year. Our challenge is to maintain some of that balance. You are correct that both China and Russia have significantly increased their diplomatic footprint around the world in the last decade, and we haven't kept pace. China in particular has taken advantage of the opportunity to invest in the spaces in the UN um, that we, over the last few years, um, left vacant. I'm intent on our growing our investment in these areas, and we've got bipartisan support to do that. Senator Rich, next time, give me the interview. <laughs> would she sure, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, I, I, I am also one that would like to see uh, would like to see uh, enhanced investments in diplomacy. I think we could invest more there, because I think we ha actually have a unique window of opportunity uh, to engage more robustly. Because what, what's happening, what I see, and I take a lot of international trips as a member of the, of the Armed Services and the Intel Committee, people want our leadership. They prefer our partnership, right? In China, uh, I'm just gonna be blunt here. Uh, they are bullies, they are coercive, they engage in predatory economics, and the world sees that. Uh, I was talking to a, um, uh, uh, an African ambassador uh, at the Aspen Security Conference this past summer, uh, and he told me, we need you to re-engage and to re-engage in a more robust way uh, because we don't want the alternative. Uh, the people of my country don't want the alternative, but you need to step up. So I agree with the assumption that there is an opportunity and it would be best, uh, best for our country and best for the world. One, ahead, one thought. Yeah, thanks. You touched a nerve. <laughs> well, I, yeah, you did, but it's, a, to talk about this. <laughs> but it's a healthy discussion to have because sometimes I think folks on the outside looking in look at us and say, well, you're arguing about things. It's the way the founding fathers wanted it. They wanted a, a debate to go on. They didn't want us to be jamming things quickly. They wanted the House to show the emotional side and what was of a topic of current interest. They are really good at it. The Senate was designed to slow things down and to say, if we're talking about national or international and activity, good. and we're really good at that. We're really good we're at that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, it's like yesterday. I was, on the, I was on the floor of the Senate yesterday, and uh, uh, by unanimous consent, we passed legislation. And we did it on a bipartisan basis with Senator Hirono. Uh, each of us had a piece of legislation that we wanted to pass. We'd been working on it for almost two years, each of us. 
And in one morning, we were able to ask by unanimous consent that both of our pieces of legislation be passed. Both of them were passed after literally months of roadblock. It takes time, it takes patience. The founding fathers wanted the Senate to be deliberative. And so, yeah, would all of us, or do all of us have lots of patience? No, we don't. But there are some things that if you look year in and year out, we take our time to work on the National Defense Authorization Act. It has passed 61 years in a row. We do find bipartisan support, it just takes us time to do it. And right now, sometimes we spend our time, and this is kind of, you know, this is a, a perhaps being a little bit negative about us, we spend a lot of time on what I call elective items, whereas we have required parts of our courses that we sometimes leave until the very end, such as appropriations and so forth. We're working at trying to get better. And if you talk to the individual members of the Senate, none of us want to do continuing resolutions. We'd rather do the appropriations on time. But um, that requires consent of the vast majority, along with leadership supporting it as well. And it takes time to get done. Okay, we beat that horse around. now. Yeah. Yeah. This will be the last question. Thank you. Anton LaGuardia of The Economist. Um, you've expressed your desire to see Ukraine win. You've just expressed a desire to prevent a future war in Europe. What does act that actually mean to you? Does it mean helping Ukraine retake all its territory all the way to Crimea? Does it mean admitting Ukraine to NATO in future? That's, that's, a good, that's actually a good question. It is. Do you want to start? Yeah, let me take a run at that. Um, uh, look, uh, this war is between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Russia started it uh, unprovoked. Uh, they've executed it viciously. Uh, the Ukrainian people have fought back bravely. Uh, they inspire us. But when it comes to how this is going to be resolved, it's going to be between the Russians and the Ukraines. We are not going to superimpose our will on, uh, on how this gets resolved. Uh, the Ukrainians have got to live with this. Uh, they have got to uh, uh, design a peace that, uh, that is, as uh, Irmak said, uh, enduring, uh, and as Zelensky said, is, is enduring. So we stand behind them in that regard, but with an eye on the fact that the United Nations was put together to ensure that uh, the boundaries of countries uh, had integrity. And uh, Russia is doing everything it can to pull that down. Uh, this is a, uh, a part of international law, and uh, a settlement should be in compliance with international law. Next question. Thank you. That concludes the press conference. Thank you all okay. very much. Are we done? Okay. Yeah. Oh, time. No, it was time. It was time.
All right. Well, welcome everyone to today's discussion about food security. My name's Kate Brannon. I'm deputy editor at Foreign Affairs magazine. And we have an incredible panel here today that can speak to the many sides of this issue. I'm going to start introducing Admiral Linda Fagan. She's the commandant of the US Coast Guard and the first woman to lead a branch of the US Armed Services. Welcome, Linda. Thanks. Welcome, Admiral. Um, sitting next to her is JJ Omajua, the founder of Alpha Reach and the author of Digital, The New Code of Wealth. Welcome, JJ. Thank you. And sitting next to JJ is Lena Kozarni, a founding partner and CEO of Horizon Capital, the leading private equity firm in Ukraine. So we're going to hear from all different sort of breadths of experience and also geographic expertise as well. Um, I wanted to note before we got started that it's um, a sign of the times that we have a panel on food security at the Halifax Security Forum. It speaks to the severity of the global food crisis, but also the realization that food security is national security, and it underpins everything. In President Zelensky's peace plan, which he laid out at the G20 summit, and which we heard about last night here in Halifax in his remarks, food security was the second challenge he addressed in his 10-point strategy. He outlined a plan to ship more grain out of Ukraine, and also called upon other countries to make contributions. Russia's war in Ukraine has put enormous pressure on the world's food supply. Russia and Ukraine together provide about 30% of the world's grain, and the conflict has made it difficult to plant, to harvest, and to get the grain out of the country. But that's not the only thing that's going on. As David Beasley, head of the UN World Food Program, has said, it's a perfect storm on top of a perfect storm. There are high fertilizer and fuel prices driving up costs. The COVID-19 pandemic obviously called, caused global economic hardship. Across the world, people lost their jobs, making it more difficult to afford buying food. And climate change is wreaking havoc on our crops, and it's also causing chaos in our oceans. And just a few statistics to put this conversation into context. The World Food Program estimates that 828 million people go to bed every night hungry. And 50 million people within that worldwide are at risk of famine. And this is up from 27 million in 2019. Yemen and South Sudan are in the most danger, but people in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Somalia are also facing catastrophic levels of hunger. Now, all experts will tell you that this isn't a question of food availability. There's plenty of food to go around. Instead, it's a problem of distribution and poverty. And I'm going to tout um, my, our magazine, Foreign Affairs, right now. In a piece from July, Cornell professor Chris Barrett wrote, the world lacks mechanisms to trigger responses that equally protect people in locations less geopolitically important than Ukraine, or among populations of the so-called global south that may be less visible to leading Western governments. And I thought that that was an important quote to help frame the conversation. Um, because Ukraine is one of the reasons we're talking about this issue here today, it's important that even outside of that war and Russia's aggression in Ukraine, that this remain on the agenda. So with all of that in mind, let's turn to our panel. Admiral Fagan, you've served on all seven continents throughout your career, which is a deeply impressive <laughs> fact. I would love to hear your global perspective on today's food security crisis and why food security is so critical to national security. Yeah, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, you, you're probably wondering, so why is a Coast Guard officer sitting here on a food security panel? Uh, I'm going to talk about fish, and then I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the maritime transportation systems that food flows through and why they're so critical uh, to our national, uh, national security. Uh, from a fish stock, fish protein standpoint, 40% of the global population relies on fish as their, their protein uh, source. Estimates are that one in five fish landed have been uh, caught illegally in what's called uh, we, the term is IUU, illegal, unregulated, uh, unreported fishing. It is a global uh, problem. Uh, it, it is happening truly everywhere in the world. Uh, significant level of effort, illegal fishing effort off of uh, Africa, uh, but also the Galapagos and, um, and, and worldwide. And you know, the malign actors that engage in IUU fishing 
uh, erode sovereignty of the nations. This is theft of a nation's natural resources that is going on with, in some cases, some, some impunity. It affects the economic prosperity of these countries and, again, is a national uh, security uh, challenge. And the actors that use these networks uh, for this illegal activity, it also enables other malicious and illegal uh, activity. And so, you know, whether it's uh, a movement of uh, people or drugs or weapons, it, they are uh, networks that need to, uh, to be countered. Uh, we look at it uh, as a, uh, you know, rule of law, maritime governance uh, issue, have published a uh, forward-looking strategy on how to counter IUU fishing. Truly, this is a global issue. We'll take uh, many nations aligned together in partnerships to, uh, to counter, uh, counter those operations. Um, let me s pivot to the maritime transportation system. Uh, certainly, uh, for all of the countries that uh, are represented here, uh, having a safe, secure, resilient uh, maritime transportation system so that as food supplies move, they are able to move uh, reliably, safely, and, uh, and securely. And, and the, in the United States, the Coast Guard uh, has a role in, uh, in, in parts of those, uh, those systems. And certainly, as we saw, uh, you know, in the U.S., in the height of COVID, the disruptions to the supply chain, uh, many of it focused on container ships, but, uh, but, but food and other goods are moving on those ships. And uh, having a system that's got the capacity to move, uh, move goods and services are absolutely essential to national security. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Next, um, I'd like to ask you, Lena, you are a Canadian living in Ukraine for almost 30 years. You lead the largest private equity fund in the country. You're also the chair of the board of directors of the American Chamber of Commerce of, of, in Ukraine, which has the world's uh, major agricultural companies as members. All of this experience gives you enormous insight into the private sector experience in the food security crisis. Could you set the pre-invasion context for us at the beginning of 2022? How important was Ukraine's role in food security, global food security? And then inside Ukraine, how important was agriculture to Ukraine's economy? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I was in Kiev last week and had to cross the border, fly to Warsaw, I mean, drive to Warsaw, fly over here and make it for the forum. Um, you know, had the pleasure of sitting in a basement for four hours being shelled with, with others in Ukraine, um, very close to the government quarter. So it's, it's pretty surreal sitting here. But um, first I wanna say that um, we're very proud of our role. We're proud that we have 1.2 billion under management. Um, we're very grateful also to the US government for seeding the first enterprise fund in Ukraine, which is 150 million that brought in 2.3 billion. We've been able to mobilize 2.3 billion in capital for the country. And also we see that the investments that were made over these years in the telecom, broadband cable, the banking system, all of the infrastructure investments that have been made over the last 25 years by folks like the Enterprise Fund and others in Horizon Capital have really helped the connectivity, the resilience that we see today. So it's, it's very important that what was done over these last years by mobilizing this capital has really, you see the fruits of it now. Um, but going to food security, I mean, I can't tell you how important Ukraine is. You know how important Ukraine is. Um, it's quite surreal February to be sitting on the stage at our American Chamber of Commerce event with 200 CEOs, with the Prime Minister talking about a blockbuster year, nominal GDP at 200 billion, the highest level of foreign reserves, the third year in a row of blockbuster ag exports. If we look at, at how much, how important Ukraine is, I mean, everybody talks about 10% of global grain trade. If you think of Ukraine occupying fourth place after US, Argent Argentina, and Russia, I mean, Ukraine is fourth. The entire 27 member states of the EU is fifth. If we look at it's not, you know, folks um, focus on grain, but Ukraine exports 50% of sunflower oil, of the global trade in sunflower oil, 30% of barley, 30% of rapeseed, 12% of corn, 9% of wheat. Those are enormous numbers. It's not just that Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. Ukraine is the, Ukraine feeds the world. If you look at the United Nations World Food Program, 40% of the purchases come from Ukraine. If you look at the impact for the country, I mean, Ukraine in 2021 had 70 billion in exports. 
almost 30 billion of that was ag exports. That has just been absolutely choked. So the war of choice that's happening in Ukraine is not only about subjugating Ukraine, it is about cutting off the ability of Ukraine to export, to feed the world, to bring money into its economy, and thereby to ensure its economic security and its ability to, to spend on military. So if you look at 15% of the country's GDP is agriculture, two billion, two to three billion in, in imports, and if you look at right now, what Ukraine is asking the world for financial aid, 37 billion that has been committed, Ukraine has sitting in Ukraine 10 billion worth of exportable products that it cannot get out. So Ukraine is not only critical for the world in terms of food security, but cl clearly its ability to fight its war and to ensure that its economy continues over the long run depends immensely on its ability to export and this, this Black Sea Grain initiative continuing and for us seeing stability in that initiative. Just to follow up, what has Russia's war done to this picture? What is the experience right now of Ukrainian farmers? Are, are they, I'm sure they're busy fighting. Um, what is the outlook over the next year for Ukrainian agriculture? Okay, so if you look at Ukraine, 7.5 million people work in agriculture. If you think of the, what they're dealing with, the mining of the fields, of the security risks, for one ton of food, those small farmers, and 80% of the output comes from small farmers. One ton of food, they used to make $100. They make $10 now. That has led to the planting for next year decreasing 40%. That, that's immense. When you look at this Black Sea Grain Initiative, which of course the UN brokered Black Sea Grain Initiative, what Ukraine needs from the world is for that initiative to continue. At this point, there are only three ports through which those ships, you know, where they're able to pick up food products and export them. We need those number of ports to expand. We need Mykolaiv and Olvia, which are the two ports where Absolutely nothing has left those ports. We need those added. We need the, it's interesting because what seems to be happening now is that Russia has changed its tactics. If before it was saying, well, we, you know, we're stepping out of the deal in October, then they step back in. Now it's a deliberate slowdown of the inspections. So if you're able to, without the Russian inspections, get out 40 ships a day, and then the inspections are now decreasing, that number to 12 ships a day. That's down 30, 40%. Of course, that is gonna hit in terms of food security. So for, for Ukraine at this point, what it needs is stability. It needs a continuous, continuation of the UN broker deal, not for nine, you know, 90 days, but for a year. It needs more ports added to that, Mykolaiv and Olvia for certain. And it needs for those inspections to happen quickly. They can do 40 inspections a day and get more ships out. Thank you. JJ, let's turn to you. You're from Nigeria, one of the countries most affected by what's happening. In Northeast Nigeria, 8.4 million people are food insecure. What is your perspective on the challenge of global food security? And what do you see as the most pressing aspect of it within the larger problem? I think I'll speak to the complexities and the contradictions in, in food security. But I'll, I'll start by using a Yoruba proverb uh, that was made into a song by uh, the iconic Nigerian musician, King Sonia De. He said, I'll, I'll first of all say it in Yoruba, then I'll translate it. Kila o je lagba, oun lagba kila o she. That is, what are we going to eat is senior to what are we going to do. And if you look into history, different cultures have sayings like this that reflect on the importance and essence of food. And I think it was U.S. Um, congressman that said, a safe, affordable, and plentiful supply of food is essential to national security. I think that was um, Doug, Doug Osi that said that. The contradictory part of this is that for 74 years now, we've declared access to food as a fundamental human right. And we also accepted that every other right is consequence 
upon that rise. But unfortunately, for, um, 74 years after, um, 3 million children per year, 3.1 million children per year, die directly of malnourishment. Up to 6 million die related to malnourishment, just children, b before you talk about um, adults. You mentioned the numbers with respect to how many people are hungry around the world, over 800 million people. Some numbers say that by 2050, that number would increase by another 2 billion people. And that's, that's a contradiction because currently we're producing enough food for 10 billion people. And according to the recent numbers, we've just clocked 8 billion people in the world. So we're producing more, more food than we need for at least two, 2 billion people more. So what's the issue? Where the complexities come in is how the different challenges in different countries based on whether they're poor or rich countries. So for instance, in poor countries like Nigeria, there's a challenge of food waste, but food waste from the point of harvest due to inadequate infrastructure, storage facilities, transportation, and an economic system that is not sophisticated to deal with what has been harvested. So as much as 50, 60% of what has been harvested is wasted. In rich countries, developed countries so-called, the challenge of food waste actually happens in the kitchen. Where, so one of the things we need to address is the portions, when you, the serving portions, the kind of plate you use to serve, because that automatically affects your behavior in how you serve. Again, that's also another issue. And when you put it together, some $2.6 trillion is wasted to food every year in, in a situation where we speak about the shortage of food. The other aspect about the complexities is how this waste is, doesn't just cost $2.6 trillion. It also has a consequence on climate change. If food waste were a country, it would be the third highest contributor to carbon emissions after after China and, and the USA. That's a big deal. It also um, it contributes 7% seven, 7 to, 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 to the emissions, um, if, if we're speaking around that. Of course, it also has effects on, on hurricanes, on flooding. You didn't mention flooding. We're just flooding in Nigeria, mm -hmm. in, in Thailand. And that also goes back to affect food production. Global food, global food um, security has different perspectives and different outcomes according to different countries. But what we must commit to is that one way or another, um, it comes back to reflect on every country. So sometimes the rich countries might think this is not a problem. We have more than enough food to, to feed ourselves. But the truth is the consequences of the effects come back to you one way or another. The, the consequences come to roost in terms of migration, in terms of the pressure on migration, which of course goes to, to affect the kind of politics and conversations you have in your politics. So food security, really and truly, as has been said by my other panelists, is a national security issue. And it's not just pressing in Nigeria. It's pressing in Ukraine. It's pressing in America. It's a global problem. <laughs> Admiral Fagan, back to you. Um, so much focus right now is on grain and wheat and fertilizers because that's the cause of our acute problem at the moment, the acute hunger across the globe. But climate change is obviously affecting our oceans and the vital food sources there. You spoke a little bit about illegal fishing in your, in your first comments. Um, could you tell us from your vantage point what you see climate doing to the oceans, doing to the food sources there, and then what the second and third order effects are on that scarcity that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll point uh, directly to the uh, crab fishery in the United States uh, off of Alaska. And the, um, the Bering Sea snow crab fishery is closed this year first time. Bristol Bay Red King crab fishery is closed for a second year in a row. The economic impacts of those closures are estimated to be between $500 million and a $1 billion in losses to the fishermen and industry. Uh, they don't actually know where the crabs have gone. There's a question around what, you know, whether there was a mass uh, you know, bio uh, die-off or whether they've moved. The fish are definitely moving. They're very temperature sensitive and so uh, as climate has uh, impacted weather, it's, uh, it's impacting uh, temperatures and flows in the, uh, in the ocean. 
for, um, for the United States. This puts the pressure right now very directly along the shared maritime boundary line uh, with Russia. And the fish stocks don't recognize the lines we tend to draw as uh, governments. And uh, so you, you've got just direct um, increased competition uh, there for, uh, for that resource. Um, so overfishing, then, you know, I put it in the terms of uh, illegal, uh, you know, IUU fishing, uh, is occurring at a scale and scope and pace that while I can point to the, the Alaska uh, crab uh, absence, there are other major fish stocks around the globe that have experienced other, uh, you know, other significant uh, degradations that we we may or may not actually uh, know about. And you know, back to the criticality of fish as a protein source for for large populations uh, around the world, and having stable uh, access to those fish stocks become really critical uh, to to food security. And so changing ocean patterns, changing weather, all having a very, uh, very dramatic uh, impact on a reliable access to, uh, to protein sources from, from the sea. Thank you. And then just to follow up, that, that scarcity, when you step back and see um, whether it's from the ocean or the um, food scarcity program or security issues that we're talking about from, from grain, what are the second and third order effects that, that this causes and, and the connection to conflict as well? Right, and so for, um, for nations who rely on uh, you know, fish as a food source, uh, it, be, it becomes destabilizing, economic prosperity uh, is decreased, uh, ability to maintain uh, their own national sovereignty uh, is eroded. Uh, in ways that you know create just increased instability for uh, populations, drive competition for scarce resources, and uh, you know create uh, the potential for uh, for for conflict uh, in a way that challenges. Particularly, you know, I'm thinking many of the small uh, small island nations in the Pacific. This is a particularly acute issue: the access to the fish, but then also impacts the climate on you know their their ability to just reside in their own. Uh, nations and is definitely uh, you know right in that national security uh, realm. Yeah, one thing I'm hearing both uh, yesterday and today is finally sort of the confluence of climate policy, food security policy, and national security policy. Do you find that these issues are finally kind of elevating to the uh, that that bigger conversation and that the po and that policies are starting to be thought about more holistically? Yeah, they're definitely, the conversations are definitely uh, elevating. It's uh, interesting. So the, I, I mentioned the IUU strategy. Uh, that was jointly rolled out by my predecessor and the Southcom commander. So even, you know, within the Pentagon, uh, as well as other agencies within in the U.S. government, recognition about the criticality of uh, food security, uh, you know, impacts of climate, the need for increased resiliency, and that, you know, that conversation looks... Uh, and sounds differently uh, depending on what, you know kind of what type of resiliency you're talking about, and so I think that's a critical first step to then get into the more elevated and, and uh, comprehensive uh, policy conversation. But uh, it uh, it certainly did not make the uh, issues uh, easier, maybe perhaps a little harder. But I think the solutions, uh, as you look across the issues, are hopefully going to be more more coherent and, mm -hmm. uh, and impactful. Lena, returning again to the, the private sector in Ukraine, um, how is it contributing and playing a role in f the food security problem um, and uh, pr helping with economic resilience, especially this winter uh, in Ukraine specifically? Yeah, the, the private sector obviously has an enormous role, pl role to play. Um, they are heroes. You know, everywhere I go when I talk to people, they they think that Ukraine, that it's basically now humanitarian hubs everywhere, and the private sector is not operational. Um, the private sector has never left. They're focused on safety, security, revamping their business models, of course, now doing an enormous amount in terms of humanitarian. Um, at American Chamber of Commerce, we have 600 members, over 50 billion they've invested in, in the country. And of course, all of the large ad companies, the ADMs, Boongies, Dreyfus, Cargills, et cetera, who are present in the country. And the extent to which they are doing everything they can 
together with the government, of course. I mean, even if you look at the March to May before the grain initiative was launched, I mean, they were spending $200 million a day in losses trying to get food out through Romanian routes and, and automobile routes. So, I mean, they're doing everything that they can. Um, you know, the private sector, I'm proud that we're part of the private sector and, and it was it was amazing. I'll, I'll just share an anecdote. You know, the other day, November 15th, what, 10 Iranian drones, over 80 um, missile strikes across the country. We're all sitting in bomb shelters. We were supposed to have our Thanksgiving dinner with the U.S. Ambassador Bridget Brink that night. Second time it was canceled because October 10th, of course, the last time it was um, supposed to be scheduled was another missile strike. Um, but after half an hour later, everyone said, we're doing this, we're going ahead. We all got together, over 200 CEOs in um, Kiev, in the center, got together with the U.S. ambassador to have Thanksgiving dinner. And that's the, that's the kind of spirit that the folks who are in the room, they're keeping the telecom sector going, they're keeping the, the container ships running, the agriculture products being exported, um, they're keeping the, the internet, the connectivity, the telecom. Um, it's just incredible, and these, these folks have this sense of even though I mean those who've been to Kiev it's dark it's dark you know the traffic lights aren't working half the city has doesn't have power or one you know apartment block is is lit up those who have diesel generators have have power you know they've hit 40 percent of the energy infrastructure um, but these folks feel that this is a mission they cannot um, they must keep the country running um, it's a question of 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 an obligation that goes far beyond just business. So it's not, it's not only on the food security side, it's also on the overall resilience. Um, but in terms, obviously they need the government support, they need the global community support. The, the grain initiative must continue. Um, that's important. You know, the, the president, President Zelensky announced this grain, grain from Ukraine. Um, he announced that at the G19 the other day. And it was amazing because even just today, the U.S. announced 20 million USAID for the Grain from Ukraine initiative, which of course gets grain to the poorest countries on the brink of starvation. So we will continue. The private sector in Kiev will continue, is resilient, will work with the government and um, make sure that both the food gets out but also the economy keeps running. That Grain from Ukraine initiative is also so important, I think, because it combats the Russian disinformation about the cause of the lack of Ukrainian grain on the market, um, which I think is so important as well. Um, JJ, I wanted to return to you. Um, you previously described how complex this problem is. When something is that complex, how do you go about addressing it? Where do you begin? Yeah, so the, the fundamental thing about complex problems is that there are many ways to deal with it. But I would say, for me, based on the way I have thought about it, um, the, the blue pencil theory would be a good part to it. So I personally used to think that blue penciling was a legal jargon and it was a legal strategy just meant for lawyers. Then I had a sit down with one of my mentors, uh, Senator Ab Adamo Abdullahi, about another complex problem that had nothing to do with lawyers and it wasn't a legal problem. And he started to say that we could apply blue penciling to this thing. And if you look at the global food security issue, we could actually apply blue penciling. And basically the idea is you have a big problem, there are many parts of it that is problematic. Then you now decide according to your resources, what part of the problem do you have the resources and the means and the motivation to address? And in picking those parts, how do you then prioritize the parts that have a huge consequence on the overall problem? That's basically what, in this context, blue penciling is if we're going to address a problem. And um, on the continent, in Africa, an organization like the African Development Bank, uh, led by Dr. Akiumi Adeshino, they've actually done something along those lines, um, the African Adaptation and Acceleration Program that's being, currently being deployed in about 26, as I said the last time I checked, 26 African countries, directed at over 30 million farmers, impacting grain yields in Ethiopia, in Ghana, in Madagascar, in Mozambique, helping to improve the, the farming system, affecting extension work, improving seed varieties, improving yields. Um, Australia initially 
we used to talk about the death of food in Australia. This particular, uh, the, the, the TAT program and the AA, AAP program, three AP program of the African of the African Development Bank is already yielding big results on, on those fronts. And I think that what they did was to solve a food security problem and at the same time use it as an adaptation solution with respect to climate change, right? Which of course also helps to reduce helps to reduce the it helps to increase the productivity of the individual countries. And I think for rich countries they might be looking at talking about blue penciling, they might be looking at reducing waste. And how do you reduce waste? Food wastage is a behavior problem. And how do you change human behavior? There are many ways you could change human behavior, but one of the ways I know is that you look at three factors. One is the capability of the individual to change the behavior. Two is the opportunity of the individual to change the behavior. And three is the motivation. I think that we already have as a collective, as an individual, we have the capability because you can just decide to eat. You can just decide to serve the amount of food that you can eat rather than over serve and then end up wasting. We have that capability. In terms of opportunity, there couldn't be more need for opportunity because we can already see that when you waste food, there are consequences, not just to the fact that somebody else is being denied access to that food, but even to the environment and consequently the ability of the world to even create food. The challenge we have is with motivation mm -hmm. because we haven't seen this as a big problem enough. We haven't seen this as a complex problem enough. And that's what we have to deal with. We have the capability to make this change happen. We have the opportunity, especially with conversations like this, to make this change happen. What we need to address is the motivation. So they always say, for instance, when there's a will, there's a way which means that no matter how the problem is, once you have the motivation to go for it, you would be able to one way or the other deal with it. Then have you thought of a situation where there is a way, but there's no will? That's a bigger problem. Because now there's a path to move forward, but you don't have the motivation to move forward. And I think with respect to food security, with respect to global food insecurity, however you want to look at it, whether from the point of food security or from the point of uh, food insecurity, what we do not have is the motivation, especially as a global community, to address it. Mm -hmm. um, Admiral Fagan, building off of what JJ just said, there, are, what are the opportunities in the food security problem? We've heard a lot uh, yesterday and today about the need to attract countries to the side of the liberal international order, away from authoritarian states like Russia and China. How can food security be a part of that effort? Yeah, so I'm, I'll answer in the in the context of the the you know fisheries uh, problem set, is the the counter to it requires, and you heard the Secretary of Defense talk about the power of partnerships and allies, and this is true, very true in this particular problem set. There is no one uh, nation who has the all of the capacity and the authority uh, to counter. Uh, some of the some of the challenge in um, in in the problem set, and so um, you know, one it starts with uh, improved information, illuminating the scope and scale uh, of the of the problem, and then sharing that information. We've we've heard you know earlier about the, the power of uh, sharing information as um, as allies and partners, and then. Um, you know, kind of thirdly, it is all about partnerships and uh, engaging together in an aligned, uh, you know, with aligned um, will and commitment to uh, to countering uh, countering some of the the, the challenge and the um, uh, and the problem. We we have approached it, um, it from from very much those those aspects. You know, improving the maritime domain awareness, information sharing, and then partnerships. Uh, and so, for example, we've got um, you know we've got upwards of 18 um, bilateral partnerships that we've signed with uh, you know with nations around the region. But, you know, I'm focusing primarily now on the Pacific, uh, where uh, a Coast Guard ship may come and we pick up a, a fishing uh, resourcing expert from from a partner nation and take them out to uh, let them uh, do uh, do boardings. And then, um, you know, MOUs, memorandums of understanding across, uh, you know, multiple uh, partners regionally to, uh, 
to to focus on um, on the on the problem set. But you know, as you said you need there needs to be a will, and then uh, you know the way uh, way re reveals itself through uh, really multilateral and uh, bi bilateral engagement. And just one kind of final thought as. Um, as we engage countries, you know, and I've talked about the small island um, nations, it's really about increasing a country's ability to protect and ensure their own sovereignty and protect and, and husband their own natural resources. And so we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, training and, and in increasing capacity uh, of the sovereign nations so that they can they can do some of this for themselves as we as we stand alongside um, and uh, and and help but throughout all of it and we've talked a little bit about climate right just just resiliency in the system to withstand some of the I'm going to use the term shocks but right the, whether it's a, a major climate event or uh, a disruption such as uh, you know the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, you know, improving the resiliency of all of our systems that 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 contribute to food security and national security is really, uh, you know, work that we need to need to focus on. Lena, I wanted to ask you quickly before we turn it over to the audience, um, slightly off the topic of food security, but you arrived in Ukraine in the early '90s, I believe, when Ukraine was just starting out on this chapter post-Soviet Union. Um, could you speak a little bit about what was your impression then and what drew you to staying there? And then fast forward to now, the country is almost being you know, put back in time in a way, has to rebuild. Um, what are your sort of thoughts about that and, and your own journey from, from that moment to now? So obviously in 1993, I mean, Ukraine had gained its ind independence in 1991. And when I arrived, I was 23. I had decided that Ukraine was my mission and purpose. I mean, obviously, it's a big event in your life when, when the Soviet Union falls apart, the country you'd heard so much about from your, your parents and grandparents um, becomes free and independent. And, and of course, at that time, you know, coming there, it was the vestiges of the Soviet Union. So it was the, the you know, crumbling Soviet era plants and mines and infrastructure that you saw throughout the country. Um, you, you, you did not see kind of that new generation, the civic society, the, the, those, that kind of brightness that we see today. Um, obviously, 1993 was very different in terms of the development of the country. And um, you know, fast forward over the years, uh, you know, what's kept me there, the people kept me there. The, the ones who motivate me the most are the new generation, um, I think in the last eight years, in the last 10 years, this rise of this new generation, um, those who've never been born in the Soviet Union, um, they have no nostalgia towards it. They don't think and you know, harken back to, the, to, to these good old days when they were taken care of. Um, they are very westward focused. They want the opportunity to, to create themselves, to develop themselves, to to take their idea and, and make something from it. And it's, it's incredible because those are the people that inspire you, that are driving change. I mean, even, even the tech sector. You know, we've become one of the largest investors, the largest investor in tech in Ukraine. And there was no tech sector. In 2003, it was a $110 million industry. It's a $6 billion industry, $6 billion. You know, for anyone who follows Ukraine, the level of digitalization, the Ukraine in a smartphone, you know, 70 government services. I mean, I have my COVID certificate on a piece of paper. They have it, everything in DIA. 17 million people have DIA app, have their birth certificates, their driver licenses, you know, in their smartphone. It's incredible. And even the resilience during this time of war has been to great extent because of digitalization. So, you know, for me, the contrast now, you know, 1993, dark, very Soviet vestiges, no real sign of the new generation, everyone kind of homo sovieticus and, and nostalgic for what was this, this like system that took care of them. Now fast forward, the, these, this new generation that really, you know, it's exemplified in the president. You know, he's young, he's 42, his team is young. You know, you feel like at my age, you know, I'm 53 and I feel ancient compared to <laughs> the teams that are in place in, in, in the government, in the parliament. You know, these, these folks are, taking their country westward, 
dreaming about being part of the EU, desperately delighted to be a candidate country, um, wanting to reform the country. Um, we saw that over the last eight years, the, the extent to which they have reformed since 2014 you know, half the banks closed in the banking system, Prozora, the electronic procurement app, digitalization cuts out that corrupt official that you don't even deal with anymore. You're doing everything on the smartphone. So, so you know, for me, it's what's kept me there is the new generation, what we cannot forsake. We cannot, we cannot let them down. We can't let that new generation, we can't let them down. We cannot shove them into the Soviet Union that they have never known, have never grown up in, and don't want to be part of. You know, they have paid a high enough price and they deserve to set their own course. So we know nobody in Ukraine thought the country would be done in three days. None of us did. You know, there was, it was very interesting during the run up, you know, because you had this difference, different views between allies in terms of whether this was going to happen, whether it wasn't, those had thought that, that you know, this was all bluster and there wouldn't be an actual invasion. Um, you know, the folks on the ground, there was varying opinions. There were those that rented blocks of apartments in Western Ukraine and moved their, their people. And there were folks that, you know, were in the office on February 24th. And you see that kind of resilience after that, driven by the new generation that really has kept the country running. So let's see. You know, we'll see what happens, but one thing I know for sure is that we need to give Ukraine the maximum to put this to rest as quickly as possible. This is not about liberating territories, liberating people. You look at Kherson people, those people are, they are fine not having gas, electricity, food, or water. They do not want to live under an oppressive regime. Give them the choice of oppressive regime, Russian occupation, or no food, water, electricity, gas, suffering, they will pick that. No food, water, gas, electricity, and suffering. Well, thank you so much. I know I've taken us off um, topic, but I thought it was important to, while you're sitting here to share that perspective with us. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. I see you right away. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Mark Goldberg. I'm the editor of UN Dispatch and host of the Global Dispatches podcast. Uh, I have a question, I think probably mostly for JJ. One thing that the Russia's invasion of Ukraine underscored was how reliant many countries in Africa are on fertilizer from Belarus and Russia. Are you seeing efforts in Nigeria or perhaps throughout the region more broadly to in response to that, create a domestic fertilizer industry? And how has Nigeria and other countries in the region responded to, to the fertilizer shortage and crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Interestingly, Nigeria sort of anticipated this uh, because even though some of the reactions were criticized in terms of how it reacted to initially how China was bringing food to Nigeria through I don't want to mention some other African countries pretending to be food coming from those countries specifically. Mm -hmm. And also right now, I think one of the biggest fertilizer plants in the world um, has just been commissioned in Nigeria, um, in Lagos, as a matter of fact. And the African Development Bank, the African Development Bank that I mentioned earlier, they're doing quite a lot of work trying to make sure that Africa shows resilience. Um, some of it in reaction to what has happened with, with Putin's war in Ukraine. A lot of it is just a commitment to ensuring that more often than not, whatever happens around the world, Africa is able to solve its own problems. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, um, Nigeria, the African Development Bank itself, and a few other African countries are taking um, responsibility. And I do know that the fertilizer plant in Nigeria that has just been opened by the Dangote industry um, is being developed not just for the Nigerian market, but a lot of it for the African market using the platform of the African uh, trade and um, African free trade um, area, AFCTA, which is one of the biggest trade deals in the world. Excellent. Um, right back here. Hi, Madeline Redfern. I'm from Iqaluit, the capital of Nunavut, Canada's biggest but smallest populated territory. I would be remiss if I didn't speak that Nunavut Inuit have the highest food insecurity in this country. Pre-COVID, 
pre the Rush, uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, eight out of 10 Inuit preschool children are food insecure. It's gotten worse since COVID. It's gotten worse since the invasion of Ukraine. Fuel prices have increased food prices across this country and more so in Nunavut than anywhere else because we have no roads or rails into our territory. Yeah. So a liter of orange juice is $25. A cantaloupe is $10. A head of cauliflower, $10. A box of cereal, $12. Hmm. Our soup kitchen food center was feeding 150 people a daily before COVID. It now feeds 500. Wow. Most of those are children and families. We need to ensure that the infrastructure investments, especially the billions of dollars that the government of Canada, including the United States that are planning to invest in NORAD modernization, must ensure that it is dual purpose, good for our communities. We need energy security, we need reliable, energy and get our communities off of diesel. It's a big issue. It's a huge cost factor. Before uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, our government in Nunavut was spending about a dollar a liter for petrol. It's gone up. That's why food prices have gone up. So it's not also it really an issue of, uh, of lack of food. It's a lack of income. So I'm working hard to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. When we saw the infrastructure investments being made into the early warning systems during the Cold War, that saw my people eating off the military dumps. We need to see these NORAD and, and infrastructure investments actually transform our communities. That those investments you know, are not just military based because we need an economy and we need to be part of the the solution that actually helps not only support continental defense, but also supports the security issues that are both economic and food security in our communities and our people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Tolu Obulese from Nigeria. Um, the US for example, has done a very good job um, in terms of military cooperation, you know, supporting the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Navy, uh, collaborations and all that. Um, but when it comes to investments, you know, in building the capacity of African countries to produce food, um, I want to know, I mean, so this question is not is for, I guess, anybody on the, on the panel, but how can we, at the end of the day, it boils down to putting money, kind of, you know, point on internet where your mouth is. Um, it, um, in 2015, Nigeria had less than 10 fertilizer blending plants. Today, we have about 70. You know, that's because people put money into investing in these things. You know, but I see a lot of talk about you know a lot of things. But how do we get you know that money to get to come into actually building the capacity to uh, produce food? By way of context, Nigeria is 200 million people. Uh, we're going to be double that number in 30 years. You know, um, so whatever scale of the problem you think you have today is going to be a lot worse. You know, so if you get Nigeria, for example, to be self-sufficient in food or as much as possible, you're taking away a lot of the problem of the world, for example. So I want to know what you're, you know, how can we just like move from the talk to actually just putting money in ag tech, in supporting farmers, in boosting uh, uh, food uh, production capacity. Thank you. The U.S., by the way, is one of the um, in the African Development Bank is comp comprises of several African countries and development partners around the world and the US has one of the biggest shares in the African Development Bank and as a bank actually they are very very consequential to food security on the continent and I'd also like to say that questioning listening talking they're all very important they help us understand the problem but I also believe and agree that um, we must walk the talk. One of the biggest donors to, you know, the displaced people, to ensuring that people that suffer from flooding, supporting entrepreneurship on the continent, supporting infrastructure on the continent, is Dr. Mike Adenuga, right? But the interesting thing is, 
you wouldn't see any quotation. Dr. Mike Adenuga, by the way, is one of the richest, by some estimates, probably the richest African, according to some people. You wouldn't read any quotation from him about any of the problems. But what you hear about, what you read about is that he signed some checks about the problem. And I think that's what we must commit to, especially those of us with the resources to do this thing. But as a collective again, and as government and as institutions, we need critical thinking to deal with these problems. And where there is no critical thinking, we could do with some thinking, any form of thinking, we just need to solve the problem. On the other side is to also say that the sort of solutions that brought us here may not be able to take us forward. So we need, again, this continuous thinking, a kind of paradigm shift, a different way of looking at these problems. And for poor countries, um, Tolu, with respect to your question, is to know that when push comes to shove, like the COVID-19 vaccines showed us, ultimately you are on your own, at least for a start, before people come to help you. When we know that, then we can start to do what we're supposed to do. We can start to find the will and the motivation to find the way to help ourselves. And you know, on the other side, conversely, for rich countries is to understand that the consequences of food security, the realities of food insecurity, however you want to look at it, they are more real than our national boundaries. Our national boundaries are subjective. I mean, tomorrow morning you could create another country. I mean, we don't know maybe by 2030 Scotland would be part of the United Kingdom, for instance. But we do know by, by 2030, if we don't do the right things, we're going to have more poor people. We're going to have, if we don't do the right things, the zero hunger by 20, 2030, according to the second um, sustainable development goals, might not be realized if we don't do the right thing because those realities would be there. They are objective realities. Hunger is an objective reality. The consequences of food insecurity, they're objective realities. They are more important and more real than this subjective reality of our national boundaries. And we must find a way to understand it like that and find collective solutions whilst we look out for individual solutions, whether it is national, whether it's subnational, whether it is regional or continental. Mm -hmm. If I can add, um, what is really important is also that, that, that folks get to positions of influence. And, I, and we were, you know, every year we organize Ukraine House Davos, and we were thrilled that the new managing director of International Finance Corporation, which is backed by the World Bank, Mahtar Jup, first African national to be the head of the IFC. I mean, that's a 50 to $60 billion infrastructure, primarily infrastructure player throughout the world who has a very clear view, who led the infrastructure program for IFC across all of Africa. And now he leads IFC. And we had the pleasure of him, you know, we had, um, we raised the first fund for Ukraine um, during the war. We had a signing ceremony with President Zelensky in September, and it was amazing. Mahtar was front and center and absolutely sees the whole connection, you know, how all of this is interrelated, and felt very strongly that he wanted to back our fund along with others. We raised half the fund, 125 million. I mean, at a time of war, we had investors who were backing the fund and saying, disperse this before the war ends. Disperse it as quickly as possible. And Mahdad was one of the visionaries that I've seen. There's EBRD and the Swiss, German, US governments, et cetera, who, who backed the fund. But without those people who are in that position, who understand how all of the dots are connected, then we wouldn't have had that outcome. So, so definitely, you know, the more, the more who are at those in those rooms where the yeah. what is it? <laughs> the room where it the happens. Room where it happens. Yeah. The more you know, people who are in the room where it happens, the better. Um, in terms of putting your money where your mouth is, um, you, the head of the UN World Food Program, David Beasley, has said you pay for it no matter what. You either pony up now and get people the food they need, or you pay for it when you have a migrant crisis on your border and you are trying to accommodate refugees and migrants. So you end up paying for it either way, and you probably save money by, and you know, great moral cause by paying for it up front. Um, yes, please. My name is Alyssa Ayres from the Elliott School of International Affairs. I was really intrigued that in the course of this conversation, we haven't really gotten to some of the issues of 
of, of, of food transformation in agriculture. Or, you know, there's a lot of focus, I think, from among the UN, certainly in, in South Asia, which is the region I pay close attention to, there's a lot of conversation about um, moving more towards millets that have a higher protein profile, uh, more resilient kinds of crops. Um, I would just be interested if, if uh, in any of your scopes of work, this kind of agricultural transformation question comes up. Yes, on the ag tech side. Yes, on the ag tech side in terms of, you know, greater investment from, from an ag tech standpoint in order to, to keep, to, to ensure value add processing close to where the food is actually grown and to capture the value add in that country um, using technology. That's, that's, you know, that, that we are having that, you know, broad conversation and that's part of Ukraine's reconstruction the 750 billion reconstruction, they want 40 to 50 billion to, to, to truly ensure that, that they capture more of the value chain and, and keep it closer to, to where the food is grown. Let's see, yes, please. Thank you, Ayman Mahana from Lebanon. I'd like to ask you about the connection between the places where the food insecurity is highest, you mentioned some of the countries, and the state of governance in these countries. So maybe we can fix you know, some logistical issues, but if fundamentally the governance in Yemen, in Haiti, in, in Somalia remains what it is, the problem will not be solved. So given all the resources that are needed to, 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 mo to be mobilized in order to solve the problem, I think it needs to happen hand in hand with those working on improving governance. So is this conversation happening? You know, organizations here deal with the governance issues, helping political parties, the judiciary, etc. Others deal with the more, you know, f agriculture side. Is the conversation happening? Is it integrated or it's still siloed, to use a metaphor? Who would like to take that one? I mean, ultimately, everything is connected, right, to, to governance and how people are governed. But like I said, with respect to blue, blue penciling, some problems just cannot wait for. So for instance, you, if people are hungry in a particular country, you're not going to wait for them. Let's say it's not a democratic country. You're not going to wait for them to be democratic before you solve the problem of food. Because back to what King Sonia Ade sang about, um, the other part of what he said was that which is that? Ultimately, food is essential to everything else. If, if somebody is hungry and you come to them to tell them to vote for you, the person that comes and you tell them, these are my ideas, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that in eight years, in 10 years, whatever, whatever. If somebody comes to them, says nothing, gives them the food, they will likely vote for the person. So you can go back and say, oh, that's a weaponization of poverty. That's good, you can say that. But really, that's the reality of life, though. So we must speak to the fact that this issue with respect to food security is more essential than whatever we think of the governance situation of those countries and whether we like the government of those countries. Because after all said and done, um, let's not also forget that more often than not, when people have dictators as, as their leaders, they are also victims of those dictators more than anything else. We, we've seen that in Russia with all the arrests being made. We've seen that in Iran with all the arrests being made. And we, we just have to find a way as, as a community, as a global community, to help solve the problems as much as possible outside of their governments where possible. OK, I think on that note, we're going to end it. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us for coffee and exhibits in the foyer. The program will resume promptly.
think the message of that film is be afraid. Um, and, and we should be worried. We, uh, as well as the war in Ukraine that we've spent the past day and a half discussing, uh, there is also a tech war going on between America and China. And that, uh, this year, has seen an extraordinary series of measures taken by the United States to restrict China's access to the most advanced microchips and the means to make them and to boost America's own chip production and green industries through a series of subsidies. As my newspaper, The Economist, put it this week in The World in 2023, which is our yearly attempt to future gaze, uh, we say that the tech war is just getting started. Uh, last year, America watched with alarm as China tested a hypersonic weapon some talk of it as a Sputnik moment. Other technologies, as you've seen in the film, are full of promise, but also a cause of concern. Artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, and much, much more. Discussions about tech can get quite abstract quite quickly. Um, so let me try and give you some figures to try and put shape to this discussion. Since 2015, China issued more patents than America did. Uh, that's a measure of quantity, not of quality. But how about this? China now produces more of the world's highly cited academic research than America does. Um, in terms of spending, in 2008, China spent about half as much as Europe on research and development. That's accounting for um, differences in the cost of living. By 2014, it had surpassed Europe. In 2008, China spent about a third as much as America did uh, on R&D. By 2020, its spending was 85% of America's. Many countries, apart from the United States, worry about China's technological prowess. Uh, you heard Minister Anita Anand yesterday speak about how economic security is now integral to national security. But allies in Europe and Asia in particular are concerned that they're going to become collateral damage in the tech war between America and China. To discuss all this, we have a stellar panel, stellar in more ways than one, uh, to discuss it. To um, my immediate right is General Wayne Eyre, Chief of the Defense Staff of the Canadian Armed Forces. Then we have Senator, uh, Senator Jackie Rosen, Senator for Nevada, a Democrat, who sits on six different committees, I understand, including the Armed Services Committee. Then we have um, the, minister, the Dutch Minister of, the, of Defense, Kaisa Ollongren. Um, and we have uh, a member of the D70, D66 party in the Netherlands. Now, 66 doesn't refer to the number of parties in Dutch politics, but it's the year in which D66 was, pound, was founded. 89, I think, I read. Um, Senator Mike Rounds, uh, Mike Rounds, uh, Senator for South Dakota, a Republican. He also sits in the Senate Armed Services Committee, among other committee chairmanships. And last but not least, General David Thompson, uh, Vice Chief of Space Operations in the United States Space Force. And I hope you appreciated the um, um, little bit of film from 2001. Um, let me start on the military with the military dimension. General, uh, um, Minister Anand yesterday spoke about this being a moment in history akin to 1914, a time of great power rivalry, but also a time of great technological change. Can you say more about how that technical, technological change affects the military world? No, so firstly, a couple of things. And uh, on behalf of the Canadian Armed Forces, I would just like to welcome everybody, especially everybody who's come from outside the country, to Canada. And it's great to have you here. Uh, secondly, I'm glad you're not asking me to interpret that film, because I'm not sure what I would have said. Um, combination of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Planet of the Apes, and neither of them ended that well. Um, lastly, it's great to have a minister who is historically minded. Um, because it provides context to everything that we do. Hey, when we take a look at, uh, at 1914, I, I, there, there's lots of parallels to what we're experiencing right now and the time that's leading, that led up to, uh, to 1914. Not only the multipolarity in, in geopolitics, 
but the confluence of technological change that we saw at that time, whether it was the machine gun, barbed wire, the telegraph, wireless, um, the tin can, uh, rail, all of those working in combination. And, and we saw some of that um, uh, foreshadowed in some of the conflicts leading up to the First World War, the American Civil War, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, Russo-Japanese War. Um, but it all came together in the First World War and, and some pretty horrendous uh, outcomes. And so that led to the operational problem of the 20th century, how to break through the defense in depth. And I think we're seeing the same thing now, the power of the, of the defense. And we saw that in Ukraine. Uh, but how do we bring it all together with these new technologies, um, with, the, with the new domains that are being um, so much more important, cyber, space? Well, to me, it's an integration problem. And the problem of the, 21st century, of the 20th century, that breakthrough of the defense in depth, was solved through combined arms action. Well, it's going to be solved going forward with whatever technology comes in, uh, through our ability to integrate, integrate the various domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, all in the context of information. So to provide a, an overview, that's where I think we're going. Do you have a sense of how well uh, Western militaries and societies are doing at integrating those new, di new dimensions and new technologies? Well, we're seeing some concepts that, uh, that come out that speak to it. Uh, you know, we call it uh, 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 pan-domain operations, multi-domain operations. So important to integrate not only the military domains, uh, but the other elements of national power as well. Information, economics, uh, diplomacy. We see adversaries uh, doing this just below the threshold of violent conflict. You know, much more integrated than we are to achieve national, uh, national objectives. We've got to get much better at that as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to skip to Minister Ollengren quickly. Um, uh, the Netherlands is at the sharp end of the chip wars, um, not least because of the importance of ASML, which is a company not everybody will necessarily have heard of, but it, that is um, essential to the making of the most advanced chips because they have the advanced lithography needed uh, to make the fanciest uh, and chips with the smallest um, logical elements. Um, does when you see America and China um, contesting the power to make uh, semiconductors, do you, feel, do you feel this squeezes you? Does it help you or does it hinder you? Well, first of all, thank you for this bit of uh, Holland promotion. Uh, we indeed have a very important industry, and HSML is, uh, we're very proud, of course, of the com company because it has the technological edge. Um, but I would also like to use the opportunity to, to mention very briefly something completely different. And I'm, pr I'm very glad to be here in Halifax uh, joining Anita and also joining all these women that we see here because, because you cannot be in Halifax without noticing these women, uh, Peace with Women Fellows. And, and I'm, I'm proud to say that we have had in the last couple of weeks the European group which is on the European orientation on global security. Uh, and I've met them, and every single one of them is leading by example. Uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I'm really proud to announce that next year, Germany is taking over. So we will continue this European program uh, and make that a tradition that's going to be as strong as is your <coughs> Canadian tradition. So uh, thanks for <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to do that. And now coming back to, you, to, your, to your question. Uh, we have to keep the technological edge. That's extremely important. Uh, and we already have, of course, export control in place, which means that you know, the, the really high end, the most advanced systems cannot be exported to China or the, uh, any other country that we don't want to get that far. Uh, but I am Minister of Defense, so I am very aware of the security issue at stake here. And also very much aware that there is, of course, a financial and an economical aspect to, to this question. Uh, but I think that security must come first. That's the lesson we have to learn and we have to draw consequences from that. Uh, and I think, as the general also just said, what we're seeing right now, 
you, you talked about China. We know that in some ways they are already ahead of us, especially when it comes to the military use of technology like AI, for instance. Um, what, what are we learning of the war uh, in Ukraine uh, now? What we're learning is that it's not enough to have an army and to have weapons. You also have to be creative. You have to be innovative. You know, have to know how to adapt. And just to give you a sense of what for me says it all, when I visited the training of Ukrainian recruits uh, in the UK, they're training in trenches. That's first, first World War, right? But they're training in trenches and at the same time operating the drones that are flying above them. Uh, and that says it all. So innovation, adaptivity, being agile, that's what's going to win wars in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Rosen, where do you come out on this question of protecting technology and trying to protect um, America's technological advantage versus protectionism in the sense that um, uh, allies, some allies and partners are starting to complain that uh, they're being cut out because away from the American market that, for example, on electro electrical vehicles is more difficult, it's going to be more difficult for Europeans and Asian countries, partners, close allies of America, to sell their electrical vehicles to the United States. Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. It's my first time in Halifax. I want to thank everyone here in Canada for putting this on. The energy is palpable. And I'm going to get to your question, but first I want to talk about that film. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm the only person in the United States Senate that ever got paid to write computer code for a living because I started my career as a computer programmer, systems analyst, a software developer. I went to college in the 1970s. Many of you are here are old enough to remember writing computer code on card decks. Now, why do I say that? Did that in the 70s, began to work in mainframes in the 80s. You had the PC, the AT, the XT. Suddenly you had cell phone. The acceleration in the last 40 years, that movie showed it from that first game of Pong. Well, we had the card decks before that. From the mainframe with no, virtually no way to break in. You had to be an in, inside in order to take any data. And I don't think that people understood the power of data. Data tells a story if you're smart enough to listen to it and analyze it. That's where you come to artificial intelligence. The data tells you that's how it learns. Too much of this, not enough of that. All the choices, binary choices that lead artificial intelligence to, I don't think, ever be as good as the human heart, but frightening nonetheless. So we talk about competition. We talk about export control. We talk about all of these things. It is extremely important as we think about how this is data, how the artificial intelligence, it's not just creating a car that might drive itself, but what are the decisions that are going to be made for you, with you, against you, about you, and that's where we really have to think about it, not just in the business sense, but in the implication that it's going to have in our lives and the choices that we will be able to make or the ones that may be made for us. And that's why we have to have rules and standards uh, in a world-based order that make sense so we're working off the same playing field. After that, the economics can come and the sharing can come. But we really have to talk about the implication. And um, what I've seen in my career, starting from those card decks to now, uh, it's happening faster, 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 quicker, quicker, quicker. And uh, we have to rise to that challenge. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try Senator, Rosa, uh, Senator um, Rounds on my question, which is you know, the, the competition with China is intense. Um, our allies are going to get hurt in that. Or are they part of the answer? The one thing that the United States has going for itself is that we do have partners, and we value those partnerships. We couldn't do it alone. Our partners can't do it alone. I think most people in the world today would rather live in free societies. We have the opportunity for young people that want to not only develop technological skills, but they also want to live where there's a quality of life that they probably would not find under an authoritarian form of government. That's an advantage that we will always have. But there's something else involved in this as well, and that is, as Jackie touched on, artificial intelligence 
If your eyes glaze over when we say artificial intelligence, uh, we're in real trouble. Uh, this is something which we live with today. We have adversaries that are incorporating it right now. And if we don't take advantage of the opportunity to include artificial intelligence within our military operations or within our commercial operations, then we're making a very serious mistake because it's here. I'm going to give you one real quick example that I think is uh, a, a shock for some people. The Nagorno-Karabakh War between Armenia and Azerbaijan occurred in about 60 days in uh, 2020. During that time, Armenia, that had the high ground, had tanks and had built in for years, had built in a structure to protect this area from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan brought in very inexpensive, very inexpensive Turkish drones. Uh, they brought in artificial intelligence in drones that literally could come in and go one way, but communicate with one another. Pick out in a defined zone all of the tanks, all of armored personnel carriers and so forth, and decide which drone on their own was going to attack which particular item. It did not take a human to push a button. All they knew was that within that kill zone, those drones could go in and do it. it took them less than 60 days in which to literally annihilate uh, uh, columns. These were not what we would call a Russia or a China or a United States in terms of the high technology. It was technology that they could buy on the market today. It is here, it is real. And if we're not prepared to do everything we can with our partnerships, then we're gonna be in real trouble because we have to deal with it. And even if we have, as we would love to have, a rules-based order, the bad guys are never gonna pay attention to the rules of war when we get right down to it, and we'd better be prepared to fight them uh, and with a better technology and in a partnership that's stronger than what they've got today. Thank you. General Thompson, um, how does this technological contest look to you in space? And in particular, how, um, uh, how concerning is it uh, uh, that China tested this hypersonic weapon? Uh, so I'd say first, in terms of in space, it's absolutely a challenge, I think, for a long time, at least uh, since the uh, um, fall of the Berlin Wall. I think the United States, its partners and allies have generally had technological superiority in space, um, which is good news. The bad news is those that would do us harm have been watching us and have been catching up quickly. So it's definitely a challenge um, uh, that we're, we have to deal with and I think we're dealing with. As far as hypersonics go, um, very much a concern, uh, not really a surprise to those who've been watching. And I think along with the themes of this conference, sort of the next logical step in the evolution of technology, especially when it comes to uh, long range strike and missiles. Um, what it means is uh, uh, from a standpoint of warning and missile warning, the game has changed. Um, you know, you use missile warning to, to provide warning to national leaders, joint forces, coalition partner forces, friends and allies to attribute attacks that otherwise not, might not be attributable and to cue missile defenses. And with hypersonics, that's no longer possible in the way that we've done that in the past. In the past, if you knew precisely in the first five to 10 minutes of flight of a rocket what it was doing, you knew where it was going. Now you have to track from birth until just seconds from impact where these things are going, and you don't really know where they're going until then. And so the challenge has become much more difficult. But I think with every technological step, there are ways to deal with it, and we're certainly on that path. And is the fact that China and Russia seem to have got there first with deployed weapons a matter of concern? Uh, it's a matter of concern only because of the capability. Um, the reason they got there first, in, in my opinion, is based on the nature of their forces and the way they conduct operations, it was a natural evolution for them. It was not a natural evolution for us because of uh, well, it, it requires a tremendous amount of ground infrastructure to support, and it's not really a flexible and mobile means of attack. That's not the way our forces are structured. And so for a long time, we were worried about other ways to conduct military operations. So the fact that it's a capability is of concern. The fact that they got there before us wasn't a concern from the standpoint of um, uh, that's not the way we operate. It's not as effective when you think about operating flexibly and globally. But now it's definitely something we have to deal with, not only from a defensive 
case, but also it, there are value, there's value in using it for uh, offensive operations as well. Thank you. Let's talk about artificial intelligence because it's already come up a couple of times and I know it's on the minds uh, of uh, several of you, in fact, all of you. Um, uh, we've heard it both in terms of a threat, uh, militarily in terms of security, but also in terms of how societies deal with artificial intelligence. Senator Rosen, do you want to give us your thoughts? You, you began this conversation. I think we have to think of it in three ways. You're exactly right. There's threats, there's opportunities, and there's ethics, right? Same way that we deal with ourselves. It's just, it's trying to simulate who we are as human beings, what we are as human beings. So we have to look at the threats. We have the, the military here. We look at our governments. Uh, we look to those kinds of things that will protect us in our society. That's one domain. We look to the economics. If you think about those as opportunities, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, who couldn't live without their cell phone, and from maybe the maps that get us uh, the directions everywhere we're going, and all of those conveniences. But I think. Importantly, we also have to think the ethics of it. As you mentioned, these drones, they're just in a kill zone. Nobody makes the choice. Is that good or not? We know that bad actors may not follow the, follow the rules, but that does not remove us from trying to set the standard, lead on the standard, and show the world, our allies and partners, how things should be done as we move to this new domain. So I think we have to look at it in those three, uh, those three buckets, and I'll let others uh, talk a little bit about what they think, too. Thank you. I guess one of, the, one of the, the pressing questions is how you integrate artificial intelligence in the rules of war. Um, General? So that's, that's a fascinating question because there are a number of aspects to that. You know, firstly, artificial intelligence gives us the potential of, of seamlessly integrating sensors and shooters. Um, multiple sensors, uh, and so signature management is going to become a, a very important aspect of, of warfare going forward. Uh, but as you seamlessly integrate sensors and shooters, where is the person on the loop? Is it the machine making the decision to, to engage, to kill? Or do you have to have, um, and should we have, a, a, a human in making those decisions? Hey, the other um, aspect of artificial intelligence that could really change how wars are fought is assisting human decision making. And so as we go through the military planning process, you know, there, there's, there's that black box of creativity known as concept of operation, or a course of action development. Well, artificial intelligence could provide other options, you know, either through um, <clears throat> opportunities that haven't been identified before or uh, through their predictive nature of, of giving you a better sense as to what is, uh, what is possible, what will, what will be achieved. And the, the ability to, uh, to do that could be the deciding factor, understanding that often in war, it's those decision loops that are so, so important. Where would you put the human in that loop, if at all? Well, as, as the ultimate decision maker. Okay. Uh, General Thompson, I thought I might just jump to you on this one. Um, sure. Um, I, I think, for, first of all, we absolutely have to deal with how we will integrate, because if we don't, we will be ineffective on the future battlefield. Um, and I think there are certain areas and certain ways that we can. We can do it relatively effectively. There are always ethical and moral implications, but not so many, and a, and a perfect example is in space. Um, because of the vastness of the domain, because for the foreseeable future, you're not really talking about humans in conflict in the domain. You basically have machines and, and robots fighting each other. The uh, introduction of and the use of artificial intelligence, and I'll say uh, uh, computer-based decision-making is a place that we're probably gonna have to go because of also the time involved. But I think once you get to the point that, that a decision has to be made to kill or not kill a human being, that's where we especially have to focus in terms of where humans belong and where the limits are. As Senator uh, Rosen said, we have, to, we have to lead that way now or it will go down a dark path. Thank you. Um, Senator Rounds, you're on the caucus for uh, artificial intelligence. I, where, I, where, I, where have you got to in your thinking? Let, let me just share this. The artificial intelligence is with us now. It's being utilized right now. You'll see it in Google. You'll see it in the ads that come up in front of you. And it's a very high speed way of making a determination about what you might like. If you're an outdoors person and you've just looked to see what kind of, what kind of tents there are out there, somebody someplace is thinking artificially, you know what, if they like tents, they probably like fishing equipment as well. 
If you talk about logic, and, and Jackie does a great job about sharing about the binary of yes or no, the logic on a computer system, let me explain that artificial intelligence, in my opinion, means that they think outside the box, not the logical of one plus one equals two, but rather outside the box of looking in and saying what if and the other options that are out there. China's been doing it, but they've been practicing it on their own people. Cameras set up a foot of face identification uh, and other means of identification that, that they are working on right now so that they can trace and look at their people because they're afraid of those individuals and who they associate with and whether or not they are going to be a friend or a foe of the state. They want to know where they spend their money. They want to know which credit cards they use. They want to know where they walk, where they are working, who's working with them, who their children are. Artificial intelligence can, because of the capability of computing and gathering huge amounts of data and going through it very, very quickly, gives them the ability to do huge amounts and then to pick it out and to find different items. In our countries, we don't do that to people. Now, we do use artificial intelligence. We have to use artificial intelligence right now when we create things. And we will do that in the future. If we want to create new chips and so forth, it's the systems that we develop that create the new chips is the most critical part of that. Anybody can create a chip, but six months from now, it's gone. It is old hat. And so what your country has done and what other countries have done is find new ways in which to accelerate the programs, the systems, to create the newest chips as quickly as possible using artificial intelligence. We can use it in an ethical way, or we can use it the way that the Chinese Communist Party has, which is to control the people and to keep track of the people. We've chosen not to do that at this point, but that doesn't mean that we will ever stop them from doing it. And therefore, Minister, what, what are the, um, the limits that should be placed on artificial intelligence, given the worry that enemies may not play by the same rules? Yeah, well, I, I agree. Enemies are not going to play by the same rules, and we know that. And we know also that the technological development is, is going at a, at, a spa at a pace that we can not keep up with, almost. But we have to try. And I think the fact that we are talking about this also in terms of a moral dilemma uh, about the ethics of, of using this um, uh, means that uh, we will find ways to, in our rules-based order, to find a place also for uh, artificial intelligence, because I, I think we, um, we have to have uh, some kind of human control. I think that, that was your point, General, also. If you, don't, if you lose the human factor, uh, then nobody knows where this is going to end. Um, and uh, so I think I, I'm confident we're able to do that, that we're able to find ways uh, to, to get the rules in place, knowing that not everybody will play by these rules. But I think often, you know, being NATO countries, uh, NATO being a defensive alliance, uh, that's what we have to deal with. We have to know how to defend ourselves against countries that are going to use autonomous weapons against us. So we're not developing weapons of our own uh, that are doing these things. We know that other countries are able to do that. Uh, so being able to defend ourselves and at the same time develop this rule-based order also for artificial intelligence and all kind of technological developments that when we were young was just science fiction and it's happening now every day and it's going very, very fast. I'm going to turn to the audience very soon, but before I do that, so get your questions ready and please make them brief so that as many people as possible can ask their questions. I'm going to ask the panel for one recommendation for, to answer the direct question that we were posed in the, um, in the title of the, of the uh, panel, which is how to keep our technological edge. Uh, do you want to start, Minister? How to keep our technological edge? Yeah, it's like one, by one measure that would work. That would work. The, the, measure, the measure is it's people, it's creativity, it's curiosity, it's ad being adapted, being agile. Uh, I think so. The human factor is the most important factor for me. And I, I would build on that. Yeah. Excuse me, by saying investing in our youth, our workforce, the excitement of our creativity, our ability to innovate. We must invest in normalizing STEM education, that you need it for everything that is creative, it's exciting, it is powerful, and it can be positive. And along with that, empowerment. Empower the lowest level to experiment, to, uh, uh, to try out uh, new technologies in different ways, develop the concepts that go along with the, uh, the technologies that we can get off the shelf. Thank you. Senator? 
They've all been correct so far, but I'm just going to ask one question. Can you imagine a world today if we had not allowed Albert Einstein to immigrate into the United States? I think that's something that we have to open it up. We've got to be welcoming to members to come in and to participate who want to be a part of our partners and our country. Thank you. And I'll say uh, pure investment in science and technology research itself. Let a thousand flowers bloom and then the p yeah. pick the best among them. Yes. Thank you very much. Right, let's go to the audience. Uh, microphones are circulating. The first hand I saw was over there. I'm going to take them in small batches and uh, ask panel members to, to answer one of them, OK? So one, a second one there, and one here. Thank you very much. I'm one, first one. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm uh, uh, from Tokyo, uh, Nabe Watanabe. I have a question about uh, the export control of a semiconductor and also, you know, the, the um, Japan's case is very similar to the, the Dutch case. That's, uh, we have a very good company who can create a good chip, so man man manufacturing machine. And uh, I think, uh, and also South Korea and Taiwan is a high-end chip for the artificial intelligence. So we are happy to cooperate with the United States, of course. But at the same time, sometimes a mutual suspicion would make if a coordinate is a not well made. That's already the, some of my friends is asking me how US is uh, somehow the uh, what degree of uh, export control and uh, what kind of coordination mechanism. So I'm very curious to hear both sides, US side and the Dutch side. Thank you very much. Um, there's a gentleman there. Now I'll come to you. Nuri Turkel with the Hudson Institute. Um, I have two questions. One, um, last December, the United States government entity listed Chinese Military Medical Academy and its 11 affiliates for developing brain control weaponry to be used on ethno-religious groups. Uh, and some of those companies that have been in news already been entity listed. This is for our two senators. What Congress could do to prevent the tech firms continue to provide technical support to those questionable uh, technology firms in China. Same question for Europe as well. And then the second question for all of you, should we consider splitting up the cyberspace, free cyberspace and unfree cyberspace? And should we also consider establishing a kind of loose group? Uh, one group will be focusing on the AI R&D, uh, the other one is semiconductor. We already have a number of nations leading in this effort. I think we should pro proactively establish kind of a collaboration, global collaboration. The United States is ahead of the curve, but it's, the U.S. cannot solve this problem alone. Thank you. I'm going to keep pleading for people to keep the questions short, preferably one. And the gentleman here, please. Thank you. China offers bridges, roads, airports. Um, it's good that the Einsteins of the future would have access to the West. But the, the challenge is, what does the West offer poor countries in the multilateral world where more often than not they are tending towards China because they can see what China is offering? What are the incentives for poor countries in Africa, in South, Southeast Asia, in, in Latin America to follow the rules-based order of the West, apart from the incentives that their citizens have to come to places like Canada, to the US, or to the UK or, or Europe. Thank you very much. And are you asking that in terms of technology in particular? In, in terms of technology and in terms of what do these countries, from their point of interest, what do they feel they stand to benefit if they follow the rules-based order in terms of the design of artificial intelligence. Because apart from what China offers, what China gets from them is that it gets data unhindered. And that means that they are able to design more representative artificial intelligence. More representative in terms of, for instance, they get to design for black women, they get to design for colored women, they get to design for black men. Elsewhere, 
is not as representative. And artificial intelligence ultimately depends on the kind of data that you feed in into the design. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. So um, there's a question about export controls. I think I might throw that one to Senator Rosen. Well, I, I think as we begin to develop these and we think about our allies and partners, as you were mentioning, we have to consider um, how this could be reverse engineered and used against us. And so that's really the concept of export controls, because someone can take that technology and um, as we see, uh, I would speak to our general, uh, our uh, military here, we know that when there's equipment maybe left on the battlefield, people reverse engineer it and they use it. And so we always have to stay ahead of the curve. And so I think we have to be uh, strong in our allies and partnerships, how we hold on to that, how, how we trust, who we trust, and how we keep that capability. It is extremely important. It's the only way we're gonna retain our technological edge particularly as we see now in Ukraine, we're here talking a lot about Ukraine, what's left on the battlefield, what we've learned about the Russian military, uh, hopefully what they haven't learned about us. But uh, I think that's where this issue comes in. And there was also a question about preventing um, cooperation on questionable technologies, the questionable firms in China, and whether we can cut off, I believe, uh, collaboration between Western tech firms and Chinese tech firms when they do bad things. Uh, Senator Rounds, is that one you want to take on? Yeah, let, let, me, let me take a shot at it. Uh, we're not perfect in the way we write our laws, and as soon as we write them, uh, we try to do it in such a fashion that the rules can then be established to identify who can and what type of equipment can be either shared uh, or, or, or limited. Uh, we constantly have to upgrade those, and, and, and we don't do a very good job, and so one of the things that we're always going to constantly be in the middle of is just trying to make sure that the rules in place, that the companies know the rules, and that they can be enforced. But you know, you think about this a little bit. You might very well say, "No, you can't export that particular item to uh, the you know the, the Communist Republic of, of China." But at the same time, we say, "Well, but you can export it to another country, perhaps uh, in, in in Asia or in Europe." Well, if that turns around and is then re-exported back into China, we haven't necessarily done a good job of protecting it. And I think that's part of the challenge that we have right now. And in fact, I think we're seeing that in terms of some of the items that are ending up in Iran right now and the way that they're making drones that are being used against Ukraine today is, is we're finding Western technologies that should never have ended up over there in the, in the first place are now there and they're ending up in weapons that are being utilized to attack Ukrainian citizens. So we've got a huge amount of work to do in it. It is not perfect. We know we've got more work to do, but it is a very challenging item to restrict those types of sales to be made and following them all the way down the line. We have to consider cyber espionage, I guess, is what this really boils down to, right? Okay. Minister Olengren? Well, just, just adding to that, I think what we're seeing there is also it has to do with the rule-based uh, order because uh, we are finding these things while there are sanctions in place against these countries. So, uh, in theory, it would not have been possible to find these parts in these products, but they're there. Mm -hmm. So the sanctions apparently are not working enough. Uh, and on the other point, I think it's paramount that we keep our technological leadership. Uh, and I think we have the same vision on that as the United States and Japan and, and other countries, which is also about having control of the end usage, as yes. you said. Um, and, but then also you need rules, otherwise it's not going to work. Do you want to take on the question of splitting the internet? <laughs> splitting the internet, well... Friend, good and a bad internet? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that would be possible, it would be a great solution. But uh, it's probably not possible. But there are things we have to think about, because uh, if we talk about space, for instance, I mean, we have rules for what we do here, but what are our rules in space? Uh, and what are our cyber rules? Is there any way that we could have global rules for, for this? Uh, we have rules for the Arctic, but I mean, they're not perfect. We're, we're still discussing them. It can lead to a big conflict, but we're trying to solve it by rules. So it's not, a, I don't think it's a, a, a crazy idea to think about the internet rules, to think about cyber rules, to think about space rules, because it's all there. It's getting more complicated, uh, but it's the same as the war in Ukraine. Uh, what you see is the old-fashioned war with the artillery. What you don't see 
is the cyber warfare that's going on at the same time, uh, is the importance of space and satellites and satellites imagery in, in this war. So yes, we must think about it. Does anybody want to take on the question of um, what Africa gets out of tech and um, da data sets as well? I, I would like to. Uh, I, I've made, I, I was elected in 2014, since, 26, since 2015, I've been a part of CODEL's on 39 different nation visits to Africa. Senator Inhofe was there over 170 times and he always had led the delegation. Time and time again, we found from Africa leaders a frustration in while we wanted to be their friends and they love the idea of democracy and they love the idea of participating with us, we very seldom brought cash with us. Whereas China would bring cash and promises. They would build buildings. Now, if it was a government building, you knew d darn good and well it was going to be bugged. But nonetheless, it was still a government building. So the challenge for us was how do we offer something different? I believe that the countries in Africa, as an example, can make a decision. They can either be colonies of China long term, or they can be partners with Western countries. But that means Western countries have to say to them, we don't want to simply rape and pillage in terms of taking your natural your, your natural uh, resources, but rather we'll help you to develop your natural resources that we can then purchase from you. We want to be a buyer, we want to be a, a receiver of those, but you need to be able to provide jobs and economic development through the development and the next step of, uh, of adding value to your own natural resources. That's where I think the West should have an advantage and that's the direction that I personally think we should be going. Okay, we've got nine minutes left, and we've got more than nine people asking questions. So I'm going to take a very short question from as many people as I can, and then I'm going to ask the panel to answer whichever ones they want to. And forgive me if your question is not answered. Um, so let's start over here. As quick and short and Twitter-like as you can possibly make them, please. Hi, Carol Abraham from New Zealand. There was a consensus that we need new rules for AI, um, potentially also biotech that implies the international humanitarian law frameworks we have are not sufficient. Do you agree? Why, why not? Thank you. And there's a lady behind you, or in front of you, in fact, who wanted a microphone. Uh, Nicole Petrucci, Space Force in the 2022 20, cohort. General, in your opening statement, you said that um, we don't have an innovation problem, we have an integration problem, which is a very important point. But what I wanted to bring back is to be able to integrate this technology and discard it just as quickly, people have to be able to manage change. And how do they not get change fatigue? So what I would say is, how are your organizations, the structure, regulations, and your training changing to be able to help people manage that change? I'm going to go to that side of the room, which I've neglected so far. So the gentleman there with the beard. Uh, Stu Magnuson, National Defense Magazine. Real quick, the way technology is going with AI, this is for the generals. How long can the uh, policy of always having a human on the trigger, how long can that possibly last? It's gone already. Mm. Thank you. There's a, the gentleman over there in the uniform. Thank you, Captain Abe, uh, Japan's Joint Staff Office. My question is about integrating um, allies and partners. And um, my question is, what does it mean? <coughs> does, does that mean uh, just developing interoperability or more than that? Does that mean that the Japan uh, Self-Defense Forces and the Canadian Defense Forces are integrating? Does, what does that mean? That's my okay. question. Got it, thank you. There's a hand at the back. I can't see the, the lady. Yes, please. Colonel Danielle Willis, U.S. Air Force, uh, Peace with Women Fellow and 2022 European Orientation on Global Security Fellow. At what point do we recognize that our tech is not going to be secure and uncompromisable and that it will be uh, both temporal and um, localized superiority and then move our acquisition process to something that is more agile that we can support that? Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here and, the, and then there, and then we'll have to stop. David Lammy, UK Shadow Foreign Secretary. If in the 20th century the atomic bomb was arguably the most significant innovation and it was in the hands of the US, France, the United Kingdom, um, in this century the worry is that artificial intelligence um, 
and some of the other technologies are in our opponents' hands. Now, in the last century, our states had much of the power. In our countries, much of this technology is with the private sector. What is the balance? How do we ensure that the state, the Ministry of Defense, our intelligence capability, is in very close relationship with the private sector? Thank you very much. And perhaps you could just pass the microphone over this way. I don't think we're going to finish these. Another Thank you so much. Yeah, Michael Arthur from Boeing. Some people think that the next step change in quantum computing is a winner takes all. How confident are you that we're winning the race? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, so the questions were quantum computing, were the relationship between tech and the state, agile procurement, um, interoperability with allies, or is it more? Um, uh, how to manage change, and um, uh, biotech as well. Who wants to start? Management, change management, let's, let's start there. Yeah, well, I'll jump in and try and combine a few of these uh, together. So if we, if we start with the premise that our adversaries out there only respect strength. And that's, they res respond to, uh, to strength. That means we collectively need to be strong. There's also a premise that um, the security environment is changing so fast in terms of technology, Techno technological change is, is accelerating. And the third one is that warfare is a state of constant adaptation, counter-adaptation, and, and uh, they who can adapt faster, the best, is going to win. And so we're, we need to be in a state of constant adaptation. It goes back to the, uh, the question of, uh, of change fatigue and the earlier question about uh, sharing of, uh, of research and development and interoperability. And what that means is us as a group of like-minded nations, friends, partners have got to become much better at sharing R&D, divvying, divvying it up, protecting uh, from those that need to be protected from and, and rapidly advancing with that uh, with that mindset of constant change. We can't do that through periodic professional military education. We have to do that daily, learning daily, changing daily, having that mindset, baking that mindset into our, our professional development, our, our leadership, um, and our way of being. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to take the question of quantum computing, whether it's a game changer? Uh, sure. Oh, um, oh sorry. No, go, I'll come to go you. right ahead. Oh. So with all due respect, I think quantum computing is the latest game changer that whoever gets it first is going to win. And we're going to discover that just like all those other things, sooner or later, everybody's going to have it and it's going to balance it equal. Um, and if I can, the idea of pulling triggers. Um, we already have uh, machines deciding to pull triggers today, especially when you think about automatic defensive systems. The, the scenario that General Rounds described is, is here today about making decisions in a in a very constrained set of circumstances. I think that will expand. Humans will have to be on the loop for sure in advance to help make those decisions. Where we really have to think hard is, what are the conditions under which we can never let a machine make the decision without a human being in the loop? And I think that's where we really have to work hard. And do you have a sense of what those, that set of consequence, uh, circumstances is? Well, absolutely and certainly where it involves close contact with civilians. Okay. Thank you very much. You wanted to jump in. Well, I was going to say you have quantum computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence intrinsically linked. And with the speed and depth of quantum computing that can do millions and millions of models and iterations that can get you to these decision points quicker. You talk about all these decision points, what if, what if. They're, they can just do it so fast and they can model many, many decision points. Maybe that's where the human comes in as you speak to that uh, for the final analysis. But that is going to really move artificial intelligence so much further because it is going to be um, incredibly quick and learn incredibly fast. But what it doesn't have is heart. That's where the human comes in. And does quantum computing break all the existing cryptology on which so much of modern life depends? Well, I think it has the capacity to. I, I, I'm not a mathematician, but what I can tell you is that when you run millions and millions of iterations to try to do something, your chances increase exponentially to break that code. And so that's what quantum computing um, can do for you. Thank you. Minister Ollengren, do you want to take David Lammy's question about um, the relationship between the state and tech? 
yeah, the relationship between state and tech, and also perhaps the first question on international rules versus tech, because the difference is that the te technological development is going so fast that we, you know, we can almost not keep up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, states work pretty slow, because we have to make laws, and that takes time. Uh, so the big question for me is how to how to connect that, uh, how to have uh, democracies keeping up with these developments, how to recognize the, the threats to us, uh, to NATO allies, to our people uh, that come from technology, that, ha that has this huge pace, uh, and, and at the same time have lawmaking, have international rules. And I think the answer is that we already have these international rules, only we have to apply them in this new, very dynamic situation with technology developing at a pace, as I said, that we can always not keep up with. And it's going to be very difficult. Uh, and I think what the most important thing is, and that's the lesson also, I think, from this war now that's, that we see in, in Ukraine, uh, we are with many like-minded countries who feel the same about this. So we have to join forces. Thank you. Senator Rounds. We started out with humans being in the loop in the kill chain. Then we have now moved to being on the loop. There will be a time very shortly where we will accept that we are over the loop looking in but still in control. There's something else that's happened in this whole process and that is, is as we have learned how to develop huge amounts of kinetic activity, smaller and smaller systems designed specifically to go in and hit particular targets, we're going to have to develop and at some point begin to use uh, uh, directed energy systems that take these out because we won't be able to afford to buy all of the kinetic systems in order to do it. Part of it we're going to do with cyber. Part of it we're going to stop that kill chain from ever developing all the way. But long term, I think that we're going to be moving more and more into a directed energy approach and it will be one in which the human is not on the loop but over the loop, looking in, monitoring, but not directly invaded or we will not have time to stop these hypersonic weapons and others in time. And, and I think we will be forced to move in that direction. Well, thank you very much. On that sobering note of um, uh, the, the imminent age of ray guns, um, <laughs> let me thank the panel and uh, thank the audience especially. Uh, and uh, we learn as much from the questions as we do from the answers. So thank you very much, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we make this short transition. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we make this short transition.
<laughs> okay. All right. Good afternoon. For those who don't know me, my name is Evelyn Farkas. I'm the relatively new executive director of the McCain Institute. Uh, thank you. Um, just so everybody knows um, that this is a very balanced, politically balanced panel, um, I'm just going to mention the fact that I ran unsuccessfully for Congress as a Democrat in the great state of New York. Um, I'm saying that because we also have our New York <coughs> State Senator here, Senator Gillibrand. Um, I lost, and I am now at the nonpartisan McCain Institute. So that is how we are balancing our panel. It's good enough for me. <laughs> of course. Excellent. So welcome, Senator Jim Risch from Idaho. Senior Senator, um, you have three terms in the Senate. You are our most senior Republican foreign policy maker in the United States of America. Makes you sound really hadn't thought about you sound it. Old, <laughs> Representative McCall, representing the 10th District of Texas, you are also one of the two senior members of our government representing the Republic, as a Republican in our government making foreign policy. If I did my math right, you've both been in office around the same time because you have nine terms and you have three terms. Um, so if you would like, just for a few minutes, and I understand we only have 30 minutes um, total with your questions included, um, if you could just reflect on what it means at this moment in time. We have a Democratic president in office. We have the two of you very experienced, seasoned gentlemen um, with a lot of responsibility at this moment in time when we are being challenged by authoritarian large powers and all kinds of other crises you know, all over the world to include even in our backyard in Haiti. So if you could just you know, take a few minutes to start us off, Senator Risch. Well, I, I guess uh, one of the things that strikes me in, in reflecting back on this is, is uh, how quickly things move. I mean, uh, we, look, we were here all in the same room a year ago, and uh, we were mostly talking about China at that time. And uh, of course now, uh, uh, our eyes been taken off that ball, and uh, we're we're facing a very serious uh, challenge uh, in Ukraine. But if you go back over the years, it uh, we, we just kind of go from crisis to crisis, and it's it's always different, and it's dynamic, and it's always changing. Over the top of all this is what we talked about last time, and that is China. The rise of China is the big story in foreign relations, has been for uh, a decade or more, and as we look forward. Uh, regardless of, of what happens in Ukraine, China's going to be there. China, and, of course, China's watching this, and how this plays out is uh, going to make a difference there. But, uh, but China is still uh, China's <coughs> going to be uh, our uh, competitor uh, uh, economically, militarily, culturally uh, over the rest of this decade. Hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, the way I see it is um, we've had a, a lot of little wars, right? But this is a great power competition that's happening right now. Uh, you, we looked at what happened in Afghanistan, and then um, Putin started putting his troops around Ukraine not too long after that. And uh, we know uh, Chairman Xi, Communist China, has intentions on Taiwan. Um, and, and then we have the Ayatollah in, in North Korea. But I, you know, my father was a bombardier on a B-17, 32 bombing missions over the Nazis, and, you know, this, to me, it's, it's almost like history sort of repeating itself. There were so many parallels to that time. You know, when I was in Poland on the Ukraine border, they talked about 1939 a lot. Like, this reminded them of when Hitler invaded uh, Poland. And it's the largest invasion in Europe since World War II. And now we know Chairman Xi is being very aggressive uh, with Taiwan. He's, he's ar he already has a, a security agreement with the uh, Solomon Islands at John Kennedy PT-109. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's almost like they're trying to redraw uh, the maps that my father's generation liberated. Mm -hmm. Well, since you both mentioned China, I'd like to start with China. Um, the national security strategy, US national security strategy, came out recently, remarked on the fact that China is trying to remake the international order, rewrite the rules to basically help them, benefit them. Um, but that somehow the U.S. is going to manage the relationship with China while it's also trying to, you know, compete against us pretty aggressively. How do we do that in a way that doesn't somehow get us inadvertently 
um, into war, let's say, over Taiwan? And how do we do that in a way where we don't end up overly protectionist? The last panel was on this you know, technology and the need to protect our technology and our national security, our edge. Mm -hmm. But how do, we, how do we manage the relationship with China, both the military, political relationship, as well as the economic relationship? And I'll start with you, Senator Rich. Well, I think, uh, I, I think that uh, relationship is fluid right now. And I think it's uh, fluid because what we're seeing in the, in the world today is countries breaking into, are, are they democracies or are they autocracies? And uh, the autocracies seem to be hanging together. You have Russia, and of course, they've teamed up with China, teamed up with, uh, with uh, Ira uh, uh, Iran. Um, and on our side are the democracies, and uh, uh, we're all trying to operate within a world uh, that is under a, a new order since uh, in, in recent decades. And, and I, think that's a, uh, I think that's a challenge for us. Uh, I think we're going to have to learn uh, to work with autocratic governments. We don't like them. They're not, uh, they, they have uh, uh, mostly no use for human rights. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, they have a very different view of, uh, of how to govern. And uh, so I, I, think it's, I think it's fluid, and I think it's going to take, uh, take some years of pushing and shoving before we get to a point where we can coexist and do business uh, on the planet and each manage our own security situation. Uh, I, I think it's going to be some time, and I think uh, th there could be some real bumps in that as we go down the pike. Mm. Representative McCall? No, that's a great question. I, I had a really great discussion with Secretary James Baker about China. And I, I know, it, you Recently? know. Recently? Recently? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, after I came back from Ukraine and uh, spoke at, the, at Rice at the Baker Institute, and uh, I said, you know I, know, I know you tried to work with China to get them in the family of nations, um, and they did under Bush 41, and, uh, you know, we gave him a lot of stuff, and, and, you know, in his words, he said, you know, just sadly, it just didn't work, and we have to open our eyes, particularly after the pandemic with supply chain, which is why we passed the Chips for America Act, and these two are very helpful, and, you know, to get this thing done, so we can make semiconductor chips in the United States, right, to protect it. And we got to look at rare earth minerals. They're in 140 different countries. They're actually in Afghanistan right now. China is, a trillion dollars of lithium. And we'll probably get access to Bagram Air Base, which personally doesn't make me happy. It's a, it's a bad result. But I think to answer your question, we, we, nobody wants war with China. And uh, I don't think they do either. And so I think the way it's deterrence, which is why we need to sell these weapons to Taiwan. We just met with their delegation. But, you know, it's, it's deterrence, but competition. Too often, we're just not on the field, right? We're not in Africa. 20 nations have sworn their allegiance to China now. And why are you doing this? Well, because you're not here. Latin America, another good example. Both ends of the Panama Canal and another and Indo-Pacific. And so... We got to learn, you know, we can't just call them, you know, the people of China are good people. The communist China government's not so great, but we just got to learn how to be more competitive. And, and technology, I think your last panel was discussing, that's how we win, too. They're, they're investing a trillion dollars in their technology, digital economy, AI, quantum, you know, 5G, semiconductors, all that. And we got to compete. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we will compete, obviously, and the, and the trick is to, to maintain deterrence so that China doesn't think twice about taking military action against Taiwan, which leads me to Russia, but I'm not going to ask you about Russia because I'm looking at this countdown and we don't have a lot of time. You gentlemen are both on the record very strongly speaking out the need to defend Ukraine and its sovereignty, not just because Ukraine, of course, has that right but because it's, it's about the international order. We need to defend our international order. And so I'm going to switch now and ask you about Iran and North Korea. So this morning, we heard very passionately that what's happening in Iran today is different, that it's a revolution. Um, and we heard a uh, description um, attributed to President Obama saying maybe he could have done more when the Green Revolution occurred. We know that with Iran and with most countries, it's best if the revolution and the change comes from the people. 
but now they're making change. What, what do you think the United States can and should do at this moment in time with regard to Iran? And I guess I'll start with Representative McCall to, to shake well, it up a little. I, I mean, they, they are the pariah in the Middle East. And the, the Iran deal, you know, when, when Iran wants them, <laughs> the IAEA to shut down their investigation where they found three undisclosed sites with, you know, radioactive particles is, I think, a, a bad deal. Um, but they are uh, the problem in the Middle East to Israel and the Arab nations. The Abraham Accords is a good step forward, but I think we've got a great opportunity. Now, not since the Green Revolution that you're referring to, to put priority over the revolution rather than an Iran deal that will legalize our nuclear you know, program. And so, um, you know, with that, how do you do that, right? We can't, we're not gonna send our people in there, but communication, so startling works so well in Ukraine. That's the only reason that Zelensky can talk to the world now. We got Starlink in Iran, and the antennas are up. And that communication that is not subject to surveillance or censor, free communication without the regime monitoring it, both inside and outside of Iran is, in my judgment, the best way to build a resistance you know, to the regime. And uh, the, Iran, the regime is very nervous right now because the 22-year-old woman who was killed by the morality police because her hijab wasn't perfectly on her head is starting, it, it is, it's, it's all about women's rights now. And, and I'm telling you, the regime is very nervous about this. And all the while, you know, we just got reporting that Iran's working with Russia to help them build drones in, in Russia. And all the while, they're sending their own drones to Crimea which is a whole nother discussion. I wish we had longer range artillery to take those out in Crimea that we don't uh, currently. But the fact is, it's the Iranian drones that are killing innocent Ukrainians right now. Yeah, and it goes to show how everything is so interconnected because if Russia were stopped and if Russia no longer had an aggressive foreign policy, that would change things for Iran and Syria and even And Afghanistan. China, our ambassador said it's the biggest deterrence to China is if we win in Ukraine. Exactly. So, Senator Risch, can you add to this? And if you want to throw well, in any other yeah, elements it's, here. It's striking when you look at there's 193 members of the UN, about the number of countries that are on the planet, and it's only a handful that we have troubles with. And they all have in common the same thing, that they're autocracies, uh, no respect for human rights, uh, no democracy. Uh, the people there don't have any kind of uh, civil rights at all. Um, but what should we do about Iran? Look. This is no secret with me. I fought with the Obama administration, and I've been fighting with the Biden administration. Why in the world would you be sitting at the table negotiating with people like that? And they want to confine it to just their nuclear activities. These people, the, the Iranians, have an, uh, a, a list as long as your arm of the bad things that they do. And uh, what we ought to do right now is we ought to walk away from uh, from the negotiations that are going on. And secondly, crank up the uh, crank up the. Uh, sanctions that we have and really enforce those sanctions uh, and we got all the reason to do it now you watch what's going on in the streets they, they got death penalty that they've that they've put on people that are protesting these are the people you want to negotiate with I mean it's just nonsense so we have 13 minutes left I have so many more questions um, if anyone in the audience wants to ask about North Korea what, what should we do about North Korea they basically have said they're going to be a nuclear power and uh, lo lobbed another missile, another ICBM test um, yesterday, uh, and they've been doing dozens of these tests. Um, but I'm not gonna ask about North Korea because um, unless you wanna really quickly say in one minute something about North Korea. <laughs> in one minute, solve the whole problem. Please. Well, he's back to his, non his games again. He's fire rockets over Japan. He's a, he's a threat to Taiwan. We just talked to that delegation. And, you know, again, I, I think we need to make it clear as a doctrine policy in the United States that a nuclear run or North Korea and North Korea is not acceptable to the free world. Mm -hmm. Senator Rich? Well, I'm on the Intelligence Committee. Most of what I know about this, I can't tell you. But I will say this. <laughs> uh, look, we've got the intelligence agencies in our country that are, that are looking over this very carefully. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we do have the plans that you need to make for this kind of thing, and uh, I am very comfortable with where we are as far as uh, the oversight of what's happening there and, and our responsiveness. Okay, I've seen three hands go up. Oh my gosh, too many hands. Um, 
So I think I'll just take a hand uh, from each section, <laughs> and I'll ask you to give your question. We're going to we're going to take three questions in a row, and uh, just hold your hold your fire, hold your answers until each all three have gone. So right there, the gentleman in the tie on the aisle. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm Dennis Kwok. I'm a former democracy legislator from Hong Kong. And looking at things from the Hong Kong point of view, we really now understand that the takeover of Hong Kong in 2020 by Xi Jinping was really part of his plan of the preparing <coughs> for decoupling with the West, tearing up an international treaty and now with intentions over Taiwan. So my question is, how is the United States and the uh, international uh, community going to prepare for a decoupling because it is happening and the other side is actively preparing the foundations for it. How are you going to react to that? Okay, right there. Um, Mark Hetfield, I'm the president of HIAS, which is the Jewish Communities Refugee Agency. The situation for Afghan refugees has not improved since we were last here a year ago, both for those tens of thousands in the United States who still have no <coughs> permanent status in the US, as well as for the tens of thousands left behind and who are on lily pads. Where do you see the US showing leadership this year for Afghan refugees, and do you see Congress passing the Afghan Adjustment Act this year? Okay, and then the third one um, right here towards the front. Unless we had a, okay. Unless we had a woman, I would throw it to a woman, but. <laughs> I'm not a woman. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question coming out of the last session, which was on emerging technologies, and one of the points was the importance of democracies working together in the development of these new technologies and ways to defend ourselves against their applications as well. One of the questions was, um, how can the United States reassure its closest allies that its policies will be inclusive of its allies and not protectionist and exclusive of its allies? I didn't hear an answer to that question in the last panel, and I would be fascinated <laughs> okay. to hear yours. Thank okay, great. You. So it's decoupling, Taiwan decoupling, <clears throat> Afghan refugees, and uh, don't leave our allies behind on trade. Um, we'll start with the senator. Kind of a stew, isn't it? Uh, you want <laughs> you to take these pick one and choose, at a time? I suppose, but um, uh, yeah, you know, the decoupling question. I thought we talked about that earlier. Really, I, I don't think this. Uh, what, what happened in Hong Kong? I don't think was a, a shock to anybody. Uh, that's that's what uh, that's the way China operates. That's the way it, what uh, what it does. And uh, as we go forward, as I said, we're going to have to deal with these things. I I don't know that they do want to decouple. Uh, I think what they want to do is exploit. And uh, they, they can exploit because of their size to begin with and, and other things that, that they have. We, uh, I was told uh, once by uh, uh, one of the uh, Chinese representatives, they said, look, you Americans, you, you know, you have these elections every four years and your policy goes this way and then a new administration comes in, you throw that all out, the and he says, we've got one plan. <laughs> And we go forward with one plan, and that's how we've gotten to where we are. So they, they have uh, some things that, uh, that do benefit them in that regard. But uh, th this is something we're going to have to deal with uh, a as we go forward. But I'm not so sure it's a decoupling. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, sign on to that. I, I would say it's more that uh, it's going to be an exploitation of the world around them. I, I think we need to listen to them, their own words, Xi Jinping. What he said before his Congress when he got reelected as the imperial president, he wants imperial China back. And he's very clear. This, it's, there's no like gray area to this. And he also talked about, hey, we're now an economic superpower, even though they get interest free loans from the World Bank as a developing nation. But he says now we're going to be a technology superpower and a military dominating force. I take that very seriously. And I think with Hong Kong, you know, we, like, you know, Jim said, we knew that was going to happen. But Taiwan, uh, deterrence is going to have to be the key. And that's why Ukraine is important. That's why getting these weapon sales into Taiwan, you know, we signed off on three years ago on 10 weapon sales to Taiwan that have yet to go into country, which raises a whole other issue about our defense industrial base. But deterrence 
is going to be really important. I don't think a military invasion or a blockade is their first option. I think it's probably more their last. Uh, but I, I do think uh, you know, the next event may be the election, right? Pre President Tsai can't run again, so they, they'll probably try to gin with the election like they did in the 90s with our presidential election. And so, um, but we got to be prepared, and it's going to be, unlike Ukraine, we can't just put weapons in Taiwan and they can defend themselves. They can't. And the United States and Japan and South Korea and Australia, we're going to have to make a decision that the American people are. What's going to be the appetite and the will of the American people if that happens? Um, do either of you want to comment on Af Afghan refugees? What more can we do? Well, I, I think uh, the comment that was made uh, the, is underscoring the fact that there's so many other things going on. It's not getting the attention that it should get. Uh, it's there. We know about it. Uh, it gets discussed uh, regularly, but it, because of the other things that are going on, we haven't uh, moved things along as, uh, as much as they should. The act, the Afghan Adjustment Act, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether it's going to pass this year or not, Mike. I, I don't know whether you have a a feeling on that uh, or not. Would you I, like to I make a bet? We're on the record. What's that? We're on the record. You can make a bet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the must-pass bills are probably the best. Yeah, you know, that yeah, would be yeah. our end of year. CR. But, you know, if Afghanistan was a, a disaster, right? And, and uh, to put the Taliban in charge of HKIA and our security, and a suicide bomber gets in, kills 13 servicemen and women, we left thousands of American citizens behind. State Department didn't have a plan. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of Afghan partners out at the mercy of the Taliban that are getting tortured and, and killed by them. As we, and we promised them we would save them. I'm going to hold hearings. I'll be the next chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I'm going to hold hearings on this because <clears throat> fundamentally the, the veterans deserve to know the answer. They, they, they uh, need to know what happened and why did it go so badly. And, how this will may, maybe never happen again. But I think, you know, one of the problems is it was so chaotic that a lot of Afghans got on the planes that shouldn't have. And so that's tainting the pool, if you will. But the ones we promised, they had an SIV, you know, visa, 100% uh, we should honor that. I think uh, in closing on the Afghanistan thing, and we'll move on, but pr probably if, if there's a lesson that we learned there, and it was a 20-year, $2 trillion lesson, yeah. you know, we spent 20 years and $2 trillion trying to give something to somebody that didn't want it. And, uh, uh, you know, today, is it any different than it was when we got there? Uh, the, the folks there, we, we gave them everything we could, including training of their military and everything else, and they didn't want it. And so here we are. Uh, the Ukrainian situation is very different than that. Uh, we're, we're dealing with people who really want it. And uh, so it's a different situation. Although, as we heard this morning, the Afghan women may yet have a say eventually. Hopefully. Hopefully. But that's the saddest thing, the women left behind. I got four school buses of these music uh, students, women, out of there through the Abbey Gate. And it was like, you know, they call it like Schindler's List. You know, you get out, you're going to live if, if you don't. And, the Sharia law is coming back in, yeah. and it's a horrible, and the it's poverty strange. is massive. Yeah. Um, so time is running short. Um, I think we could take maybe one more question. Or did you want to ask we, his? We I'm, had I'm, one, one I'm one. a little, I know, so did you want to discuss just the partners really quickly? I forgot the really question. <laughs> I forgot so the question. question was, what are we doing to make sure we don't leave our partners behind as we protect our national security interests through well, protecting our critical technology? Long discussion, but I can tell you, we are well aware of that. We're working with them. Uh, it, it, it takes, uh, particularly as we try to produce weapons as we go, go forward, it is going to take us all coming together with the allies we have, and we have some good and important allies. It's going to take that as we go forward to counter what China's doing, and for that matter, what Russia's doing. Okay. And so I think the Five Eyes is such a good model for this, right? And we're in Canada. They're one of the five. So, you know, we work together and share, share intelligence and and the technology, we're working with Australia to make submarines. It's going to take a while because uh, the Taiwan Straits is important. Uh, so I think we got to continue that core for sure. And then this ITAR restrictions on hiring, um, you know, workers like engineers. That there, there are Canadians that we want to hire in the United States to make weapons, but we can't do it because of that. And 
it seems to me we could get a uh, some sort of exception for you know workers from I, uh, from uh, uh, the five eyes to collaborate together. Well, we have a poster child for that right now, too, is the NASAMs that we're all hearing about right now that are very, very successful in Ukraine and that we need to get more of them there. Partially made by, uh, by Sweden, partially made by the United States. It's a great collaborative effort. We're going to see more and more of that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative because we only have a few minutes left, but um, the earth is on fire and melting. <laughs> Many national security experts believe that even though obviously we have to deal with the threat, you know, the very real uh, threat posed by, by Russia and China, um, but the environment, we need to do something about climate change. Mm. Um, what do you gentlemen think that we can do in a bipartisan fashion in the next Congress? Well, I, you know, I, I think that uh, the world, uh, America, and everyone is focused on uh, on uh, climate change, and and for that matter, what uh, uh, getting to a reduced carbon uh, uh, environment. I think both sides need to come to some realizations. The one side needs to understand you can't flip a switch on this. This is not going to happen. A lot of people want to flip the switch and say we're going to change overnight. That is not going to happen. The other side needs to redouble its efforts and, uh, and, and move towards a, uh, a carbon-free environment. But it's going to take time. Everyone has to accept it's going to take time. So I think innovation, technology, I'll give you, instead of putting mandates that ties us to China, which won't recognize the agreement, <clears throat> you know, things like the small modular nuclear reactors, these are portable. They're about the size of a truck. Um, the DOD has a project under DARPA. It'll be ready in two years. Zero carbon emissions. Think about that. And so even the EU <clears throat> uh, passed, I should say even, the EU passed um, through their parliament saying that, that nuclear is, in fact, green energy. Uh, but there's always been this debate with the environmentalists about nuclear. But that's when we had the big nuclear plants that, you know, that had some problems with that. And I don't want to, I don't know if Chris Coons is out there, but um, he uh, and I and, and Jim are looking at an amazing opportunity, I think, to, we have all these billionaires signed up, and, but they need USG to help partner with them to, to invest in stabilization, conservation, like in Africa, uh, like with the, the, you know, the, the, the game there but also protecting the rainforest in the Amazon, in the Congo, and then uh, Indonesia. And those are the lungs of the world. And think what an impact that would have. We're well, making those in Idaho, by the way. The, mi the micro and the that's small. That's right, micro, yeah, yeah. Yeah, public-private partnership is definitely an area, I think, of greater um, growth. We've seen it in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, and hopefully we'll see it in the context of climate change. So and it every, stabilizes these countries where, you know, there's terrorism breeding in yeah. these countries. So. so thank you, gentlemen, both for your pretty quick, <laughs> comprehensive um, participation in this panel. Thank you all for your participation. Um, please join me in a round of applause. This concludes today's program. The conversation continues this evening off the record. Please proceed to the Via Rail Station to join your group to depart for your dinner conversation. Guides will direct you. Enjoy your evening.